crazy in a different room. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She knows the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We're getting crazy in a different room. She my do or die, my bona fide, my up when I'm down, she's always beside me, she makes me feel alive, I won't deny, her love for me is real and kind of suicide she's not the same, she's such a rare type, she's far from plain, at least in my eyes, she said if I cross her I'll be in the grave, oh you under her type, but yeah that's still my babe. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She loves the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We're getting crazy in a different room. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She loves the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We're getting crazy in a different room. Hello and welcome everyone as we are ready to go for the start of the NECC. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Orta. With me is the best minion to ever wander off the rift. Once again, it is Random Minion Caster. And we are here to kick off the start of the NECC League of Legends season. Hopefully it's going to be a good time as players are revving to go. Both old and new. And I'm excited to see what they can do. RMC, how you doing? Doing good, Oberlin. As you mentioned, you know, it's a new year, it's a new season, and we're going to be starting with new teams here in the Navigators division tonight here. So, Oberlin, you know that I've always loved the Navigators division. The, this division where we see the wildest things happen. So, <laughs> definitely excited to kick things off tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's always so much fun. And, of course, without ado, we are going to have three matches here tonight. Starting out, it is West Virginia Wesleyan College Esports versus LVC Dutchman, the Lebanon Valley College. They'll be having a lot of fun with that matchup. That's the one that we were just talking about. Kind of fresh teams, and we'll get to that later. Second up will be Trine Thunder or Trine University coming out in the Challengers Midwest Division. Coming up against St. Ambrose University, which is, of course, one of the mainstays here in the NECC. You and I have cast them quite a bit. And then University of Montana in the Challengers Pacific Frontier side of things against the University of Nebraska Omaha who will be kicking things off later on in the evening so three matches for you here on the main stream there is a secondary stream that you can go ahead and check out as well that'll be starting I believe possibly at about 6 p.m. so be on the lookout for that one as well but RMC let's go ahead and talk a little bit about these teams because again these are teams that we like to say kind of the heart and soul teams here bringing us up from absolutely nothing yeah so navigators division you know it's sort of the, the introductory division, right? A lot of new teams coming in here. And when we say new, I mean brand new here. Let's start with West Virginia Wesleyan College here. Uh, this is a team new to the NECC, and their captain, Billy Boy, has a, an astounding story behind him uh, for this particular team. The college didn't have an, a League of Legends esports team for the longest time. Billy Boy joined. He's now a junior back when he was a freshman. And when he joined, you know, he actually wanted to play on esports team, but not necessarily League of Legends. Then the coach at the time pulled him into the League of Legends team, 
there wasn't a team orbital. There weren't enough players to actually compete in tournaments. So for two years, Bowie Boy's kind of just been sitting there holding the pieces of the team together until this year. This is the first year they will have enough people to actually compete in tournaments. So Bowie Boy has been honing his skills, finally gets to compete with this brand new team. And you look through this team, Twenton, Odier, Faith, Heart, Hope, uh, DM Cheesecake, Lanita Gringa. Like a lot of them are newer players to the League of Legends here. And so not quite as experienced really getting to experience the joy, the fascination of this game, especially in the competitive side of things. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's always fun to hear about organizations that, especially for players, that the most interesting is you don't actually have a team for that time being. So to hear someone staying with that squad saying, hey, I'm going to hang on as long as possible, and maybe, maybe at some point I get a team to go. I love it. I love that kind of heartwarming story. And the fact that both the captains will be heading off into the top side as well brings me a lot of hope to see the captains either call up their jungle, call up, or if we're going to see them left on their island. As we do know, League of Legends has kind of started waning towards that bot lane, seeing a lot of players and a lot of push go towards that bottom lane to try and get the most effective, uh, you know, setup going with how the ADC and supports and jungles like to tango. Yeah, and speaking of both captains here over on that top side, Lebanon Valley College Dutchman as well. Uh, their captain, LVC Panda here, uh, he's had a similar story in that he joined Lebanon Valley College. Uh, he's been playing league for about six years here, so quite a long time, uh, and really wanted to find like-minded people to play with, try and find an esports team. Joined LVC, found out they didn't have a League of Legends team. So he made one himself, did not have to wait two years, unlike Billy Boy here, just got right into it, formed a team right away, uh, and they're playing now in the NECC. So similar, kind of, to uh, the likes of West Virginia Wesleyan, this team is going to be fairly new as well uh, coming into it, but quite a few of the players you know, have a bit more experience playing in solo queue or playing in other esports, and now they're transitioning over to League of Legends. They've got a bit of a bigger roster as well here, uh, eight players on their roster so there might be some swaps as we go throughout the season but for now the starting roster for tonight with panda liquify doc mech stuffins uh, sepia horizon and syrup psyduck here uh, these guys you know they haven't had too too much time to play together uh, but they're very much looking forward to it and the experience of growing together as a team as well of course and i think that kind of shows that these teams are really here for the experience in the navigators it's Interesting. A lot of these players, either they just picked it up or they're just wanting to get better and better. And that's also reflected in their positional roles. A lot of these players coming from solo queue saying, hey, I'm just going to go ahead, pick up an opportunity and we'll roll with it. A lot of these players are in different roles than maybe they are standardly used to. So we'll keep eyes on that throughout. Right now we are in the draft. We can already see some of those favorited bands out. The Vigar, the Udyr, and the Mordekaiser. Mordekaiser and Udyr are actually very meta bands here. The Cassante also a very meta band along with the Elise and the, the Zaya. So both sides going ahead and kicking things off here. With the roles being locked in, we are getting the draft in order. So please keep that in mind. Yeah, so here in the NECC, uh, we are seeing their in-game client draft here. So uh, they are picking an order. And what's interesting, Orbital, is it's not Billy Boy in the top lane here. It's actually uh, DM Cheesecake going up there, Billy Boy in the AD carry role, Faith Heart Hope as support here. So originally, I had thought Billy Boy was going top. I thought they were pulling some role swaps. No, uh, everybody going to be in their comfort position. And as you kind of mentioned, you know, bot lane is going to be kind of interesting because of how things have moved towards that. And... I'm kind of seeing a bot lane pick already that Kaisa showing up for Liquify. I don't know if that's going to be swapped later or <laughs> if that was a mistake because I have not seen Jungle Kaisa before. <laughs> Ooh, that would be that that would be quite fun. And to say the most, <laughs> it is navigators. I mean, uh, we, we I know, a lot of interesting but I here. haven't <laughs> seen an ADC successfully clear the jungle just yet. Outside of if you want to call Graves one, so uh, this is <laughs> going to be very jungle. Twitch, I, I, listen, I don't consider <laughs> Twitch anything. I consider it an annoyance on the Rift, okay? I have very, very different feelings about that champion. Uh, APC Twitch is it, it's the bane of my existence at this point. If it is, though, I, I assume it is going to the bot lane so we can at least sit there for the time being until it's fully totally locked in. We'll see. The rest of the band's falling out. Of course, the Lulu, the Aatrox, the Silas, and Hecarim, all of these are standard once again, just saying, hey, we don't want those power picks coming in. Heavy dive, though, here, as Odir is going with the Odir champion of I go in and I don't come out. I like it. 
I, I'm a little bit disappointed we're not seeing something like a Lilium mid or even like an Udyr <laughs> would have been fine for Odir there. But uh, yeah, really solid front line, you know, with that Galio, the Camille, that sort of combo that we see a lot to isolate single targets coming through uh, for West Virginia Wesleyan here. We are going to get the swap between the Graves and the Kaisa. Still an AD carry in the jungle, but Graves, not traditional AD carry here for uh, Lebanon Valley. Strong team fighting coming up from Lebanon Valley, though. So we're seeing a lot of globals potentially from the side of uh, West Virginia West End. And to me, that's going to be a test of your coordination as a team because you need to communicate with each other, calling in the Galio Ultimate, calling in the Nocturne Ultimate, even calling in Zareth's Arcane, right? So they're trying to make sure that you can actually lock, find that kill onto target halfway across the map. Whereas for Lebanon Valley College here, it's a lot simpler. Uh, you've got a team fight composition with that Amumu. With that victor here, Graves, Jax both have a lot of agency on their own. They can kind of do their own thing for the most part. So uh, definitely going to be a bit of a test here uh, between or between these two teams, more for West Virginia here, uh, on how they're going to communicate going into the season. Yep. Getting a good test, though. Again, this is just game number one, right? So we talk about, you know, the team fight, you know, the coordination and everything. This might also be one of the few times where I say, the teams are also just drafting for kind of comfort here because this might be the first time we actually see them play on a full scale together, right? Some of these players I know, and I love the fact that with these thrown together teams, there are times where they don't have as much time to practice. So I do like the versatility coming out, right? With the Jacks, uh, another champion that is, again, seen as a nasty pick right now. Uh, the Grays, the Victor, and all that. It feels very standardized, right? The other side is just like, we're not sure exactly our own, uh, you know, our own individual skill, but we're going to press R and have some fun. That's what we're going to do here. We are going to send it and watch things unravel. Um, at least that's how I think of it. I love the press R comps. I will always love them because they are easy. They are simple. And if you mess it up, it messes up big and it looks even glor more glorious that way around. So I'm excited to see RMC. What do you think of these compositions? Do you think one lends itself to better agency? Uh, overall in the game or, or do you think they're going to be evenly paced depending on how the players uh, figure things out i mean as i mentioned i think the the dutchman here their composition lends itself to a bit more self-agency and bigger go buttons right like when an amumu goes in you know it's go time amumu goes in he's not coming back out once he presses that curse of the sad mummy there you kind of know that you gotta go so I, I think the dutchman have a slightly easier time of it in terms of how that plays out but I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity as well for West Virginia Wesleyan for individual plays. Uh, while they do have a lot of globals, literally every champion, aside from that Camille for Cheesecake there, has a global or semi-global uh, in their kit here. And sometimes, you know, that can help things out because when you kind of mess up, you can call for help from your team and the rest of the team can go in. So maybe a little bit less agency except for that Camille, uh, but a lot more backup. And that's something that Dutchmen have to keep in their back of their minds when they want to make plays. Now, another thing about the West Virginia uh, Wesleyan comp here, their bot lane. I do want to talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. Faith, Heart, Hope, I had thought was going support. And support Ash is a thing currently. But so is Zareth. So I'm not sure who's going to be the carry in this bot lane here. Traditionally, it should be the Ash getting the farm, Zareth being that support style pick. But I actually think Zareth here being the carry might be the better option here. Ash can do, I feel like, a lot more as support. And I feel like gold on the Zareth is a little bit more valuable, especially with how squishy, you know, picks like the, the Kaisa can be, or even the Graves can be vulnerable uh, to mages before he really starts rolling early on in the game. I I also like that, mostly because I'm a Zareth main, and I, all I care about is getting gold in <laughs> Zareth and just zapping people left and right. Hopefully we get that. Hopefully we do. And again, that would be the most interesting thing. Now, I do think, again, we were talking about at the beginning how Billy Boy is that captain. So to see him in that carry role as mm -hmm. well gives me a lot of hope. At the same time, uh, as a captain, I'm very worried because if the captain goes down, you might be a little bit lost sometimes, <laughs> of course. And if you are the carry, well, guess what? You're the target of everyone's aggression. So balancing that act as well is a lot of fun to watch. You know, how well do you perform under pressure, especially for your day you match? And a lot of these players, I think, are going to hold on to that one. And I mean, I got to ask, you know, for someone that's held on, to that role for a long time. What do you think that mental is behind it, right? Do you Are you worried about your first game ever as a team for your school, kind of repping your school there? Or are you more just like, I'm excited to just play? I mean, that, that has to be the two mindsets, right? Yeah, I, I think a little bit of both here. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, waiting for so long to play, to finally find a team, I'm sure you're pretty excited when you're able to find that. So Billy Boy probably very much looking forward to this. But the mental resilience, I mean, he's been waiting 
for literal years at this point here. So even if things go bad, I have no doubt that West Virginia Wesleyan will be stable and they can rely on Billy Boy, whether or not he gets taken down in the fight. Because even if you're down in the fight, doesn't mean you're down in comms, right? You can still yeah. keep talking to your team, keeping everything together. Uh, and for the Dutchman as well, let's not forget they're a new team coming into this as well, just came together this year. Uh, and when I got to talk to Panda a little bit and he was you know, kind of talking about his team and the goals, I love the mindset of the Dutchman as well, because they're coming into this saying that, hey, of course we'd like to win. Winning is fun, who doesn't like to? But more importantly, we want to have fun together as a team here uh in fact their mid laner funnily enough uh his goal is to get in a relationship with his jungler liquefy here. so <laughs> win or lose you know i'm just expecting to see doc make stuff and either follow up with liquefy or constantly be calling for jungle attention well you know what's not too nice of this team right now you know what's not nice of lvc in invade that is not nice that is i'm going to mess your day up and you want to need you want to know what's even more toxic panda went ignite teleport that is the most okay. disrespectful thing I think I've seen out of top laners. It's just, whoa, whoa. I don't even care. I don't need anything. I don't need an escape. I will kill you. I mean, Camille's usually run that all the time. Well, <laughs> that's it's fair, not that's that, fair. that behavior. I actually like it from Panda because that shows that it's aggression. And you know what? That's an Amumu on the team. You know, the Dutchmen just want to say hi. They just want to make friends, you know? They're just going together as a group. They do back out here. And... While we were talking about the Dutchman invade, look at what West Virginia Wesleyan did. They invaded as well. Three men snuck into there and Twinton did not back out. So unfortunately for Liquify, this looks like a three buff start for Wesleyan. Very, very nice start. And for Twinton, that's, uh, I would say that's quite important, right? For a Nocturne mm -hmm. that wants to hit level six as quickly as possible and deny the Graves any sort of extra. It's going to be nice. It's going to be able to hang on and be able to even power through Liquify if they find each other in the jungle. I have a friend that loves to play uh, Nocturne way too much. And that's the thing is you want to duel, especially with Lethal Tempo. So hopefully getting that advantage will be very nice. Not even just taking one, taking the entire top half of the map. Welcome to I Don't Got Nothing. One occupant. Is going to be Liquify top laners, though. Ooh. Cheesecake getting munched on here as Panda went ahead and eaten away at that Camille. Yeah, Cheesecake having to chug those pots early here. Now, because of that invade as well, I do want to highlight the fact that Twenton is up there. So Panda pushing out this aggressively. You mentioned he's got no flash. Twenton's gotten behind him now. They can easily look for this gank. Oh, it's so, so nice. The bait in works in their favor. And because you ain't got no flash, you ain't got no escape. Panda is down for the count. First blood to the side of WBWC. Yeah, and unfortunately, Liquify just got in his jungle as well. So the call is mm. like, hey, Panda, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> My top side's gone. He's in there somewhere, but Panda's already too pushed up. And Panda, that early pressure, kind of all gone for now there. Gets kind of wasted, burnt out a little bit. And for West Virginia Wesleyan, the, the scary part is now Twenton gets the assist as well. And for Nocturne, as you said, you just want to hit level 6 as soon as possible. He's getting such a big advantage over Liquify. Even now, you see that uh, Scryer's being popped right there. They know Liquify is in the river, and immediately Twenton's there as well. Normally, Nocturne doesn't want to fight Graves, but when you're up double buffs, yeah, you're looking for it. Always looking for that chance. Liquify now getting invaded right now. This is very nice coordination. Oh dear, roaming out, and... Liquify is now down, out of the jungle, can't even get that scuttle. And so far, for the side of West Virginia, they're having a ball here. They're having a blast at the start. Oh dear, wants a bit more action though. Gonna get some damage down with the shield up. McStuffins can only trade so much. Yeah, mid lane, there is a discrepancy as well. TP versus Ignite. Doc McStuffins more than happy to take these trades. If he burns out of mana, he can always just TP back to lane but the one place that hasn't been that good for west virginia wesleyan is this bot side where the dutchmen are winning out sepia and syrup psyduck able to pressure out here and to me that's sort of the silver lining for now that zareth is going to be carry billy boy not going support here but he's getting bullied out a little bit he's running low on mana as well to be able to farm up in the face of this aggressive bot lane yes bot lane Getting some information going down, and so far we are seeing a little bit of a trade-up. Sepia having a great time down there. 34 CS to Billy Boy's 19. With that shove, that is going to be one of the one of the slow-burning problems. But so far, it's been all nice and pretty. Low on, low on mana, though, is Billy Boy. So Billy Boy's just like, all right, all right. I'll attack as much as I can. Every 12 seconds, get a bit more mana back. 
hopefully I can sustain through this lane. Yeah, you can't find a good time to base too, because of that yeah. shove coming through from Sevilla. <laughs> You've got the TP. You just can't do anything with it here. No matter when you TP, you're going to lose some of those minions. Now, the jungle. Twenton actually just went back in and is cycling that top side once again. Yeah, I don't know if Panda is aware of the timings, but again, Panda, no TP right now. Has a ward to jump to. Ooh, that is going to be the jump. And uh, knockout as the Counter-Strike is going to be enough. And Twenton and Cheesecake each eat in the uh, tower attack. And because of that, Panda comes out the better of that trade. Welcome to uh, Jackstown, where you really don't want to be under tower. <laughs> yeah, that is absolutely massive for Panda there. Now you win that particular trade. Twenton can't look back up there, and he's only level 4. There is no ultimate available for him uh, for the Knicks at a while, and Cheesecake has to be careful. Even if you have Flash against a Jax, that Leap Strike can make up a, a lot of that range. Meanwhile, Dutchman here. I like this adaptation. Liquify is falling quite far behind, a level and a half behind Twenton right now. I would have liked to see the invade, but failing that, go for the dragon. You know that Twenton just showed top there. You've got all the pressure you need from your bot lane here. Taking that dragon gives him quite a bit of experience, and more importantly, the entire team going to get a little bit of that defensive buff here. It'll help you trading a little bit more in lane. It's going to be nice. And early stacking of the dragon as well is just like, okay, okay, we're, we're good. Second one up is going to be Cloud, which should allow these junglers to roam even faster, which is a terrifying thought. So I do not want to see a Nocturne with a speed buff on me. That, uh, that usually means the end of my days. That's a good call. LVC being able to gather at least something back here. The CS numbers are waning and wanting throughout the entire, uh, <laughs> through the entire lanes here. But so far, the gold still staying in West Virginia's side. About 700 to their name with, you know, no real break in sight. Yeah, we're starting to see people hitting their level sixes as well here, Orbital. And we mentioned before that for West Virginia Wesleyan here, their comp really wants six. That's two of their globals on, or one of their globals for ODR online right now. But the critical one for Cheesecake. And we've seen Panda, despite the fact that he hasn't opened up a significant CS lead, Panda has been handling that top lane incredibly well. Now Panda has to be careful about any other pressure uh, from all the other lanes here from mid. Uh, even Twenton, level 5, once again cycling that top side. And we're seeing the, the missing pings. Up till now, the Dutchmen have not been able to stop Twenton. Liquify only has one quarter uh, or half of the map to play with right now. He's not been able to go top side whatsoever here. And I'm worried Twenton's going to hit 6 behind Panda. <laughs> that would be... That would be a little bit insane to me. I don't know. That would be <laughs> that would be so scary. But that's the power of these farming junglers. So you can go ahead and see trying six. to take a moment. Yeah, level six already. And they're just waiting. They're going to go ahead and go on in. Flash from uh, Cheesecake. And it's like that. They go oh. in. Welcome to pain down all three. It's the combination, right? You love it. You love to see it if you have a Galio, if you have a Camille, and if you have a Nocturne. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, <laughs> dear. Wasn't necessary for that particular play, but just want to be part of the action. Gets the kill, actually, from that mid lane there, and they get themselves heralded. And we talked about the fact that, hey, West Virginia Wesleyan's composition requires a little bit more communication here. It's working out. And Panda, the captain for the Dutchman, is being left to dry right now. There is no backup coming here from any of the lanes. We mentioned Liquify hasn't even been able to look at his top side jungle, much less his top lane. Liquify has just sat there like, I, I got a farm. I don't know what else to tell you. Now down so much, you can already see the Serenia Dirk, which also uh, Umbral Glaive getting nerfed in next patch. So even that's going to be taken down a peg. So much of this, though. Liquify has been choked out of farm, choked out of lane. And it's just picking up scraps. And you can see it's not only the camps that are being taken away, the information, the warding. You can see how many wards are currently located in that top side. They want oh, to yeah. shut down Panda and Liquify so hard. Yeah, they want to make sure that nobody can go help this team captain out. And so for the Dutchman right now, I'm looking at where where are they looking to get back into the game right now. Yes, Victor does scale, but Graves, not the best. Jax does, but Panda's under siege, so it's got to be the bot lane right now. Sepia and Syrup, Psyduck, and they technically have the tools to do it, right? You're playing into mm -hmm. an Ash and a Zerith. They're pretty good long-range poke, but if you can actually oh get gosh. onto them... You can definitely kill them. And Syrup Side Up is level 6 right now. 
where Psyduck is, but take a look at what's happening now on the other side of the map. You can see here right now, the Greys and Jax are roaming in, and now again okay. to the mid lane, Lucify is going to try and cut down Odir for a little bit of damage. The bot side, you were Hold just up, talking we about go. it. They get the root, they get the damage. Oh, no. Faith Heart Hope is quite low, and that'll be the jump okay. in Flash afterwards, and that means it's a kill for Sepia. In the mid lane, though, a retribution, a retaliation fight is going to break down. Liquify has no Flash. And the knockback cone is used. Blast cone puts Trenton out of commission and Liquify will survive, but a heavy handed gank in the mid lane to fight back against the bot lane. Remember how uh, you're saying that Doc's goal is to get in a relationship with Liquify there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that that motivated a lot of that play. It felt very, very forced. They didn't have a lot of on-demand CC or reliable CC to set up Liquify, but Doc's just like, doesn't matter. We're doing this anyways. Keep going, and Doc pays with his life for it there. Liquify doesn't get a kill, doesn't get an assist. And even worse is what's happening in this mid lane. Late TP coming in, that turret's almost gone. Oh, It's not gonna go down. There were some changes, it feels like. If you drop that Rift Herald, it does not take away two full plates anymore. Uh, it only takes away, I think, one and a half. So, Stuffins is able to survive, but guess who else is back? But no fight. Odir was pinging it. You can see the pings go down <laughs> on top of Sir Psyduck. And Twin's like, no, no, no. I want to spend my gold. Just give me a second. Already has that guard breaker. Fun times. Fun times here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Twinton is definitely enjoying this game. He's got to power <laughs> farm as much as he wants. Uh, the moment his camps are down and he's cycling three quadrants with his camps, Jeez. he gets free ganks. Uh, highest in the game right now. All three highest KP. Cheesecake. Doesn't have flash this time. And remember, doesn't if have a teammate in. either and decides to go back in. That's going to be the ulti. Kind of popped here and a little bit of a okay. swing. But guess what? It's an exhaust fight, but the auto attack is up again. Oh my god, the counter strike again. Panda, the captain, takes the 1v1. Pandas look really cute normally, but they are really, really strong. And Panda played that <laughs> to perfection as well. The counter strike baiting everything out. Exhaust doesn't matter. Cod hurt him through that counter strike and Cheesecake paying the price mid lane. They're setting up a gank here. Oh dear, goes in. Oh dear, went in and you didn't have any vision. Well timed by the rest of LVC. This will result in a well placed and well timed kill. Liquify getting on the board and now playing catch up to Twenton. And Liquify getting that kill is massive for him. This Graves has been starved for so long in this game. Unfortunately for Doc though, that wasn't the mid laner who got it for him. He caught up Syrup Psyduck. There's no trust here. This relationship in the mid lane ain't working out well. Uh, I'm starting to see a jungle support relationship mid lane. Mm, well, you know, see, yeah. that even furthers the problem that Liquify did not save the mid lane from an all-encompassing uh, all encompassing ultimate, right? Like, why wasn't Liquify there? Liquify should have known, so, you know. I think you're right, McStuffins might be looking at Syrup down there, just saying, okay, we're going to have a little bit better time. But so far, it is still the Twenton show. 2-0-2 two, and two with 96 farm. Almost double the amount, or actually, exactly double what Liquify has. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's horrifying on this knocker <laughs> right now. Topside, they're still trading. This time, Flash up for Cheesecake. Cheesecake should be fine. Now, mm -hmm. the gank into mid lane felt a little bit opportunistic for Twenton here. Um, great for him individually. I would like to see Twenton though look towards this bot lane uh, a little bit here. I mean, you, you spent a lot of tension in that top side for Cheesecake already. Um, Odir is going to be fine, right? Like the mid lane, your mm -hmm. Galio isn't a big carry anyways. He's also got a global to help out the other lanes. But we said before that if there is a lane for Dutchman to come back in, it's that bot side. If you can shut them down, then the Dutchman don't really have a lane to play through anymore. Oh, oh dear. Uh, oh dear, made a middle mistake. And in the bot side, another mistake went down. That's going to be a kill on the bot side. We quickly switch okay. back up and mix Stuffins with the auto attack or with the ulti. I take that back. The Chaos Storm brings a kill back for a Victor that loves scaling to the mid to late. It was so close. Oh dear, almost took that turret down. He was trying to rush it because mm -hmm. the, the timer. Uh, it's 14 yes. minutes. Plate just went down. Liquify didn't see the rip off go down. Oh, he doesn't no. know. And doesn't get the sweep off either. The Umbral Blade doesn't pick it up. And because of that, Twent is allowed to survive. You're looking somewhere else. Cheesecake. The ulti is up. Paranoia is ready to go, but you lost vision. So Twenton walks across a ping forward. Panda says, all right, I'm fine. But that's going to be a spell break. The shield break is down. Yeah. And spell shield. I lost the name completely. <laughs> <Depressing>. <laughs> it does break the spell. Spell break works too. Uh, Twenton. 
Quentin didn't want that one. I, I don't think he was actually looking to go for a kill. If he had used Paranoia there, it's to save Cheesecake. Because Cheesecake mm -hmm. is so, so low right now. And after that last fight, I think Cheesecake is fully aware that, hey, if Pandas counter strikes up, we don't really want this fight. Even with that spell shield, he's got Ignite as well. And they knew Liquify was in the area. Syrup Psyduck roaming up here. They're trying to get control over the Herald here. They want it, but guess who's here first? Well, just about everyone. About <laughs> about five members, three and two, Fire. are going to be found. But guess what? Quentin gets found out. That is not going to be an ulti. But in comes the Galio oh. charge. No, Curse of the Sad Mummy is used. And because yeah. of that, the Amumu goes down. In comes the Rocket Barrage. Artillery Strike lands. And Billy Boy is able to get an assist. Oh, now no. it's on to the Grey's Disaster Strikes as LVC lose three. Yeah, we said before, Dutchman, they've got a lot of agency here, but with the sheer globals that West Virginia Wesleyan have, you're never quite facing what you think you're facing there. <laughs> and now with three members down mid lane, living on a hope and a prayer step, you're coming up here. Yes, but remember, in this mid lane, it's a bit different. The tower is oh, still okay. doing some work because of that. Sepia picks up a third. Oh, Sepia. Sepia, you went too far, though, and now you ran into the other Fed member. So up to the high point to the lowest of lows right there sepia felt it all yes yeah, sepia got blinded a little bit by greed really seeing all those <laughs> low health bars and to, to be fair sepia you could have found two but there was everybody else in the area you kind of knew it when they fought up there they didn't leave they were taking herald and now herald dropped down side up going back and still has ultimate here well i i don't want to say still instead actually got ulti after dying earlier true sure. and I mean, you know, there, there is a big difference between the two. I want to point that out. There's a very big difference between holding on to your ultimate and not having your ultimate. The Serp Psyduck is ready because guess what? The dragon is coming. And so far, so far LVC, they may have lost on top. They may have lost in the tower game, but they have had control over this dragon. If they get this one, it will be a third dragon for them. And of all things, the Hextech. Yeah, and it feels like despite the fact that the Dutchmen have been kind of losing out uh, in terms of map pressure, and they're down two kills there. Two kills isn't that much, and they still have teeth in them. They are still threatening. Twenton goes in. Oh, that's going to go in, and now it's a 2v4, and because of that, they're happy. That's going to be the Stasis Seal to keep them that's stuck, nice. but Panda is ready to join. But that's the artillery strike again. Billy Boy's having a grand old time, but you stuck too close to the wall. The auto attacks have found you, and Panda is ready to wreak havoc. In comes the Camille a little bit too late, <laughs> and the Dragon will just be taken by McStuffins. Panda, though, doesn't want that fight any longer. Oh, do you get the sweep? No, you do not. Oh. That's going to be the kill on the bot side and the kill on the dragon. Just as quickly as LVC lost top lane, they win on the bot lane, and they're now on soul point. Like we said, the Dutchman still have teeth cheesecake looking for this one here. No more flash for Sepia. No more flash, but that's a flash for cheesecake it? going it in. And you're going to go for it, but the power key was up. It's not enough. Sepia wins it out, and cheesecake dove a little bit too far. I feel so much for Cheesecake right now. That is the, I feel like, second, third time this game we've seen where Cheesecake almost gets it. Just miscalculated by a sliver, by a particular skill, by a turret shot, and unfortunately <laughs> goes down yet again. And now the Dutchman, they're equal in kills. They're up in dragons. Yes, they're down in gold and turrets, but frankly, that gold difference doesn't really matter, Orbital. We've seen the strength of them. Panda is online. Sepia is online here. And sure, Doc and Lucify are a little bit behind, but that victor will scale up, and frankly, Liquify's damage is not necessary at this point. No, it is not. It, it really... You're okay. You're okay for right now. You really want to get the vision away because uh, Twenton's, Twenton's doing some work here. If you leave any wards inside of the jungle, it's going to be a problem. It's also a problem if you die. That's going to be the route the Everfrost takes Liquify's life because Cheesecake comes in and steals the show. McStuffins loses a quarter HP to an empowered Q and the Artillery Barrage will make McStuffins quite low. Not level 10, so not four shots. You're going to get the Blast Cone over oh. and the Smite finishes it off. You know what? Sure. Why not, oh dear? Go ahead, Olsen, and have a blast. Just like that, West Virginia take control of all four jungle quadrants. Yeah, but in West Virginia, they're not happy with how that last fight went. And they know how to leverage their strengths. Their strengths right now is finding isolated members. Mm -hmm. And they can dive with the amount of people who can back them up. The Dutchmen need to respect that. Even Syrup Psyduck right now is playing with fire. If those outs weren't already down, heck, the Ash out is still up there. If it had been fired and landed, that's a kill onto a Moomoo. And mm -hmm. West Virginia Wesleyan, 
it's just all about timers right now. Anytime those outs are up, expect to see them look for an isolated member, just dogpile, kill them, and then take that numbers advantage, push a lane with it. And while we have a little bit of time, as I feel the teams are kind of trying to play catch up and have a breather, I want to give huge props to West Virginia as well. You were just talking about their well-timed and their uh, win conditions right now that are obviously working in the favor. They're also doing really well with the fact that they as a team are playing like a squad that's been together for at least a semester already, right? These are some coordinated <laughs> moves here. They're pulling these ganks off, three-man ganks. And yes, we said it's a little bit easy, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that they're pulling it off. Like an experienced squad, it feels like they've done that over and over again. And that makes me very, very happy seeing that here. Yeah, and as you mentioned, this is a new team, right? So you're mm -hmm. only expecting things to get better from here. Granted, the globals make it a little bit easier uh, to coordinate in terms of, okay, you might be a little bit out of position, but you can get to places where you need to be. Now, mm. the question is, as with all global comps, is how long can you keep doing that for? Because True. global comps work great when you can find isolated targets, but in team fights, they usually lack a little bit of that punching power because your ultimates aren't big AOE ultimates. They're not necessarily game or fight changing ultimates. They're great for picks and Dutchman, they've got the big team fight ultimates. Oh dear. Mm, yes, they do. Everfrost gonna slow everyone down. And guess who's at the front lines again? Surf Psyduck. And Surf Psyduck dies. Doesn't even get to use the ultimate on multiple people. And because of that, everyone charges in. But Panda was ready to soak okay. up so much damage. They're quite low. So in low. goes the collateral damage. Doesn't get too much. And now the lasers come out. Billy Boy's gonna fire away. And everyone runs away. West Virginia are gonna watch the flash come over the wall. McStuffins wants to stuff oh. at least one and two more heads. Has three kills so far. But they're gonna dive right back in. You went too far. The stun goes down. The clip. Is it works, but no, they didn't kill He's him. Alive. They left it alone. He's alive. He has the shield. Finally, a volley from the Ash takes it away. But that could have gone so differently. West Virginia, they tried to leave the kill for Billy Boy, and Billy Boy can't finish it off. Although that should have gone so different in so many ways. <laughs> the fact that Odir didn't die when he rounded the corner into the entirety of the Dutchman was absolutely insane. And, the, and then the way that we saw the Dutchman play it out, even when they lost Syrup Psyduck right at the beginning of the fight, they kept going. They knew they could do it. I can't believe Doc McStuffins lasted as long as he did. If he didn't, that would have been a wipe on their part and oh, potentially yeah. leading into the Baron. Uh, and for West Virginia, again, the, the fact that Odier survived and Billy Boy and Faith Heart Hope on that side right now were absolutely obnoxious. Just getting the poke down. They're somebody, we, they're a duo we have to keep our eyes on because if they mm. get to keep poking like that from the side, uninterrupted, you know, unchecked uh, by any threat here, the objectives are going to be very risky for the Dutchman to try and take. Let me summarize that all down. Uh, task failed successfully by the side of LVC, and they're looking to do it one more time. They are hoping to do it one more time here, as they are ready for the soul. If they get this dragon, it will be a painful reminder to West Virginia to go for this global objective. Down goes the stasis field. It's gonna go down, but in goes the paranoia, and it's not okay. stolen. Because of that, they might get wiped though. Look at the HP in the back line. Cheesecake is gonna fall, the and they get destroyed because Billy Boy and Faith Heart Hope are not there. Panda jumps to the back line. They're going to continue the front to back. Annihilates them as LVC take the ace. Yeah, and they can now go for Baron here, but we were just talking about the fact that whichever team kind of messes up, Baron is open, and the Dutchman only lose the support here. They've got all the damage in the world. They're scaling as well right now. Their team fight damage overall is an issue for West Virginia Wesley, mm -hmm. and they need to now poke. You can't look for the engage. You can't look for the full team fight here. Panda. Getting really low should be fine though. Oh yeah, the uh, the cool <laughs> thing about Counter Strike is you get a block Baron autos as well, which is. I, I feel frankly outrageous, but it doesn't matter because you have all five with Baron on top. You have five Baron buffs in a composition that we sat there and said, you know, the Wombo combo might catch them. And honestly, West Virginia Westland, they engaged properly, right? They engaged properly. They dropped the paranoia. They jumped to the back line. Cheesecake tried to follow up and Odia tried to ult in. But you look down the line and you said the damage profile is a problem. Mm -hmm. A big problem shows up to me. They don't have an ADC that can cut through this line like you would normally see. So, as you said, very apparent now that West Virginia are going to start struggling here towards the late game. Yep, and I feel like right now, the Dutchmen are the ones in the driver's seat. They mm -hmm. determine how the rest of this game goes. If they group up together as a team, 
there's not much that West Virginia Wesleyan can actually do to them. And even scarier is the fact that with the Hextech Soul now, they get that little bit of a slow, which is all they need to pull the trigger. Uh, and that's not even thinking about Serp Psyduck's ability to just force engages with that bandage toss. And if mm -hmm. they engage on open ground, not under turret, they should win those oh. fights. Faith, Heart, Hope, where are you oh, going? Oh, you walked up because you didn't see the tower going down and you pay the price. At least it's only a support. It doesn't feel like uh, the Dutchmen want to push up any further than that because they want to wait for the wave. And that's all they really have to do, right? You said it. The Hextech Dragon, the soul is ready to go. Everything else, they have all five members up. They just push. They push at five and they don't care who's going to get in the way. Nine seconds, still Ash is back up here. When Faith Heart Hope is up, the arrow is good enough. Uh, you don't have to necessarily be at the fight right away here. The problem is, like we said, Dutchmen are just pushing in. And for West Virginia Wesleyan, Cheesecake is looking for a fact. I don't know if you win this, even if you get the flag. Mm, well, they're going to try either way. And remember, okay. they have to get to the back line, and they do. But down. guess what? They don't have the damage. They don't even get the kill. Sepia survives, and it's only going to be Liquify that falls. The rest Ignite. of the members are getting burned down. That's going to be two to Odier, who gets the shutdown. But it's still not going to be enough, because guess who's still up? Billy Boy and Faith Heart Hope, who can only stall to their own advantage. However, the tower working in their favor. <laughs> West oh. Virginia, they're saying we can do it, and they hold off. No wave means no inhibitor tower. <laughs> I wonder the Dutchman forgot that Baron Buff makes the Siege minion stay outside of range of turret. Because <laughs> it felt like they were thinking of going for the dive. They thought they had the minions, but the minions got cleared so quickly there. Billy Boy, Faith Heart Hope doing the right thing by focusing out that wave first there. And Dutchman just tanked the turret repeatedly here. Had to force them back. And because of that, Baron Buff is about to expire as well. So the Dutchman, that's the end of their push. It was still a very effective push. They almost broke the inhibitor. And they still have time on their side right now the, the question is posed to west virginia wesleyan it hasn't changed how do you fight them how do you contest these objectives you pray that someone decides that they don't want to play hold the hand with the team members <laughs> like that is what you're hoping for here you are hoping the buddy <laughs> system just stops getting used right because it feels that there is no opportunity you're saying west virginia here have an opportunity, but there hasn't been one because the entirety of LVC group up like this. Cheesecake knows, even Cheesecake knows, Cheesecake knows that Sepia is not alone. Welcome oh, to TP. the party. Sepia really? is dominating. B Billy TP'd in here. I don't know if this is safe for him. <laughs> and you know what? As a captain, he was trying to say, okay, no man left behind. Billy's been left behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not by choice, by the way. Not by choice. Oh my gosh, these fights have been off the walls, and it's just, I, I've never seen a more um, stark difference, right? Normally we see, you know, the outplays or anything like that. It just feels like the Dutchmen are playing super clean. They're like, hey, listen, we know what we have to do. We group up, we stay together, and we take the fight. We take it head on, and that's all West Virginia can do. So, so well done on them. And go ahead, take another tower. It is now four towers to three, and look at that. Four K advantage to the side of Lebanon Valley College with four dragons mm -hmm. at this point they might as well be 8k ahead yeah I mean when they were 4k down they still felt like they're competitive now that they're up that 4,000 gold they just feel firmly in the driver's seat they're just waiting for this elder right now in 30 seconds and if there was a place to kind of burger flip this game it's at the elder the vision right now is good though so they can see West Virginia Wesleyan walking in and Wesleyan still have to find a way to poke them down before the engage here. Doc McStuffins actually TPing in early and they've set up a death bush here. West Virginia don't know, but I guess instincts, they're crowding around the bottom side instead of the top side. They're, they're crowding down because I feel like they're going to look at the wave as well and, and it affords a few more bushes because Cheesecake is going to go over the wall and they're still waiting. Look at the patience. They have not moved an inch. You'd think they'd be playing against Rek'Sai, but oh. the chain goes through, and look at the damage. Billy Boy actually gets a humongous set of damage off. Liquify is taken quite low, and remember, that's a jungler. They want to take him down as quick as possible. Liquify, don't jump over the wall. You okay. do not want to jump over the wall right now. More poke lands from Billy Boy. 
And they're still gonna be fighting. She's gonna wants cheesecake. it. She's gonna want to, but Faith is again caught now. out. And now they're forced to fight. Paranoia goes in. They segment everyone off, and the knockup is there. They're gonna try and stay on the course, but I'm not sure it's gonna be enough. We are getting a slideshow right now because that's all we have. The amount of fighting that will be going on will be there. And oh my gosh, at the no. wrong time. At the wrong time, the final, what felt like the final team fight, I think just broke our observer. Server. That that fight overall, like you said, that is the game decided fight. That is literally <laughs> the fight to end all fights, and it ended our stream. But that is, I am so frustrated right now over those words. Oh. Cannot explain. And and I think for West Virginia West, the, the setup to that elder was beautiful. Mm. Billy Boy checking the bush the way he did sets them up. He gets so much damage. Liquify the jungler was already chunked out, so he can't effectively get in there. And Cheesecake finding that flank in the dark as well. Uh, unfortunately, you know, for the Dutchman, they didn't know the Camille was there. So yeah. Liquify goes down. They can't do Elder. When we left that that fight, West Virginia, West Indian are in such a good position. They are even without their support, right? But I will batter back and say that they have been in this situation before, right? They have been in this exact situation where they are grouped up and Lebanon are just like, yeah, we're, we're going to try and fight this one out. So we have seen both sides of the coin. I feel like we are getting word that unfortunately our observer, I mean, the PC just couldn't handle it. The epicness was just too big. You ever see that big final fight? You know, it's like the Marvel, you know, cinematic end game war or whatever. So that was what was going down. And, and then the cameraman just said, I can't do this. I'm so sorry. I got to drop the camera. Uh, it, it feels bad a little bit, but we'll try and get in as quickly as possible. Hopefully we can gather the last of that fight and then the continuation of the game. Because if that happens, reminder, I don't think that the timers would still be in favor. Uh, I think there'd be enough time for either team to be able to pop up and gather like one last effort. But it's yet to be seen, right? Yet to be seen for both these guys. And remember, this is game number one. We still have a full other set of games if the team so decide to go to a game two and game three. Yeah, And I love this about Navigators as well. Sometimes Navigators games can get really, really messy. This has not been oh, one of man. them. It's been close, but both teams have been doing so so well like we touched on the fact that west virginia wesleyan they have such good coordination they've executed this global comp really 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 well think back to the early game the mid game twenton gets ahead and since then they've just been punishing anybody on their own but lebanon valley college their mental resilience was really really good as well right like they suffered through that they were down what is it five thousand almost six thousand gold at one point there but they just kept in it and now the scaling is online panda and doc makes stuff it's the two who suffered the most are back uh, are back into the game and it looks like elder did go over the way of the dutchman here so they are looking for their final push yes they are we do see what happened all five of them also get in because of that panda is going to go in welcome to fight to fight to fight elder snaps up two cheesecake yeah. getting taken quite low one more attack should do it but no in goes the paranoia they're trying to stall they're trying to hold off but it's only a few seconds billy boy and cheesecake are once again left alive we go from high to low to high now the wave of adrenaline should be coursing through lebanon valley right now as they take the inhibitor they took two inhibitors by the way and they're looking for the end, what can Cheesecake and Billy Boy do? They're gonna get the stun, they're gonna get yeah, the damage down. It. Panda, last the tower shot takes it, and you're able to stall. You don't back off from here, do you? <laughs> Lebanon, you don't back off. Yes, you do. You say you don't want any more of this, and they're playing this one by the textbook, saying we got four. The rest of the members are coming up. We're gonna play safe, and we're gonna spend our gold. For two long years, over though, Billy has been waiting for a team. He is not gonna go down without a fight here yes. in this game one. His Zerath right now has held them off multiple times. And once again, the Dutchmen are forced to base, reset a little bit, Baron buff soon to expire. Uh, the Elder buff as well. I don't know how much longer they have on that particular buff to try and make these plays right now. So the Dutchmen, they're stymied once again. Everything's in their favor, but until they take down that Nexus, West Virginia Wesleyan still have a chance. And for the Dutchmen here, it's another test of resilience. We were just talking about the fact that they lost it through the early game so well. Now in the late game, they have to not rush. If they throw, if they kind of get caught out with this uh, composition with any stragglers splitting on their own, they can potentially still lose the game here. There's so much potential for everything to go down. And we say that with all uh, respect to the teams, right? There is so much potential for just about anything to happen. We have so much potential for West Virginia to come out of nowhere, find the pick, find the kills, and have the damage. 
He has so much potential for uh, Lebanon to come out and just do this, right? Get the picks, find that singular kill, and they are. They're going to actually dogpile oh. onto Odir, but that's the ult he's being used. In the back line, they're they go. They're going to try to snipe. Oh, good flash out by Sepia. You buy a little bit more time, and you're able to keep your team a little bit longer in. And now McStuffins is going to fall from the bottom side. The pincer maneuver means Faith Heart Hope is down. Oh. A final Q takes the life, and that is Lebanon Valley claiming game number one. Odir is now alive after that fight. Is gonna try and guard out as much as possible, but you got nothing. You're a lowly Galio against the world, and it is game number one to LVC. You know, for a second, I thought LVC got caught out. I thought that the 4v5 <laughs> was a little bit risky without the victor there, without Doc and that Chaos Storm, but they pull it off. It's perfect bait, and Doc comes in to clean things up. Really well played from the Dutchman here. You know, some of them were saying that. Their goal is just, you know, they, they just want to win a game. I think it was uh, Sepia specifically who was saying that, you know, they just want to win one game, please. Yep. Like, <laughs> and they've I already mean, won it. So yeah. <laughs> huge props to, to the Dutchman here. Uh, but for West Virginia Wesleyan, it might not be a clean cut 0-2 for them. Uh, I think game one was a compositional issue. Mm. Their comp executed well in the early to mid game, but they just couldn't close up fast enough. And they didn't have scaling on their side there. So as the game went on, there was just less and less that they could do. They still pulled the trigger. They still tried to make plays. Give them props for that. I think going into game two, West Virginia Wesleyan might just want to look into getting one or two skilling options for the late game. And if they have that orbital, it could be a much closer game two. I feel that game was the most textbook of textbook situations to occur, right? The global ultimates getting some advantages and then mid to late, the team fight coming out from the other side. It, it felt like... That's just kind of how the comps were supposed to happen. Now, granted, the Wombo combo should have a little bit more fun, and we did see it, but the teams are having a blast. I think all the way through, everyone should be proud of game number one. We'll see what game number two takes. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with some more NECC League of Legends action.
when you dream, do you see beautiful rays of light? Shimmering, guiding you through the night. I, I know it feels like the night's getting longer and light is harder to find.
Welcome back, everyone. We're ready to go with game number two. And my gosh, was game number one a lot more than we expected? I mean, you're talking about two brand new teams coming out here saying, hey, listen, we got one team with a captain that has literally been waiting two years, possibly two and a half at this point, to be able to put a team forward in a competitive aspect. And you gave us a decent show. Look on the other side as well, LVC coming out. No team, no problem. Let's scramble together a squad. We'll put down a game. And it looked good. We saw some amazing moments. We saw some mistakes here and there, uh, such as, you know, wandering into a bush with no vision, a uh, cough sepia. Uh, meanwhile, sepia is carrying the game later on. But, I mean, game one gave us a great show for these two teams. Yeah, and, you know, you said they put on a decent show. I would argue it was a great show on both ends here. <laughs> and to me, what makes it great is the, the mental of both of these teams that – even when they're behind, they were still looking to scrap. They never gave up. And it never felt mm. like they were just kind of running it down or inting. And anyways, yes, mistakes, sure. But mistakes aren't inting. And so going into game two as well, uh, we get to see just how well the teams can adapt between these two series. And for both teams, they might look to adapt. I mean, we, we mentioned before that West Virginia Wesleyan, they might want to drop themselves more insurance because they executed perfectly in the early to mid game, but their composition just kind of fell behind. Yep. Uh, so they, I would like to see some draft changes from them. But Lebanon Valley College... Their early game wasn't clean <laughs> by a long yeah. shot there. Yeah, their late game, once they got to that point, they came together as a team, played really well as five. But individually in their lanes, they really, really struggled. Um, and for Sepia, uh, he's mentioned that, you know, he wants to focus on the early game a little bit. The bot lane kind of went fine, but you kind of want to make sure that all your other lanes go fine. And maybe that works out by sending Syrup to Psyduck to go and help out, you know, mid, help out jungle, especially if you get three buff like we saw in game one. And that, I think, has to be uh, kind of explained a little bit more because when we are talking about this matchup and what needs to be changed, it was specifically that jungle, right? That jungle had one of the widest issues that we saw before. Twenton had a phenomenal time. And honestly, yeah. uh, in, that, in that matchup, if you were just going off the junglers, Twenton had, a, had an amazing time. At one point, was double the number of camps that, uh, <clears throat> that Liquify had. So that does have to change, right? We do have to keep eyes. And already getting into game number two with the teams currently swapped, and that will be West Virginia Westland College. On that red side, we do see those adjustments coming through. Number one, Panda is not on that jack, so you do not give that one over. The Amumu taken away as well. And then Panda decides to still go late game and pick up the Nasus. Now keep in mind, please, 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 these are picked in order, but still the Mordekaiser was picked after the Nasus. I, I, that's still true. <laughs> Yeah, and we, we do want to highlight that because Nasus kind of counters Mordekaiser. Mordekaiser drags somebody to death realm, forces that 1v1 situation. Uh, you don't want to do that with a Nasus. Nasus will happily 1v1 you. Uh, you drag him into your ultimate, you steal some of his stats, and then he, he pops the, the Fury of the Sands there, and he suddenly gets even more stats. So it's actually a really tough 1v1, and the pressure is on Mordekaiser. Mordekaiser wants to scale up. But Nasus wants to scale up more. <laughs> so Mordekaiser <laughs> has to try and shut down the Nasus early when he's not ready for it. That said, I do think Mordekaiser is a better scaling option than what we saw uh, last game. Kind of similar to the Camille, I guess. The jungle changed up, though, is huge because Belveth scales up almost infinitely versus the Nocturne, who really does have to have the impact early. Twenton did great on the Nocturne. Now, with the Belveth, I am very much anticipating what he can do with this pickup here, even if he can't necessarily get that same double CS lead in the early game. Might not be double the CS, but any camps ahead is good for a Belveth. Stacking that passive as well, getting absolutely monstrous. We are now taking a look at the last bands here, and it was the Cassidy and Victor for the side of West Virginia saying, hey, we want to focus that one. And then Odir was actually uh, picking up that Swain in the fourth position. The Varus came out afterwards, and, and I do like this because I do think this is an AP Varus. If you've seen TikToks, you know that this is the only way to deal with current tanks in the current meta. It shouldn't be a thing. Uh, if it is an AP Varus, because I currently love it. But the bot lane, this one is going to be our premier lineup. Just, or not lineup, but one of the lanes to watch for, because this is the reason. This was a big thing, and I like this change, because Yumi might be gutted, but still is a monster later. But Sepia, Sepia was a monster on that Kaisa last time. Game number two, running it back. And I will say, for the fact that everybody keeps saying Yumi is gutted, she's still seeing quite a bit of play with Ezreal and Zeri specifically. So that tells you how overtuned she was before. I think she's still viable. Um, so I like the pickup here. I think she's still one of the best supports to pair with that Ezreal. Because Ezreal is so mobile, you need somebody who can stay with him. And most of the enchanted supports aren't mobile enough to keep up. That's it. 
That's your late game insurance orbital that we're talking about. I like this change in draft coming through from West Virginia Wesleyan in terms of their late game scaling. However, the side lanes, we touched on the Mordekaiser Nasus matchup that's rough for Mordekaiser. Ezreal is kind of countered by Kaisa. A lot of times, Kaisa. She is more of an assassin uh, style champion there. And if she gets to the point where she can burst through the healing of that Yumi, the shielding, which kind of did get nerfed a little bit here, that's a problem for Ezreal. She's one of the few AD carries who can stick onto that very mobile Ezreal. And for the side of LBC here, the Dutchman, triple AD carries or AP carries. If we do expect to see AP, whether it be from the Kaisa or the Varus here, that's very interesting because it's higher risk, higher reward really strong in a lot of these team fights and the burst damage from an ap Varus or even an ap kaisa is massive uh especially onto drain tanks like swain where they're not inherently tanky if you burst them out right away if they die they don't heal back up but they're also very squishy and if they get caught by a single pull from swain from mordecai there any of those claws land they're probably dead and i like that fact that you pointed out it's the pull from the swain because Comparing this composition to last composition, there was a fundamental issue that LVC ran into. Number one is they go in, and that was really the only shtick that they had. And, you know, pardon whatever I say there, but it's true, right? We saw the die, the Nocturne would go in, the Camille would follow out afterwards, and then the Galio would be the ender. And we saw this very disjointed scenario happen where they were able to go in, but they didn't have any follow-up. This time around, it's a little different, right? Yes, there's a ghost on the Mordekaiser. Uh, yes, that is going to be very annoying. But their team fight feels a little bit easier to follow up on. The Ezreal can shift in if it's over a wall and they can kind of maneuver around and the Swain's going to be there to kind of buffer out this fight. It's not that wombo combo roll through and try and burst someone at the beginning. It's we can now sustain afterwards. So as you said, a little bit of an upgrade from game number one. Yeah, a lot of skill shots on either side. So instead of that wombo combo, it's more like dodgeball right now, right? Who can land the pull? <laughs> who can land the critical uh, skill shots to pull through? And the one that I'm actually a little bit worried for <laughs> in this draft right now is Liquify on this Vi. Liquify had a really <laughs> rough game one. On You're always base. worried about Liquify. A little bit. I mean, last game, got invaded, <laughs> punished. And hey, huge props that he still managed to come back into the game, had relevancy towards the end of the game, despite being down so much experience and gold. This game, though, on the Vi... You don't have that range that Graves had. So if you have an early, a rough early game, it's only going to get worse because you got to go in. And you're talking about engage for these teams. For the side of West Virginia Wesleyan, it's non-committal engage, right? Like if you can land the claw, great. If you don't land the claw, you just kind of step back, wait for the cooldowns. Vi doesn't have that. The only hard engage right now uh, for both these teams is that Vi on Liquify. You go in, you go in hard. It's a point and click ultimate as well. So once you click, you're guaranteed to go in and catch somebody. But now you got to pray that your team can keep up with you, right? If you get flashed away and you get dragged all the way into the back of the enemy team, <laughs> you're on your own. There is no follow-up whatsoever. I love it. I love the idea of just seeing Liquify just go, Wee! and everyone's like, bro, we just, we just talked about this and stuff like that. Uh, there are so many things that can go wrong, but so many things that can go right as well. And I think we saw the better of the situations gone right, you know? Um, there was one fight, I think, that we saw in game number one that we were just like, it's a comedy of errors that came out as a win for the side of West Virginia. It was that topside jungle fight that just was amazing. I want to also see one of those things happen again, right? I just want to see the comedy of errors somehow work out in favor of one of the two sides. Needless to say, though, we might not be seeing too much of that until the mid to late game because as you look at these teams overall, it's going to reach there. As soon as we see the Nasus, as soon as we see the Mordekaiser, as well as the Belveth and Swain, and even, you know, the Ezreal, Yumi, and then, uh, you know, the Varus, you know, Vi, whatever you want to say. Like, these, it feels like we're going to get to that late game, and we're finally going to see all this annoyances come out. The elongated fights and everyone surviving for way too long. Yeah, and the interesting thing is sort of the, the par dynamic between both of these teams. Because we talk about the late game, because Nasus is the late game champion, right? Skills up infinitely. <laughs> uh, at the end, his bonk stick one-shots turrets, pretty much, if yep. the game goes long enough here. But at the same time, I think for the Dutchman, the early game is not bad either. Vi is really strong in the early game, uh, and her ganks are very uh, painful to deal with. But Kaisa Ash as well can bully out the Ezreal Yumi. Ezreal Yumi really does take time to come online. Two item power spike for that Ezreal here. So if the Dutchman want to play for the early game, I'd be looking at their bot side to make that happen. And not just the bot laners, but Liquify going down there as well, trying to punish this Ezreal. He's got Flash, he's got Arcane Shift, but... If you can burn the flash, then the arcane shift only moves you so far. <clears throat> All right. 
it does feel a little different when you're just like, oh, I only moved this way like two feet. Sorry, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay right here. No invade this time around, though, as we are onto the rift for game number two. Keep in mind, if Lebanon Valley College win this one, they will go 2-0 in their first week. And for Sepia, that is, I want to say, one more win than they were really expecting. Uh, you were talking about it earlier. I think Sepia was saying, hey, we want at least one win under our belt. Well, you know what? You got that. You're hoping for a bit more now. And instead of needing that one win, it is now hoping for a lot more. Great start on either side, though. As no one is going to get free buff this time around. <laughs> Liquify. Going to be very happy about that one. Here. Yeah. <laughs> you can see, they, they even dropped the ward. and They got Patty to drop the ward on the top side to make sure that, hey, we're not getting invaded. And that, that's good for the side of Dutchman here. Standard is good to start. The question is, what else can we find? And I've got high hopes for Liquify as well to see what he can do now that he's not uh, been cornered right off the bat here, especially with a, a potentially early game jungler like this guy. So far, team's just saying and sending their greetings, right? That's uh, that's what we were expecting all the way through. Top lane sending greetings a bit more than other lanes as the <laughs> fight to keep Panda from farming at all is somewhat going Cheesecake's way. And remember, Panda last time was the focus of quite a few ganks as well as information gathering or denial from the side of West Virginia. And then Cheesecake still had a rough time, so maybe on this Mordekaiser has a bit better of an angle to work with. Yeah, and last game, we saw Panda pushing out really quickly uh, with that Jax, which kind of opened him up to getting ganked quite a bit here. With the Nasus against this Mordecai, I don't think that's going to happen uh, for the most part here. Mm -hmm. Nasus is just going to get shoved in and farm up. The bigger question to me is, can they actually pull off a dive? And I don't think so. We're seeing Liquify kind of looking up to that top side right now, but great ward from Cheesecake should spot this out. The warding going down, and Liquify for the first time says hello to Elaine, and... That hello means a somewhat nice goodbye. Dropped a ward on the way out and said, okay, we're good to go. We'll be happily working our way out. Both junglers on the top side, though, maybe fighting over the top side scuttle, but no, it is going to be Twinton saying, I will concede that one because I've already cleared most of my jungle. Now we'll take the bottom lane scuttle to keep our mid and bot side safe. Yeah, so Belveth isn't that strong early. She does need items and levels to really come online. So ideally, Twenton's probably just avoiding uh, Liquify and just trying to power farm uh, as much as possible. Now, in the mid lane, we did see quite a few trades come through, and Odir was winning that one out. So that will help Twenton a lot in terms of trying to gain safety to power farm. And forget safety, Twenton's being aggressive once again, actually invading the enemy jungle, trying to see if any of these camps are up right now. Well, there is one. There, there's a very nice, juicy one. <laughs> <laughs> went ahead and picked up those uh, raptors, and it's it's going to be a little bit of a pain. You can also see on the top side, the reason that the CS differential is still steady is because Twenton did not do frugs. The mid lane, though, second gank for Liquify, first for Twenton as a counter gank. And they're going to fight it out. Breakout in the mid lane. That's going to be a pull. Ooh. Hook knock up. So much oh, stun and a flash into the wall. Twenton follows the flash a little bit further, and you win it out. On the top side, we see a win by the Morning Captain. Cheesecake also able to take a kill. And just like that, West Virginia holding steady. But not so much on the bot side. That will be a kill. And Faith realizes that you got to kind of move sometimes as a cat. <laughs> and Sephia and Syrup Psyduck are probably like, team, what is happening here? We are winning the bot lane. What is happening up there right now? Panda <laughs> going down in the 1v1 is not ideal as is Nas Nasus. We mentioned before, he's probably just going to get shoved under turret this entire time and you need to make sure that you're strong enough not to get dove dying like that early not great and mid lane oh dear is doing so much work we had mentioned later on that those picks from that never move is going to be so important right the claw mm. landing from swain and oh dear is already warming up in lane he's been landing it. every time we look mid it lands into doc mech stuffins and this varus is very very squishy if you get a couple more kills get twenton rolling here it's going to become a huge problem we do get a little bit of a highlight here sepia 38 CS right now. Not exactly the most amazing stat in the world, but considering what happened in the bot lane is going to be the one to watch for once again. At least for the time being. McStuffins trying to build up as well. 33 CS to 30. Went for double daggers, so still wondering exactly how they're going to play this one out. If that is... Uh, I think that is a build path towards uh, someone of an Asher's. Uh, my brain, I don't think, is working very properly right now, but we'll see how it plays out. Meanwhile, Zero in the bot side. Said, hey, I want to get a chance to liquefy still chasing through that fight. Or through that bot side ganking. Billy Boy says, 
Gosh dang it, I can't have a moment of peace, can I? <laughs> I, I like this actually from Lookify much more than what happened in game one. Uh, oh, mid lane, it's landing every single time. It, it is, but that's going to be a root and another pop. One more does it. No Ignite going down and just at a tower oh. range. It's a trade. You know what? They'll take it. Both mid laners go down, but no flash from Odir to dodge anything. Just said, yeah, I, I take that head on. Yeah, I think for Odir, like, you, you kind of know you're busted at the point, so you, you just go for the kill trade. Uh, Doc probably could have taken a step back <laughs> with Varus there. <laughs> Stepped outside the ultimate. He ended up tanking the entirety of it, and it went down. And that's going to mm. let Twinton kind of push in to this mid lane, but Twinted has to be careful. The Dutchman gang squad is on its way here. No real follow up though. Level four, level five, and level four, so none of the big ultis are gonna come out. But that's, I, I do wanna point out once again, because Lebanon Valley have actually done very, very well with respect to, oh my gosh, uh, Panda, uh, Panda, you have an ult. Oh, no. Panda, okay, oh. good, you use the ult. We're gonna see this fight break out. You're gonna try and tango in the darkness, but it's not gonna happen. Cheesecake picks it up. That's two now. For the team captain in the top lane. Yeah, and for Panda there, yeah, he had ult, but you, you kind of don't want to fight it if you you have a choice. He didn't in that case. He was in the death realm. Uh, so you couldn't quite run away. But that is painful to see for Panda. And that also now means that Panda can't actually farm outside turret. If you walk beyond the turret, Cheesecake will happily pick the fight. Twinton was actually farming that top side as well and now gets to push in. We are pre-8 minutes. That means no Herald spawns. The way Belveth works is that if she kills the Herald, she gets to pick up that, that special Coral, which then allows her to spam those minions, take turrets even faster. I am worried now because Panda has no control top. Liquify is getting out jungled once again here and is losing camps. This should be a free Herald for the side of West Virginia Wesleyan. And if they can get that, they can accelerate the pace of the game so heavily in their favor. Of course, time will only tell, but it was a large chunk in their favor. So, as you said, just watching what Twinton does and how they try and take control of these global objectives, because you do have to feel some concern, right? As much as we know Twinton is going to scale up, you do have to have some concern that you're going to lose out on dragons once again, because that is now five dragons that Lebanon Valley have taken in a row. True. And I, I, I don't like the idea of giving it over, right? I just personally don't like the idea of giving dragons over. I'm sorry, I'm a very big dragon fan, but I, I don't like it. And so for Lebanon to actively concede that in focus of gathering ganks up, trying to get, uh, you know, those different profiles down, there's a lot to be uh, kind of following up on. Right now though, Liquify jumping forward, Ooh. flashes in and tries to take this fight. Good dodge. But instead, it's gonna be a powerhouse flash out this time. One more attack is gonna do it. McStuffins takes that kill. And they're going to go right back in because they can't. Twinton. Twinton is in a 1v1 because McStuffins doesn't want anything to do with them. But they both get out alive. Lebanon, take the mid lane kill and get away with only losing a couple ways. I love that we're finally seeing this mid jungle synergy come through for the Dutchman here. Really well played from them. And Doc McStuffins, they, he must have heard us talking after that last fight there. He spaced out properly this time, didn't get hit by the entire Sway and Ultimate, wins that particular trade. Great to see. Is very, very low though, and we'll have to base. And meanwhile, Twenton. Oh dear, dies there. Sucks for Oh dear. Twenton is actually happy with that death, because now he gets to farm that mid lane, pick up more CS, and Twenton is a hyper carry on this Belveth. Even more importantly mm -hmm. is that because they delay the back from Doc McStuffins, they still have that Herald control we were talking about here. Yep. And Twenton can go straight to it. Cheesecake gets to push out. Oh dear is going to be the first one back to lane because no TPs for either mid laner. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we both just kind of held our breath a little bit as Panda got bonked over the head and is now two levels down at 50. Oh my gosh, another one. Oh, Cheesecake man. has no chill right now. Said game number one, we had some beef. Game number two, it's all me. Quentin has now picked up that Rift Herald and once again, RMC, you called it earlier. This is going to be a problem. A flash in. Quentin going crazy for that one. Hope to get a knockup. Arrow? That's going to be an arrow going straight through the uprights. Liquify doesn't even move. I don't know if that was pure skill or just not worrying at all, but they don't <laughs> get pulled at all. They are fine. Oh, I said fine, but the eye finds up in a sound with 3v2 up top side. Oh, gosh. Yeah, they're looking for this dive here. Uh, the oh, Swain's yeah. ult is up and available. He can drain tank through that. Remember, Herald is available as well here. And Liquify base, Panda's on his own. Panda's on his own, but 
because the wave was pushed so far up and they didn't have time, Cheesecake was taking a little bit too long. They're now going to go here with a teleport. Teleport coming in from McStuffins. They're going to try and bait it out. Okay. Twin to tower. Twin to one tower. Twin dies. Two. And it's two under the tower. Panda. Panda gets his revenge and takes two kills. We, we talked a lot about West Virginia Wesleyan's communications and teamwork in game one. That TP from Doc McStuffins, absolutely massive. That is great teamwork from the Dutchman there. They just built their captain out, Billy Boy, in trouble right now, still has flash. And does try to use it, but remember the sick potential. Welcome to draft as Faith Heart Hope <laughs> knows there's no getting away. One more auto attack takes it as it's a double kill for Sepia behind the double kill of Panda. It's not done yet, though. It's not done yet. We want that delayed ace. We want that chance. Ding, oh. ding, ding. The arrow rings true. McStuffins now 3, 2, and 1. And the Dutchman, it just feels like they've been reinvigorated by that top side play. They suddenly just pop off across the map here. Uh, the bot side play, bot has been winning out constantly. But even the mid lane, Liquify recognizing no flash, no out on Odier. He's vulnerable. Psyduck? Psyduck. Psyduck just wants to get something and not die and they do they get away oh. for the time being and now a little bit more poke look who's coming back oh twin went down <laughs> twin went down and let sepia pick up another and they're now 4 oh this bot lane right now for the dutchman is unstoppable untouchable here twenton should have waited for backup just barely wasn't able to kill syrup psyduck and syrup if you've ever had it before it's sticky it's slow and if you don't have a gap closer you ain't getting anywhere near him RMC, what happened? <laughs> Attack tech again, let's go! <laughs> so not only, not only in this game have Lebanon Valley said, we're gonna take a little bit of the early game here and capitalize off your mistakes. They also said, we're gonna get the hex tech once again and fight you as McStuffins uh, unfortunately might get stuffed into a cheesecake. One more arrow, not going to be up as the final boot comes through. It's there, and it's very much available. And Panda wants to fight in this mid lane, but unfortunately, you're not the burst champion just okay. yet. Your Bongsick only does you half do that, but you still get it. You still get it, and that's a trade. So now top and mid are trading top and mid. Battle of the Bongsicks. Oh, Billy Boy doesn't know. Billy Boy doesn't know, but that's going to be the grab. You saw the arcane shift. You should get over the wall, and Twenton is right there. But now both teams are on opposite sides of the map, and this is dangerous for so many different reasons and so many non. For that point, both teams go back to respective lanes. Bot side taken over by LVC and mid taken by WB. Yeah, really well played from Billy Boy to hold that arcane shift. And Liquify pulling the trigger a little bit early on that ultimate there wasn't able to lock them down. But with the threat of Sepia coming... West Virginia, Wesleyan just couldn't afford to stick around. They disengage appropriately here. And we're seeing a lot of lane swap ups here overall <laughs> between all of them. Only one turret's gone down, that top side uh, in favor of West Virginia Wesleyan here, but it's unlocked Cheesecake to move around. But the problem is lane assignments, right? Mm. Panda is fine against anybody but Cheesecake. And if Cheesecake <laughs> is going to try and match somebody else and not play up against Panda right now, then Panda gets the free farm. Sure, you can kill Doc McStuffin, but. If I'm the Dutchman here, I'd start rotating Sepia and Syrup Psyduck up there. Maybe you kill one of them, but I think the other will kill you. And one for one trade, that's worth for them. It's always worth. We call out worth depending on, a, you know, if we get it or not. And we're just like, yeah, 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 we got it, we got it, we got it. Let's keep running with that one all the way through. And right now, as we do have some calm, we can see this top side completely dominated by West Virginia. They're going to fight it through. Liquify, yeah, Liquify, you got to flash away. You got to stay alive. Arrow from downtown. Goes through the uprights. Or actually landed. I think it landed on cheesecake. So cheesecake is yep. just chilling in the jungle, going yada yada. You know, it's a nice three-second power nap. Up oh, right, back to farming. Of course, you farm the wrong person as Panda gains a crap ton of health back okay. and is now sustaining through. This is the divine thunder that you don't want to watch because that liquify is going to go in. Do you get the knockup? No, you're going to go on Twenton, and they're both going to be taken low. Liquify does have the ult and is oh. now going to follow up. You get the bonk and you win. Panda still going to fight it oh, out because Bonk McStuffins is here. Arrow goes out, flash away from the chain of corruption. Do you follow through on Liquify? True shot barrage on the downside. Misses, and they clean house. A three for one for Lebanon Valley as they are taking over these team fights.
And tracking mythics is so important here, Orbital Billy Boy. Oh, the Great cleanse, cleanse, the Captain Jack cleanse. Only looks good on paper. Sorry about that. You did it perfectly. But Faith Heart Hope says, you ain't have any heart, and you didn't have any faith. Well, Faith, faith Heart Hope is still alive. So <laughs> where, where there's life, there's hope, I guess. Oh, maybe. Okay, okay. <laughs> I can, I can Honestly, it. Yeah, yeah, Yumi, there is no hope on your own. Faith Heart Hope is... <laughs> I feel like you're playing with fire by sticking around here. That turret yeah. goes down. Look at uh, Sepia. Sepia's uh, already threatening kills. The final chapter with almost oh, no, no one there yeah, needs a follow-up. Yeah, you're, you're going to be a little bit slow. Can you get... Oh, Twinton. Oh, wait, wait, Faith! Faith, you're supposed to hop on. Twinton doesn't have a kitten. <laughs> no, 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 Faith, no! That's a misclick if I've ever seen one. That one feels bad. Another misclick in the top side as Panda is going to fall to Cheesecake. We said it earlier. Panda cannot fight against Cheesecake, and that just solidifies that advice. I'm sorry. W watching a panda die, that that's pretty sad. But watching the end of faith, the end <laughs> of heart and hope, that there's just nothing quite like it. That, that oh was my God. so painful to watch. <laughs> I'm sure they were all screaming in the comments, well, Faith, get out to 20. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and oh now Liquify gosh. is getting collapsed on from every which way here. This might be another issue that they're seeing here. As again, Liquify doesn't really have the damage behind. And Cheesecake, Cheesecake's starting to become a monster. And we know what Mordekaiser yeah. is going to do. We know what a Mordekaiser is going to do in solo queue. We know what a Mordekaiser is going to do anywhere, right? Once you start allowing that Jack show to be built, you're going to have issues. Dragon coming up in about 15 seconds here. This is going to be nasty. This is going to be so rough. Yeah, and Sepia, as well as Syrup Psyduck, they're still really strong. Cheesecake starting up the Herald here, so won't be able to TP to help them. Doc is actually really worried about fighting this one here. <laughs> oh, Cheesecake. Cheesecake, oh, okay. buddy. Buddy, you just saw Liquify do that. That's not what you okay. want to be. Now we're looking on this bot lane as Sepia. Sepia might not be able to stop this dragon, but they sure as heck might be able to pick up some kills. In goes the arrow. They get some lockdown. Oh dear, taking quite low. Smite comes okay. in, and Twenton gets the bounty plus bounty gold. And Oh dear wants to fight. Oh dear wants they to go in, the but fight. the heal comes out, and they finish it off. Twenton saying, "Hey, we're gonna try and break this out. We're still gonna try and get something back." Faith, Faith is finally on the Belveth, but is that too little, too late? They the get chase out? is going on. The slows are there. This support Ash is doing work, and Liquify is gonna jump in. One more auto attack. She's doing oh. the volley, finishes it off. And guess what, Faith? You ain't got no more left. You are now dead, as West. Virginia fall apart. Liquify does not care that you're under the tower because you got the follow-up. A death by you the means a kill for cheesecake? us. And Cheesecake is ready to drop it in. That's going to be the hammer. That's going to be the pain. As McStuffins is going to try and walk away, you do not have the damage <laughs> just yet. And you ain't got nothing but time. Oh, no. Cheesecake is going to ghost for this triple and say hello to the man of metal. Oh, but you know what? It ain't stopping. It ain't stopping. Lebanon said we got more. The triple was a gift from us as Panda uses this Herald to take a tower on the top side. Chaos erupting on the rift. Twenton just barely able to stop the second charge from Herald there. It will not hit the inhibitor. But both these teams, are well, you're saying, yeah, the teams want to scale up for late. But no, the, the, the cops want to scale up for late. The teams want blood now they are looking for action everywhere and cheesecake right now one metal man against 380 carries <laughs> the metal man is stronger right now he came in and absolutely wrecked the entirety of dutchman so the dutchman kind of need to be a bit more careful of how they play this right now play away from cheesecake or you need panda panda right now is the only one who can handle cheesecake and even then we've seen cheesecake win that 1v1 it's really really dicey here and for west virginia wesleyan they need to play around their big metal men. Everywhere else they are falling behind. Oh dear, is not tanky enough. Billy Boy is very, very squishy. And that Vi, even that Ash and Kaiser right now, Sepia and Syrup Cider have just had that bot lane's number this entire game. It feels like West Virginia Westland have to take a page out of Lebanon Valley's book, right? Because in game number one, remember, LVC never really got away from each other. They were almost always together at all times. And that's all they did. And it looks like this might be truth, as Panda sure <laughs> is going to get ulted into the Realm of Death. Quentin is here and ready to go with the Yumi. So this is technically a 3v1. Make it a 4v1, because Billy Boo wants some action. No, Billy, you don't get to steal that kill. Listen, you're the captain. You don't steal the kill for the hardworking Cheesecake and Quentin. What the heck? 
Uh -oh. No, no, he didn't steal. He didn't steal. That, he was just, that's, you know, trying true. to help out. Oh, oh it's, the, it's the cheering. It's the yay. We're here to help. Oh, oh dear. Flashing away and saying, oh dear, that flash was very necessary. You do have the Rift Maker, so, you know, you can Where's sustain for a little bit. But the burst is too scary. Oh, are, no. are you going to get away? Oh. No! Really? The channel time's that short? Oh, yeah. It's it's super short. It doesn't get canceled unless you get dragged out, right? Like, damage is fine. No, I think, okay. I, I thought damage canceled it. Apparently not here. Uh, so, there's a lot of objectives being traded there. We see the mid turret going down in favor of West Virginia, but... Baron went down in favor of the Dutchman there in trade for Panda. So the question is, what can the Dutchman do with it here? They got an objective, but they need to convert on it. Cheesecake mm. just barely dodges out on that volley, not slowed down. So I don't know if they can actually catch up here. Uh, not unless Syrup Psyduck gets another ult. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the only way we're looking at it. All five members from LVC are currently rotating down, but this might be their undoing. You can see they have the faith, but they aren't looking on their back. Okay. And because of that, Twin flashes in, gets a knock up, but gets knocked up on their own. Exhaust goes down. No real damage coming out of the Velvet, but the rest of the team is here. Surf Sonic has to run away. Final tap is now going to be used to Root. catch everyone in their roots. And McStuffins is going to get caught out as well. They are quite low. Panda might be able to do something if you so wish. You're going to get the slap. Down goes one, and they're low. They are low enough. Panda says, this Panda. is my time. This is my moment. These are my kills. Arrow comes yeah. back up. Catches Billy. The cleanse is not going to be enough. Twenton tries to run away. Another zap comes out. And Lebanon Valley say we win those two for three. These top laners, man. We just saw Cheesecake pull off the 1v3. Panda comes in like a wrecking ball into that particular fight there. And the moment Cheesecake wasn't tanky enough, wasn't healthy enough to fight him, nothing could stop that Nasus from taking over. And... Orbital, the, the one I feel worse for so far in this game, I thought it was going to be Liquify. It's actually Billy. Billy has been amazing. Two insta cleanses in a row. Beautiful to watch. Didn't even slow him down a split second. But unfortunately for him, he's still stuck in the middle of the entire enemy team. So you can move, but you can only move towards one direction. Dead. <laughs> Not like Belveth, right? Not like Belveth, unfortunately. I, I do have to give props, though. And I just want to point this out because that's twice now that Billy Boy has done that, right? Uh, pulling off a Captain Jack's fla uh, Captain Jack uh, cleanse is actually quite difficult to make it look almost seamless. Yeah. And yes, that's not seamless, don't get me wrong. That's not as clean, but it's, it's pretty darn close. Pretty much was, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just sitting there, I'm like, how much time did you have to go into practice tools and practice cleansing out of that because if you cleanse before you still get rooted i think for like a, a third of the time or something right it's much shorter but it's still there Ooh. while we're talking about that we now see a time where mcstuffins would have liked to have cleansed but look Ooh. at that the retaliation Escape? from lvc is gonna break it out and sepia gets dragged into the realm of death but guess what i don't think cheesecake actually wants this action sepia dancing back and forth dodging oh. all the abilities and you're not going to get the kill sepia look back at up. the auto attacking look at that power liquify is now going to fall the follow-up is real as lebanon valley drop everyone in faith He's sure to follow. It's an ace from LVC. And all I can think throughout that entire fight over Rome is watching Panda go after Faith Heart Hope. Panda got that dog in him, man. <laughs> all this is right now, just hunting the entire time. Sepia, though, amazing mechanics in that team fight. Both these AD carries were hyping up Billy Boy's insta cleanses. Sepia, give him some walls, and suddenly Cheesecake can't actually kill him in mm -hmm. time there. That was massive, buying the time. Getting Cheesecake to sit in the middle of the enemy team, they find those kills. And Dutchman, they just keep finding ways to win these team fights here. West Virginia, Wesleyan, they're trying. They're trying so, so hard. It's just not working out, though. The hyper carries aren't as hyper as they would hope, right? We're still waiting for Twenton to get online. We're still waiting for the Ezreal to become powerful, who, again, even though you're 1-6, you do have two items. You do have a tiny bit of power behind there but it's not going to be enough you already see the itemization coming out here and again the radiant virtue being built on liquify anytime you see the item you know you're gonna have a rough time so they're trying they are and i agree with you they're putting their whole heart and soul into it i mean cheesecake more so than most 12 5 and 2 currently collecting most of the kills for the team but they need a bit more time they need a little bit more farm to go on here and if they can maybe maybe they have a chance to team fight in about 10 minutes will lvc wait 10 minutes 
Probably not. But you know, one can hope. Nope, the Dutchmen are going to wait two and a half minutes. <laughs> uh, 45 seconds uh, at the soonest here. Baron is coming up in 45 seconds. And for the Dutchmen, they just want to find another fight. They want to force the West Virginia Wesleyans into them here. And in two minutes, that's Mountain Soul on the table here. You cannot give that up if you are West Virginia Wesleyan. You can't. You can't. You just... I. You can't give them anything right now. That's that's the rough part. We said we want them just to farm, but you can't give up anything. You you just can't. So right now, Pan is still working off that flank, and now we're in a mid lane scramble. As West Virginia don't want to allow them to go to Baron, and LVC are like, can we bait Baron? Can, can we actually bait this out right now? They have all the time in the world to decide who they want to go for. And keep in mind, a 10-5-5 McStuffins is going to be popping people left and right, working on the Zanyas right now. Not going for the Rabadons or anything of the sort, just saying, hey, I got enough to burst through some people. Because of that, okay. we're going to go to her ward up. Multiple wards down, keeping all the vision for themselves. They do get popped. That is going to be Odier jumping forward. That's going to be the call. Gets three. That's going to be three-man root. And you get all the draws back. But how long can you stay alive? Odier oh, does oh. not have the Zonja, so you die almost immediately. Oh but goodness. the damage has been done. That's going to be a jump against Sepia. Cleans him up. And Panda wrecks the house. The boomstick. The cane is going to rock their world. Welcome to Pain Train, Billy Boy, the last one to die. It's a triple for the Ezreal, but it's an ace once again for LVC. And that was about the best fight that West Virginia Wesleyan could look for. Baron still chipping away, applying the debuff already. Oh dear, getting the engage, walking a three-man pull. And still, they just could not find the back line. Unfortunately, Billy Boy's doing damage, but he's doing damage to Panda to liquefy, not to the triple AD carries in that backside. Now, the Dutchmen, they get what they want. They get Baron, and more importantly, Orbital, it's desynced from Dragon. So, the Dutchmen can take Baron, they can walk to Dragon and look for another fight there, get Soul, and this time, if West Virginia Wesleyan lose that fight, as long as anybody but liquefy is alive, for the Dutchman here, they can take that Baron and crack the base open. I think I think that base is going to be cracked one way or another right now. It doesn't feel great. 33 to 20. LVC having a phenomenal showing here in this week one stage. In the Navigators as well. Your first entry in. The first time your team is competing and you drop a huge dub. That's, that's a double dub for me right now. Panda working through the minions as best as possible because, hey, I found an Odir in the headlights. Exhaust goes down. They are going to cleanse out as well. They're going to use everything to try and stay alive. Panda. Panda's rooting three of them. The arrow goes wide. Look at that. Panda hasn't lost He's any health. This. He has not lost any HP. And he is still fighting. Panda's got that dog and a bit more in him as Cheesecake is going to pray oh. for a chance to get a kill. And you got nothing. It is now a clean ace for LVC off of Panda, who is going to TP to mid to collect so much more than just a few towers. Well, okay, here, TPing mid and top here. They, the Dutchmen are playing this by the book. I honestly thought they could just push to end the game. 20 seconds death timers right now, but with all five members up, a clean ace with that Baron here. They are shoving in so, so, Do yeah, Doc went to the wrong lane. I think the, the site <laughs> missed call there. Is it going to matter? I, oh, dear, is coming out in five seconds, but without an ult, what's he going to do? Faith, heart, hope up, but again, you need a carrier for this Yumi. L let's be real. At this point, they're about as strong as a cannon minion because they are getting chopped through and a blow or two by Panda. Down go two Nexus Towers. Arrow goes out. Nexus sure to fall. Lebanon Valley College. You are taking the 2-0 over West Virginia. And well deserved as well. Lebanon Valley College Dutchman. They just seem to play better on the day here, Orbital. You know, we had said that for West Virginia Wesleyan, we want to see some insurance come through. They picked it. They, they picked the insurance. But what are you going to do against Anassas? Right? Like, there's just nothing that can beat that. Uh, props to both of these teams. But Lebanon Valley College, here in Navigators right now, it looks like the winning strategy is just turtle through the early game. And huge props to the bot lane. Sephia and Syrup Psyduck, both games, this was the winning lane for them here. This was the one that kind of forced their way through the early game, kept the team on even keel, and the mid game exploded and got them those leads. I love it. And again, this is week one. If we can see this type of explosiveness from one team, I want to see how far they can go. And same to West Virginia Westland, right? We saw the glimmers of hope.
Let's not forget, Billy Boy has got a little bit of a dog in him in the name of Captain Jack, named it specifically after that one. Very nice getaway mechanics. And again, we talked about the fact that maybe their roles are not so solidified. Maybe they're not specifically uh, good to go there because we see it here. We know Billy Boy can play just about anything, it feels like, with their uh, roster of champions. So much is available here, and I'm excited to see what more they can do. Same with Cheesecake, right? Dropping some mm -hmm. massive numbers. 12, 7, and 5 look like an absolute beast. If only the dog wasn't there against them. Nass is kind of getting down. There's so much potential for both of these teams that I cannot wait to see what happens. I mean, RMC, is there a player that maybe didn't shine here today that you are also very excited to watch continue to grow? Uh, I thought Odira actually did a great job in that mid lane mm. as well, especially in the, the 1v1s, a lot of those fights, you know. Uh, th there were hopes, but unfortunately, it, it, just the way that the fights kind of went, the teams, it was a lot more about those top laners and bot laners here. But I think Odir is definitely someone I'm keeping uh, an eye on. And you know, speaking of top laners overall, you didn't shout out DM Cheesecake there on that Mordekaiser. <laughs> he was in what should have been a counter matchup, but he picked it, was confident, and hey, props him, he won the 1v1. What happened later? You know what? That's not on him. <laughs> That's a team <laughs> thing. But in the 1v1, in the top lane there, the Mordekaiser was winning up. <laughs> I thought I'd give a little bit of prop to Cheesecake. Maybe not as much as I should have, but still there. And again, that's the point. In week one, anything can happen and teams will continue to improve. I can't wait to see what more can be done. Everyone, we will be going to a short break, but thank you so much for tuning in to the Navigators Division opener here with the NECC. There's more games to follow. We have plenty more to come. So do not go anywhere. The NECC mainstream will be back in just a few.
with you Can we talk about, can we talk about the truth? I wanna know, know, I wanna know Can we talk about, can we talk about me and you? Can we talk about, can we talk about me and you? Can we talk about, can we talk about the truth? I wanna know, know, I wanna know Can we talk about, can we talk about me and you? Artificial. 
need a scarecrow after what you did. Cause all of the birds know that I'm almost dead. I'm barely breathing. I'm barely awake. You left me in pieces. There's no more to break. Don't wake me up. Not in this century. Don't wake me up. Cause you're just a ghost inside. I need an angel after what you did Cause you were the devil You messed with my head You lied to my mother Don't wake me up Cause you're just a ghost inside my head You're just a ghost, you're never there You're just a memory on my lips Cause you're just a ghost child
Welcome back in here to the NECC. It is kickoff weekend for League of Legends. We've got another fantastic matchup here. St. Ambrose Esports taking on the Trine Thunder and Challengers Midwest Fish and Camcom. Get ready to call all of the action at Camcom. It's week one. We're still Yay! figuring teams out. We've got like 17 top laners on one team. I know. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> we're uh, figuring things this, out. I understand for all the teams. This is not the team with four bot laners. You can see that on the next matchup. Yes. But yes, this this one, we've got a total of, between the teams, we have four top laners between the teams. Uh, four supports as well. I think I count three mid laners. And you got you got two jungles and two bots. So. <laughs> no one wants to play jungle. No one wants to play any carry. I think that just about makes sense. But yes, yeah. like you said, thank you for the introduction, Fish. I, I am Cam Calm. Welcome to day one, week one of the Challengers Mideast is the... Uh, region division that we're in for this season or this stream even day one mm -hmm. week one very excited i think the, the my favorite part is even with all these different roles that we're gonna have to figure out who's playing we'll maybe see some swaps in between games that's not the best storyline from this series you pointed it out right before we came on the air camcom there is a player for trying i assume we'll see them hairless crab their mid laner mm -hmm. who told us they had their pet turtle run away from them as a child now we have a lot of questions i don't think we're going to get them answered but i am very very confused how that happens okay i am <laughs> unsure what's happening with my microphone i think i fixed it <laughs> hopefully you heard me if not uh hello but yes uh one of our players apparently had a pet turtle run away i uh, i wish we had interviews this early in the season but we don't have interviews until playoffs i don't believe so uh we will to hear the story behind our turtle friend but we will very much definitely make the turtle friend a key member of this stream here as we do move into the draft pool section now we don't get to watch the draft pool but the draft will be available to us in a couple of minutes so that is where we are for right now as we do get to see the rosters <laughs> Yeah, as we said, there's a lot of different top laners. Looks like for Trine, they'll be starting with Kettle Whip in the top lane, Project Chrono in the jungle. Hairless Clab, our fearless member who cannot catch a pet turtle as a child, will be in the mid lane. Polyps in the bot lane, and Magic Griffin will be their support. Again, I think all eyes from here on Hairless Crab Cam come just because maybe if he's late to a gank in River, it's because he couldn't chase down a turtle. He couldn't catch up to a gank. We'll have to see. Meanwhile, for St. Ambrose Esports, we have Prey, Shinigami, Dragon Beast, Wave Check, and Notebook in top through support. So it looks like they've figured out all their roster issues. Again, maybe we see swaps mid-game. It's week one, as you said. It's game one for these teams. I think there's still a lot to kind of figure out how these teams go together as we get into this NECC spring season. Yes, moving into this game one here as well, the drafts, or not drafts, the sides have been selected. It is going to be St. Ambrose Esports on the blue side for game one and then try and thunder on the red side i do believe uh as of right now everyone is on an even seed so i don't know exactly how the sides were selected in this game one as everyone is zero zero right now so unless i'm wrong and unless teams were preceded based on ranks or something along those lines then everyone is even for now but after after this week one we will start to see where teams do start to line up. This is, once again, a best of three. Mm -hmm. uh, the last stream that you probably watched here was a best of five for finals. So just remember, we won't have a best of five again until finals for this season. Yeah, best of three. Things going to happen pretty quick. As we hop into game one here, Camcom, I think the draft just finishing up on the pro draft. So what are you looking for? Is there certain picks you think we're going to see? Or do you think we're going to just see like, hey, bring your comfort pick, bring what we know you can play here for the first game and then go from there? I did take a sneak peek at the OPGGs. It looked like both of the teams were very close in rank, pretty much entire, uh, entirely in the gold range for both teams, with a couple of platinum members for each of the teams, a couple of diamond members as well, but very limited on those higher ranks, just pretty much in the gold division. So because we're going on what I'm assuming is going to be a very even footing in terms of rank and individual skill, I would like to see some more comfort picks. Uh, in this game one, kind of test out the waters. This is a new season after all. Like, you're in the very first game of the season. you got to get used to playing in a season, especially if we do have a couple freshmen here. So this very well could be their first official tournament match. So get comfortable with that first, and then we can start looking into some more synergistic style of picks as we do get to move into the draft. Which I have not looked at the draft, actually, at all. So I'm going to be surprised, unless you've seen the draft. 
I clicked over enough to see that it's done. There's a couple of picks okay. I'll recognize, <laughs> but not too many. I think the one thing, and I was going to point this out, you have to remember, this isn't solo queue. People can scout you because Project Chrono, you pointed out, play your comfort picks. I look at the OPGG, it's Wukong all the way down. What's that first band? It's Wukong. So these yeah. teams are going to try and make people a little uncomfortable here as we see a couple more bands coming through as we're just speeding through again. They pro-drafted off screen. That's why, for the first time in your life, you're seeing a quick League of Legends band phase. <laughs> Ah, yes. The quickest fan phase that you will ever see, as I do have the draft open with me now. So, the NAR selected as the top winner for St. Amber's. This was the very last pick for them. It was actually their B5 as the top side. As you can see now, for trying locked in, the Udyr was selected R1, I would assume, as a flex pick. As you do get to see, it is flexed to the top by with that Jarvan being selected on the R4 position. So... Uh, the Jarvan, very much like a, do we pivot the Udyr into top lane pick, or uh, do we lock him into jungle and then pick our uh, top winner blind on R4, and they decided to send the Udyr top kind of blind for him as well. I'm not entirely sure how the Udyr and Nara matchup works, Fish. Yeah, I, the one thing that I, is you were talking about the ranks being even, if there is a major rank discrepancy, it is Prey versus Kettle Whip. It's quite a few divisions. So I think that Udyr might just be like a, hey, let's put you on a tank that you're comfortable <laughs> on and not let Prey just take over the game. So I think Kettle Whip's designation here is don't die, farm when you can. I think Prey is definitely going to be someone who is looking to push that advantage in that top lane the advantage in the top lane on the NAR. Can be a safe champ, can be a very aggressive champ. That's kind of one of the benefits of picking NAR in a draft is you, obviously, as a ranger slash melee, he rarely is one of those best champions. Similar to that of Nami and support, where you can either play really aggressive or really passive, and the champion is able to fit into both of those niches. Now, the jungles and the mids have both been locked in on the sides. The Victor was selected R or B3 even, and then the Cinder was picked immediately after for the classic. Uh, mage versus Mage mid. I mean, you've heard Mage versus Mage so many times in the last couple of years. It's mostly just a farm lane. We're trying to scale up in this sort of lane. And as well as the jungles, the Vi was selected R or B2. So okay. they were picking the Vi, assuming it was Udyr jungle, and then they threw the Udyr top. And now it's a German jungle, and I think Vi still kind of beats out on both of them, as Vi is just like super S tier, super meta right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, she hasn't been meta in many years. <laughs> It has been a while. I love Visa Vi when she is good. Maybe, you know, I will say, thought maybe the Arcane buffs would help Vi out a little bit, but that did not take place, so it is nice to see her back. Looks like we might have had a bug in the draft, so they'll throw it rapid style. I don't think anything's going to change. We have the pro draft. Same champs. Yeah. Everything will be the same. We'll do it again. We'll see if we can beat our old record of, of getting through this draft as quickly as possible. I think, yeah, the thing you pointed out I think is going to be the big determining factor for this game is the Vi picked against the Udyr. They end up having to flex the Udyr top to make Kettle Whip comfortable, and that's going to be that one pick of, did they maybe pick it with a flex pick to try and help out Kettle Whip? If they did, I think that might have hurt their team a little bit, but we'll have to see. That's the one pick, though, that I have my on is, yeah, we're just, we're flying through this right now. We caught right back up to where we were with just the 80 carries in the support slot. And do I, I'm going to spoil the bot lanes. Uh, the bot lanes are kind of meta, kind of not. Um, you'll see here in a second, the bot lane for Trine is going to be Ezreal, Ada Carry, and Seraphine support, which was a very meta bot lane last, um, what just happened? <laughs> Wait a minute. These champions were not the champions that we saw in Trapple. Um... <laughs> <laughs> is, is this a bug on the Drapple side, or is this a bug on our graphic side? I do not understand. Because on our side, on Drapple, the bot lane for uh, St. Ambrose is Ash support very Sadie Carry, which makes a lot more sense than Rakan and Shen. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to see. I know sometimes Draft will have some issues. Usually though with more newer champions, not with the uh, old staples like Ash and Bar, so you'll have confused. to see. We always joke about if the teams read the script. They have this one scripted. They have the yeah. script. We have the script. So we'll have to see. Maybe when we hop in a game, maybe they had a redo draft. It's again early in the season. You're working through the bugs, Camp Come. We've all been there, you know. You're just like you're going through the motions, all of a sudden somehow you pick Shen instead of Ash. It happens to the best of us. Okay, so uh, the draft flow we have gotten confirmation is the champions that are correct. So it is going to be a Varus Hatch bot lane for St. Ambrose. It is unfortunately not the Rakan Shen. I mean, I was Dang more it. confused than excited for Rakan Shen if 
if that was the bot lane, would have been a very exciting bot lane. I definitely think you have some funny plays with those two champions. But um, Varus, Ash, two also kind of like A tier, S tier uh, in that range. I think Ash support especially. You've seen it so much in the past couple of months. Oh my gosh. We Here we go. Third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. We're going to do the same job four times in a row. Um, no, but Ash has risen so much recently in pro play because of her low CDs on really all four abilities, but particularly her ult, and because it got buffs in the past couple months with how fast it does travel across the global map. So you can shoot it almost twice a minute, and whether you hit it or not doesn't really matter because you're going to get it back in about 30 seconds. Yeah, and the Ash ult is, is kind of goes against the the uh, the great philosophy from the office where you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You just kind of, bam, throw them out there. Hey, yes. we land one. We're good to go. So I, I agree. I think Ash. I, I actually, I've been, I've been loving Ash support since last season. I, I think it's just oh, one no. hilarious. It just, you just keep firing off. All right, I'm really curious here. This is where we've gone a south. Oh no! <laughs> hey, we got one right. We got one right. We did it. We got one of the four correct. With the Ash, we, we do apologize. It sounds like we're having some lean client problems, so we're just trying to have some fun with it. Again, this is not the real pro draft, as Capcom said. It should be Varus Ash against yes. Ezreal Seraphine. We're one for four on the bot lane being... Hey, at least the first six picks work. We haven't had any issues with those. I just can't imagine the bug that this is like are the players literally selecting like Ezreal on their screen and then it locks in a quirky like how does this even work <laughs> how how what kind of like debugging bug is happening on the client right now like i don't know if you heard about this yesterday fizz i think it was yesterday but the patch did get reverted for a couple of hours and then they had the same oh, yeah. ranked that yeah. has not been something that I've ever seen happen before, and this is an also new problem that I've never seen happen before. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, in my League of Legends career, like, the most is when, like, individual champions, maybe, like, two champions is the most I've ever seen get disabled. But, yeah, reverting the patch. Reverting the patch yeah, is something that's... new. <laughs> I will say, anytime a patch goes out, you said, how is this working, right? That's, I think, what everyone asks anytime a patch goes out, because there's always something you kind of scratch your head, like, wait a minute. Like, what, what is... I still remember last year when the April Fool's jokes went live in all games. That was a fun one for oh, yeah. a while. Yeah, that was... That should not have ever gone live in ranked. <laughs> Why was that a thing in ranked? It was actively affecting ranked games. That should not happen. I'm perfectly fine with that on A-Ram, perfectly fine with that on Norms, but, like... What was it? It was, like, changing champion sizes and, like, canceling people's recalls and revealing them in bushes, I think, yeah. were, like, the biggest... The biggest issues that I can remember off the top of my head, but there were probably more. I think I think gold generation was affected or something like that. Scuttle crab one, I thought that was pretty. Did the scuttle crab fly? You know that it I was think... like just massively large for no apparent reason. I don't remember. Yeah, I remember like the scuttle crab could like walk across the whole map or something. It, it was something <laughs> very strange, and it was like this should not be in right. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I remember. I mean, that was also an NECC day, so I do remember. Like, we're like, uh, uh what are we gonna do if someone wins a game off of a scuttlecraft? Luckily, they fixed it before we went live. But yeah, we're okay, okay. again hoping to get everything fixed. We have St. Ambrose, we have Trine, everyone's here, everyone's at their computer. We're just waiting for the, for the client to work, in all honesty. We know what champions are picked, yeah. we know the, the not the. What am I trying to say? Team comps. I was trying to say the word drafts and team comps together. No, the draft <laughs> is done. The team comps have been selected. We are just simply waiting on the league client to function and let us pick the champions that we want to pick. That's what's happening. I mean, week one, who says no to just ARAM on Summoner Drift, right? Like, <laughs> you know. Our top sides are functioning. It's just bot lane. You don't know what champion you're going to pick. I've never seen a 50% ARAM game, 50% pink game. Um, This is just a new mode that Riot has invented just today. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, St. Ambrose like, could even got away with it last game. Like, Ash Volibear, like, could have maybe worked. Like, I could convince myself. Unfortunately, Quirky Trindamir. I like the function. I think Rakan Shen was yes. my favorite bot lane out of all the bot lanes that were randomly generated. <laughs> All right. Oh, we've done oh, it. We've, we've got, got it. Dropped. Okay. Yes. Now we can properly look at things because 
If you're just joining us, we do apologize for the delay, but it looks like we're ready to go okay. once we hop in. Everything's here on Capcom. Now we can officially I'm break so down happy. this game. Yes, so it looks like what I'm assuming, based on the fact that there are no bands on the screen, I would assume that that means that they probably remade the draft lobby and turn it into blind pick, is what I would assume, since there's no bands. Which, blind pick is the uh, format that most tournaments have been using recently, just because everyone uses draft pool before the uh, game at this point. So it's just assumed that you don't need tournament draft in the client anyway. It's more of a formality than anything else. So blind pick has kind of... Uh, just been the standard for the past couple of months, which is very strange. Because <laughs> that's not the actual mode that they're playing. They're playing tournament draft, but in the client it says blind draft. Yeah, it is, you know. Hey, at least, uh, you know, at least one of them works. At least we're all here. At least we're loaded in. Again, I think for me, I think my eyes for this matchup are going to be on that top side. If you're just joining us, I think Prey versus Kettle Whip is that one matchup that leans heavily on that St. Ambrose side, as you pointed out, Camcom. Everything else is basically dead even. It's those one ranks. And again, OPGG can sometimes lie. Sometimes you play better than your rank. I played with the teammates in rank games who play much worse than what OPGG says. So maybe there's a little bit closer of a skill gap that I'm expecting on paper, but that's the one matchup I look at and say, if Prey, baby, Shinigami comes up and puts Prey ahead, this could be St. Ambrose just kind of dominating th through that NAR. But what do you see in this matchup as we get ready to load into game one? Okay, I agree that the top side or the top lane matchup in a vacuum is probably going to be the most interesting. But across the map, I actually think jungle is going to be the highest volatility. I think the first jungler on the map, because they're both super early ganking and a heavy power spike at six type of junglers, like on paper, this is the same exact jungler just with different numbers on their kit. So it's going to be the player that actually is able to pilot their champion better in a 1v1 scenario or just a ganking scenario, whereas the rest of the map, especially the entire bot side, mid and bot are all completely scaling champions. So we're expecting very slow lane phases, going to be farming up for the first 20 minutes. Maybe we'll see a dragon fight. Maybe we'll just see the first couple of dragons given over to one team. And because of that, everything is going to be on the top side. Everything is going to be in the jungles. Will there be vertical jungling? Will there not be? I have no idea. But this jungle matchup, you say top lane, I'm going to say jungle for the most exciting matchup. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, jungle will be exciting as well. I think if if Trine can get vertical jungling where P Chrono can hang out on the top side, I actually think that's yeah, a side. win for them for sure. Because you keep Shin away, you have a 2v1 if Prey ever tries anything. I do see it, and we talked about Ash support. I think that's maybe the one thing that makes me lean St. Ambrose is they have another go button, right? Right now, it's besides the Cataclysm and the uh, Vi ult, they don't really have any other goes except for Notebook with that crystalline arrow could just fire it off. As we talked about, you just kind of rapid fire, hope one of them hits. I think that, in my opinion, gives St. Ambrose the edge. If Notebook hits 30% of them, I think St. Ambrose wins this game if he hits them at the right time because there's no counter for trying to try and either disengage or engage on their own terms outside that Jarvan. Yeah, that Jarvan really is the only engage for trying. You have, like you said, you have so much secondary engage from almost every single member may outside of polyps on the Ezreal, but your only initial first engage has to be on the EQ Cataclysm from Project Chrono. And outside of that, Trine, you're missing a lot of important cooldowns and probably will waste a lot of those other secondary engage cooldowns on potentially missed targets. Very important to watch these first clears of the junglers. You would assume it's going to be a three gank into a first gank, or three camp into first gank from probably both the junglers, so you just kind of have to watch which lane they're playing for for the first gank. We do see Kettle doing a decent bit of damage to Prey, but does have that, Prey does have that range versus melee advantage, and I do like the fact that the way Project Chrono is set up, he's going to be able to go to red buff, as you said, three camp, and then maybe try and look for a gank. Unfortunately, I do believe it is warded out, so St. Ambrose is going to have that information, they're going to know exactly where the Jarvan is, and Maybe Shin hangs around and tries to turn this into a 2v2 topside if he really wants to, because he has all the information he needs on the enemy jungler. Yeah, that information is going to be so crucial in making sure that Shinigami knows that he's not being counter jungled, or yeah, counter jungled or vertical jungled on the bot side. The three camp for Project Chrono is a little bit different than the one I would have expected. As as I said, it's actually going to be a four camp, but Project Chrono, like he did say in drafting phase, the very long drafting phase, <laughs> he wants to play for topside, and so far that is what he looks like 
is planning on doing Shinigami. Meanwhile, we'll be looking for probably his first cake on the bot lane. Yeah, Shin just now finishing up his red buff. Kettle, unfortunately, kind of pushing in, so there's really not an opportunity for Project Chrono to find a gank on that top side. There's also a fantastic ward down in that brush from the Gnar, so unfortunately Jarvan's not going to really find a way for this three-camp push as Magic Griffin looking for some damage, and it looks like instead both junglers are just going to be forced to farm some camps. Kettle Whip does go in, gets a decent bit of damage on Prey. Gnar dropping low does get stunned, but with no minions there to back him up, Kettle has to run away. Prey hops in! Only has the That's flash dangerous. left. Yeah, that was that was a little aggressive there, Prey. Maybe a little bit too aggressive. <laughs> it's definitely what I would say. Yeah, Prey's doing the best he can to try and at least evenly trade that out, but we'll be missing pretty much three quarters of his HP, only able to trade about one half of Kettle Whip's HP back. Of course, both top laners still have all their summoners active, but they each have a TP. Scary fighting down here, Botlin. Notebook does get rooted. You see Vine and Shinigami on their way, but Magic Griffin and Pull-Up's able to get away, and now Prey, see on your map, has activated the Mega. I was expecting maybe he goes in with Mega Nar, but instead he's just going to use that to farm. As soon as this Mega phase, I think Prey's in trouble. Will smartly hop away, but didn't make enough space for himself. Kettle going to try and look for the stun. He's going to burst down Prey. The flash, as the stun goes out, is just barely enough to keep that Nar alive. And this is just really excellent wave management from Kettle Ooh. Whip as a whole the thought. Hope we're going to flash forward, launch out the W, try and get the slow, but Shinigami cannot get in range for the Q. So it looks like it will be a retreat. And that's an early win for Trine as they build a flash and the teleport topside. And you lost flash barrier on Notebook as well on the bottom side of the map. Yeah, and as I was saying, this uh, wave management right now from Kettle Whip is playing so well in his hair right now. That is how he was able to get both of the summoners out for Prey, just keeping the wave dead center in the lane, forcing Prey to walk up with the Minionar, and especially with that Meganar as well, of course, once you do uh, move into that melee form. Very dangerous to walk that far out into the lane into the Udyr, and as long as Kettle Whip keeps managing to keep the wave like you see on the top side right now, just outside of his tower, that is the perfect range that he wants, and probably can get a gank from Project Chrono in a couple seconds. Yeah, Project Chrono gonna come up, Ghost going to be used, Stun going to land onto Prey, Meganar nowhere close to saving him, at this point I think Prey just trying to buy some time, Kettle Whip is dropping low, gonna hop away, but he's a tower shot! And that's going to be a guaranteed first blood stab for Project Chrono in the top lane. Trine plays it perfectly to get the first kill of the game. Project Chrono picking up the excellent first blood there onto Prey. And now Prey doesn't even have TP to get back in this lane. Denied that entire wave, plus, plus probably the first half of the next wave as well. Will be a pretty massive XP lead on to Kettle Whip in the next couple of waves here. As you see Dragon Beast as well with that level 6 on to Hairless Crab. Just for this wave, though, I definitely think Hairless Crab pops level 6. Yeah, I was going to say, if not on that minion, then sometime on that wave. So not a massive lead for him, just full enough to give him a little bit of a cheater recall for now. Yeah, every other lane has really been pretty even so far. That's really the first we've seen of Dragon Beast kind of pushing into Hairless Crab. I mean, you look at the CS, pretty even across the board. Polyp's just a little bit behind Wave Check, though he is going to eat some so or soak some solo XP as Magic Griffin Gonna go out and clear some wards, and Dragon is up, but as you kind of predicted, Capco, I don't really think we're gonna see an emphasis for either of these teams. Maybe if you get a back from bot lane, you'll go for it, but right now, it just seems like we're just gonna keep farming, and just as you said, we'll get to the 20-minute mark before we see too much action. Yeah, these early Dragons are gonna be required to have some sort of massive play in the mid or bot lane, like all the bot lane members dying, like something that type of massive, or just when the jungler's soloing it uh, away from the vision of the other team, I think are really the only conditions to see an early dragon probably for the 10 minute mark here. The Rift Herald on the other hand though, because of the volatility of this top lane matchup, definitely could have some play at maybe the 9 minute mark. I don't necessarily think it'll be in the next 60 seconds, but maybe about the 9 or 10 minute mark as well for the Rift Herald. Definitely could see some more action up here at the top side as Prey pop with that Gnar. Yeah, Prey threw out the Gnar, didn't land the stun, and really comes out of that, that fight with about as much HP as Kettle Whip. And Kettle Whip still has his teleport in case anything goes too crazy wrong. He did get a great ward 
down on that blue buff, and, and that's kind of what Try needed. They know that uh, Shinigami is topside, so they're going to say, let's just take the jungle. The Ash uh, Arrow does go out, at least to scout, but I don't really think there's any contest here. This should be free dragon over to Try, and they'll get an ocean dragon to start the game off for our objective standpoint. Ocean Dragon is my personal favorite dragon to start the game off with as well. I, I think the I think it has mana regen still, but the health regen especially, keeping you in lane for that extra wave or two, is very helpful. Wow, Ooh. brave. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, shout out Kettle if he was the guy I thought maybe was gonna be the weak link for trying is Oh, he gets the kill on the tower! No, the Q missed! Yeah, good job. Don't chase down Prey. I think Prey can outplay here with the range, but I thought that was gonna be the weak link for trying. Props, at least for the first nine minutes, over to Kettle Whip. He's played phenomenally. Meanwhile, Project Griffin, Project Chrono, and Magic Griffin down on this bottom side. They're gonna walk over a ward. Are we looking for an EQ combo here? Yes, we are. Notebook gonna try and dodge a two shot barrage. Can't do that either. The question is, who's gonna get the kill? They realize, let's just pick up a kill, let's not lose it. So Magic Griffin will get that one. They both get rooted, however, by Wave Check. Shinigami is coming in. They might have stayed too long. First kill picked up by Wave Check. Dragon Beast coming down. There's the cease and desist from Shinigami. It's going to give a double kill over to his AD carry. And just like that, Trine gives away so much. The Ash Arrow goes wide, but that's still a huge double kill for that Varus on the bot side. Yeah, and that double kill puts Vars way ahead of Ezreal as well in what should be a very even matchup. Mm. Now is extremely Varus favored as Kettle Whip just casually picking up a solo kill, solo tower dive on the top lane. So well played by Kettle Whip on the top side right now, but now on the other side of the map here for trying, Polyps and Magic Griffin are going to have a really hard time continuing this push that they have had for the past couple minutes because of very slight blunder of giving a double kill to wave check. Yeah, it really kind of started when we always flame supports for taking kills. Yes, they're more important on your AD carry or your jungler, but that's kind of that hesitation. Chrono probably thought, hey, let's just get the kill. I think Magic Griffin hesitated a second and said, I'll give the kill over to you. That kind of caused a whole chain reaction. The Varus ult chaining to Project Chrono as well was a big one. And now that kind of just throws away, I think, a lot of the lead trying had across the map. I mean, yes, you have a 2-0 and 1 Udyr, but if he can't even make it to wave check, that's going to be a bit of a problem. And I'm curious now what this means for Rift Herald. Does that mean we're going to get more of a brawl? I mean, you have Notebook already rotating over there. Magic Griffin's up there as well. I mean, we might have just a straight-on 4v4, and the big winner right now is Kettle Whip, who's got a two-level lead on Prey. Mid lane. Maybe? No? Okay. Never mind. <laughs> I thought that something else was going to happen, but Magic Griffin, unfortunately... Still sitting level 5 because of the micro throw that they had in the bot lane there. I think he should be picking up level 6. Uh, I was going to stop that wave, but it's now walking up to the Rift Herald. So Magic Griffin, if they are looking for some sort of top lane play around this Rift Herald, is only going to have level 5. No Encore available oh. yet. The Ash Arrow just misses Kettle Whip under the tower. Prey had to blow the Gnar. And unfortunately, that means this should be a free Rift Herald for Tri. Should be a free Rift Herald is the key word yeah. there. I definitely think uh, SAU still has some sort of contest in them, even if Prey sitting real low HP, because there still is no Encore. There is an ultimate advantage here for St. Ambrose. I'm just not sure if they know that. Looks like they're just going to opt to give that one over. So Rift Herald will go down. Curious where they're going to put it. Looks like... They're just going to jam it topside, continue to push down Prey. Magic Griffin does now have the Encore available. Maybe waiting for Dragon Beast. Hairless Crab without his ult, though. We saw that one blown just a little bit ago. There is the Rift Herald. That should be first tower. And all five plates going over to try. And great job here. I mean, again, this top lane I thought was going to go the opposite way. Can't come. I'm eating a little bit of crow for dinner right now. I was not expecting that performance. Meanwhile, oh, wave no. check. There's the ult from Ash. The final, the first one lands, and that gives wave check his third kill. Three and zero oh on the bars. That is a huge win for SAU in the bot lane. Oh, not over yet. <laughs> Shinigami, I think you just get out here. Dude. Nope. Syndra stun. Never over here. The Syndra stun did miss, and that kind of opened things up. Season is this going to go down? Encore comes out, just barely lands, but the snipe from Wave Check. He'll pick up his fourth. Magic Griffin trying to run him down, does hit him with the ability, but not enough to root him. And they'll just <laughs> blast code over. And 
I'll think that's a one-for-one -one trade you'll take if you're uh, St. Ambrose. Yeah, and if you cannon the kill on the pops there as well, it was a two-for-one trade in the favor of St. Ambrose. Oh, ten seconds left on this next dragon. I don't know exactly what kind of dragon it is. I just know that it is either Chemtech or Hextech. Um, because it says it's an ocean. I can promise you it is not an ocean for the second dragon here. But uh, for right now, the gold lead still says it's in the favor of Trine. But it's on the very opposite sides of the map right now. I think most of that gold lead is probably on the top side there for Kettle Whip Project Chrono. Mm -hmm. But most of the gold for St. Ambrose is on Wave Check. He holds 100% of the kills right now for them. And he's going to be here in this fight, and Kettle Whip will not. Kettle Whip does have teleport, so if they can last this out 30 seconds, they'll be able to join the fight, but I don't think they have that in mind. Cataclysm for Project Chrono misses on to Prey. True Shot Barra is going to miss as well. Now it's Dragon Beast's turn to feel the fury of Kettle Whip, and he quickly realizes that underneath the tower is the safest place to go, so even with Wave Check there, though he didn't really participate in much of that fight, this looks like a second dragon going to be picked up here by Trine, and now the Unleashed Teleport is up if Kettle Whip needs to join the fight for any reason available right when the dragon is taken. I was fully expecting there to be a bigger team fight for that, but the initial setup of Hairless Crab landing that double stun on the Syndra was basically the perfect case scenario for trying to land the setup and the engage because Project Chrono was not able to engage with Cataclysm in that very specific scenario. So because Hairless Crab was actually able to get the first engage, Project Chrono and Magic Griffin had a really excellent follow-up as Kettle Whip just casually making sure Prey knows he cannot walk in the jungle whatsoever. Yeah, SA, SAU needs to find a way to get Prey in this game. I mean, that team fight, it started and ended when Prey, he didn't get caught by the Cataclysm, but he got hit so low, didn't have Meganar available, that there just was no way to contest that second dragon. Infernal Soul, I think if you're trying, is definitely something you're excited to see that can definitely be kind of that win more soul, as you said. The gold lead, it is over 3,000 gold in favor of Trine, but Wave Check has a ton, and he hasn't been in a major team fight yet. So it wouldn't shock me if team fights are a little bit closer than the gold lead would indicate, but if Wave Check can't be there, Trine wins everything, and Kettle Whip, oh, nearly gets in range. The hop gives Prey some space, but he's still going to take a ton of damage. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. That damage was definitely not uh -oh. okay to Taylor's Crab. Almost landing that full combo on a Dragon Beast. And that's going to be a Cataclysm to finish it off. Fantastic Zonius there. The Ash Arrow will miss, but Shinigami might have a double kill for himself. He will. Oh, great Gnar into the tower. Prey going to create some space. Kettle Whip. The victim of his own wow. hubris <laughs> dies underneath the tower. That is a massive shutdown and Prey now kind of back in this game a little bit. Massive shutdowns across the board there for St. Ambrose. Uh, Shinigami picking up a really clean double kill. Pretty much just a clean up double kill, but still, that double kill will go far for Vi's pockets here. It is still a 2,000 gold lead for Shrine, but what was previously nearly a 2,000 more gold lead. For 4,000 total, 2,000 more than it is right now. So St. Ambrose picking it back up in their pockets a little bit here as polyps, my friend. I, I don't think he wanted to eat into a melee range of a buy. He's going to pop heal here as well, oh. but it will not be quite enough. You lose so much for that fight. You lose heal, as you said. You lose Encore. Kettle Whip did teleport down, but unfortunately, I don't think he's going to get in range of anyone. The Ash Arrow did get used to create some space. We still have the Varus ult as well. Now Prey... And that kill for Prey was so huge, because now he's the same level as Kettle Whip, despite being dominated all game long. Unfortunately, he might suffer a similar fate that he's used to. His Project Chrono comes up. Hairless Crab is there as well. Looking for the flag and drag. They get it, but they don't quite get this knock-up or the stun. Crab has to commit the flash. They get the kill, but I don't know if that was worth it to get the Cinder Flash blown. It's not going to be up for this next dragon now. Yeah, I definitely think uh, Hellas Crab's Flash would be more useful for some sort of engage, whether it's primary or secondary, on this next dragon fight. It is Soul Point for Trine Infernal. Soul, if you can get that 4-0, is really, really powerful to stack as an early dragon soul here. And Kettle Whip pretty much allowed to freely split push on these side lanes, has claimed the last, or the next outer turret that he's claimed. Last one will be left for him in the mid lane. I do definitely like uh, Kettle Whip playing on the opposite side of the map 
for pretty much the entire game so far from the rest of trying he's been carrying around this goal lead as best as he can and putting it to as best use as he can being a non-team fighting champion oh. wow bye seraphine <laughs> I mean, we talked about it, Capcom. That gold is on wave check. We just need him to make an appearance, and uh, killing Magic Griffin from about 50% is as good of an entrance as you can make. Now, 5-0 and oh in this game, securing the Rift Herald. The True Shot Barrage does come out, but there's no follow-up, and I think this is exactly why Kettle Whip's playing on the opposite side of the map. I don't think all that gold in the world is going to help him against Wave Check right now. He is not tanking it up if he can't get in range of that Varus to survive just being auto attacked down. Wave Check, like you say, definitely is a massive win condition right now for St. Ambrose. Meanwhile, down here on the bot side, though, Prey was actually able to take the first turret for St. Ambrose. I think Kettle Whip. Had recall was farming. I wasn't watching bot side. I was watching her kill, so I'm not entirely sure how Frank was able to get that first turret for St. Ambrose, but nonetheless was able to pick it up for himself. Now we have a dragon fight on our hands here. Fish. Five seconds left for this infernal, infernal soul point spawns for trying. They do have Hairless Crab on the top side, but he has his teleport, so does Dragon Beast. The Rift Herald just gonna get thrown down. In the mid, more to create a distraction from anything else, and at least for the time being, St. Ambrose is going to hop right on top of this dragon, going to stop trying to dragon striking, but here comes Kettle Whip, here comes the rest of the squad, but that Narbar for Prey is in perfect spot at about 80%. He's going to hop on Polyps. There's the Nar, the Nar going to stun one. Ash Arrow going to come out, teleport going to come in from Dragon Beast, top side of your screen, as Notebook is the first one to fall. Hairless Crab, where's that flash? You don't have it. They're going to lose a couple more as Dragon Beast enters the fight and makes it a 3v3. They do lose wave check, however, and that's a majority of their gold, so they're going to have to back off, but they at least, neither going to prevent both teams from getting the dragon, it looks like. So it does look like we're going to have another dragon fight, yep. is basically what yep. you're saying. Oh, that was um, for nothing. That was, yeah, that was really well played by St. Ambrose. What was originally a really disadvantaged heat fight for them suddenly became perfectly advantaged because of Prey's timing on the Narbar, like you said, and because of his little tiny flank and the positioning. Now, Dragon being started up by Trine when they don't have their members on the map quite yet might be a little bit dangerous. Prey gonna get that backside TP yet again? Oh, uh, we're about to see the team fight. See if it's team fight again here. Big difference this time. Prey, since he just spawned, is only at about 40%. That Meganar nowhere to close. Kettle up. Gonna hop right on top of him. Nar gonna be rooted. He is the first elimination. The Ash Arrow does go out. Stuns Project Chrono, but they don't have that Meganar front line. Shinigami charge up the Vault Breaker. Gonna go in with that Cease and Desist as well on the pull ups, but he will fall over. And I think that means St. Ambrose has to turn tail and run. This will be an Infernal Dragon handed over to Trine. And the big difference no Meganar. Nope, team fight win for St. Ambrose, or really even a close team fight at that. Yeah, also Wave Check wasn't there to do the damage. Uh, from the engage from Shinigami, Shinigami got a really good engage onto four members. He was even able to, I don't know if you caught this, but he buffered Hairless Crab's stun with his unstoppable Q, I think is what happened there. So because he was kind of forced to use the Q in a, a not so great scenario to buff the stun from Hairless Crab, he was forced to immediately engage, which was actually kind of turned out to be a good engage. He just didn't have the damage follow-up to be able to make it worth it. So he went in on the suicide mission, ended up falling in as a jungler. That just means that the rest of the team has to uh, turn tail and run, giving the third dragon in a row to Trine. They have four minutes now for St. Ambrose to make something significant happen, or they're going to be losing four to zero in these dragons. And they've got four minutes to figure things out. Is Project Kroto going to go in on Shinigami? But neither of them really going to take too much damage here. Both junglers very well tanky. They are going to find Wave Check, though, with the Encore. And Project Kroto picks up a free kill out of the AD carry of St. Ambrose. And I want to say you just pivot this to Baron, because that yeah, is... Baron, yeah. That's all the gold. Don't care about the tower. It's week one, but we ping Baron. <laughs> yeah, for in my books, that is 100% a Baron play every single time. I think that is also why Kettle is running around on the bot side. Kettle Whip is currently distracting three members of St. Ambrose, but this very small 
a uh, distraction on the trine here in the top side. They were clearing wards, they were actively auto attacking the Baron, and now we only have three seconds left on wave check. That was a really well done pick there for trine. But they did burn three ultimates for their fish. They burned Chrono, they burned Polyps, and they burned Magic Griffin's ult. So now, if there is another team by here in the next maybe 15 to 20 seconds, it may just come up very St. Ambrose favored. Yeah, I'm still just disappointed that they didn't get the Baron. I do think part of that does speak to the very strong warding of St. Ambrose. They had tried and would have had to give away their position. As you said, I think the big one, the Encore, not going to be off cooldown here for another maybe 20, 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm looking at the river. That's there is one. so many red wards. I'm just... we, we the river is well illuminated. Well, it was, but that that just caught me off guard when I look. I'm like, how many wards do you need? There, you're just triple covering every single section of Baron, and they're all gone. Well, the trick with that fish, I think, is the the wards on our spectator screen look the same as enemy is or areas warded enemy ping. Yes. That. That ping. Yep. So it looks like everything is warded three times, but I think in actuality it's probably not. It's just both the teams warded and they show up in the same color for us in spectator mode, which is a little unfortunate, but not something we can control. You, you are right. That is throwing me off a little bit as well as we do get some dr barren posturing. I think the big one, of course, is that two-minute timer top left of your screen. That is the Infernal Dragon. It would be soul for trying. I think St. Amber is going to try everything in their power to try and prevent that. It looks like everything should be up for everyone if we play these next 90 seconds or so cautiously. So as long as Kettle Whip or Dragon Beast don't do anything crazy, we should have all systems go for what could be a very pivotal team fight here in this first game between St. Ambrose and Trine here in the NECC Week 1. Absolutely. I think if Trine wins the very next team fight here, that should be an immediate Baron angle and possibly breaking this inner uh, inner tower line that Trine has yet to break here from St. Ambrose. But on the flip side, if St. Ambrose wins this next team fight, they would finally be able to break this outer line and possibly claim that their first Baron and maybe even the first Dragon wave check though. Force the flash, burns a couple ultimate cooldowns from Trine, but that flash on wave check will be crucial in this next game fight. Yeah, flash for Encore, I think, is a very decent trade. Of course, the Ezreal, if Polyps can get in range, should be able to reduce the cooldown on that True Shot Barrage. Just in time for this uh, dragon to spawn, if it won't just naturally come off cooldown. We did see Shinigami and Notebook hop on the bear in there and kind of take a little bit of unnecessary damage. Remember, they don't have that Ocean Soul. Ash Arrow is going to miss. I think this has got to be a retreat from St. Ambrose. They don't know Project Chrono is waiting in the brush. He's going to go in. Two-man oh. Cataclysm onto Notebook and Wave Check. They both go down right before Dragon. Kettle Whip going to come flying in as well with the Ghost. There's another flag and drag for Project Chrono. This should be a four kill. The Gnar trying to create some space. Prey is going to go down for sure. Kettle Whip with the tower doing damage to him. Might have to trade his life. Can't quite get in range of Shinigami, but that should be more than enough for this to be Infernal Soul handed over to try. Project Chrono coming out of the river rush to just continue cementing this lead in the dirt for Trine right now. Just solidifying it now. 5,000 gold lead for Trine as well as this Infernal Soul that they are about to pick up now. Unfortunately, uh, Hairless Crab is not the same slow pusher as Kettle Whip is, so he will be picked up there in the top lane, but that being the only death as well as Kettle Whip in that last team fight for Trine is so, so beneficial for them now. Like I said earlier, you did secure the 4-0 Dragon lead for Trine. Now, at this point, they want St. Ambrose to fight them. They want to have these extended team fights because this Infernal Soul is going to boost, boost their damage so, so much. Objective Vanity is now spawning as well for St. Ambrose. They have to make a play happen. Either one of those Baron or on the Elder in the next couple of minutes, and it looks like it's going to be the Baron right now. Yeah, they caught Trine in a perfect recall, actually. Two Shot Barrage going to go out, Baron at 4k, Kettle Whip going to try and throw his Storm over the wall. Couldn't quite do it, however, and a fantastic play by St. Ambrose. They caught Trine kind of saying, well, we don't see him on Baron. I don't think they're going to be that crazy to do it. They all back in. That at least will keep St. Ambrose in this game. The gold lead going to go back down to 3,000. But with the way the team fights have been going, 
This really feels like if Trine can get that next dragon, the Elder Dragon, in five minutes, it should be GG, and every dragon fight's gone their way, so St. Ambrose has got to come up with something to turn this game around. I do like the Baron from St. Ambrose, but to me, it feels more like a Denial Baron mm -hmm. to Trine than a Baron that they'll actually be able to use for anything on their own, because none of their waves are really in a good enough state to take down any of these turrets. And as well, because the objective bounties, they get some extra gold from taking that Baron as well, so... It's not all terrible. They get to use the gold from it more than the actual Baron buff itself, I'm pretty sure. But more beneficial than anything for St. Ambrose is the fact that Trine cannot get that Baron for the next five minutes. This massive team fight that is brewing in four minutes around this Elder is going to decide the game. Whoever gets that Elder will be able to immediately pick up the Baron right after and should be able to close out the game from that point. Ash Arrow does land onto Magic Griffin on the back line and they get eliminated. Prey and Kettlewhip, we've seen that story before. So one huge pick for St. Ambrose, and they want more. Prey going to jump in, has the Meganar, great Nar into the wall, but Polyps able to get away and just barely dodges the rock throw and oh the gosh. summon airy. So what was the HP? What was the HP? Oh, it was less than that. It says 80 now, but it was definitely like, you know, in the probably single digits right there. That was Ooh. impressive footwork from Polyps. Did burn the cleanse, did not even burn the flash fish. <laughs> the fact he has Flash is both frustrating and impressive. Because if you die with Flash in that situation, everyone's going to be upset. But the fact you hold on to it is huge. Objective bounties will be falling off here soon. We'll see if they might be able to cash in on another one on this bottom side of the map with this Baron Empowerment. And now all of a sudden, with that team fight win, having Baron, this Baron has quickly gone from a Denial Baron to... Quite the game changers. We do see Project Chrono is going to go in on the Cataclysm. The very top right corner of your screen. They are able to pick up Notebook Kettle with taking a ton of damage and retreating. Oh, the Flag and Drag onto Dragon Beast just barely misses Kettle Whip. Trying to get a stun onto Prey. Look how tanky that Udyr is. He's going to get knocked into the wall. We do see Shinigami going to go in trying to hunt down Magic Griffin. The Smite not going to be able to secure the kill as we get kills across the map onto St. Ambrose. It was looking good for a while, but it's going to end up in an ace for Trine. And now they're going to be able to do some damage here with Kettle Whip in that base. Man, it was looking so, so great for St. Ambrose, like you were saying, Fish. Everything was turning up in their favor. They closed the 5,000 gold lead to only a 2,000 gold lead for Trine, but getting ace like that just immediately puts it right back in the 5,000. They lost objective baddies. Objective baddies are now almost immediately back on the table for St. Ambrose, so they only didn't have objective baddies for probably about 10 seconds there, immediately coming back online. And meanwhile, Kettle Up. I don't even think he was in that team fight, and if he was, he was just standing there TPing up on top side so that he was able to take the first inhibitor of this game. All inner turrets are broken out from St. Ambrose as well as the rest of Trine were knocking on those inner turrets as it, uh, Kettle Up was on that inhibitor. And that's a fantastic inhibitor to get for Trine, because now it means that top wave's going to be pushing when you need to be bottom side of the map in the next 90 seconds for this Elder Dragon. So that's going to create a ton of just straight minion pressure on your base. You see Dragon Beast does have the Unleashed Teleport, so he's going to try his hardest, I assume, to clear this wave, get it pushing at least as far as he can for St. Ambrose, because this Elder Dragon... You cannot afford to give that over to Trine. The way these team fights have been going, they don't need a 20% execute because they're killing you already. So St. Ambrose has to win this. And with Super Minions pushing topside, this is going to be a very tough ass for St. Ambrose here. And I'm curious how they're going to set up in this fight because they're not going to have any control of their bottom jungle. They're going to have to basically go in blind. Going in with blindfold on their face. For St. Ambrose, walking into an Infernal Soul team here as well. Very terrifying for St. Ambrose. And as of right now, as well, Dragon Beast is currently split pushing on the top side. He's not necessarily needed on the bottom side of the map right now, but because he is top side, you do have to keep in mind the extra either walking distance or TP time that will be needed for him. As yeah, this this team fight right here, you're either gonna Win the game for Trent right here, or St. Ambrose is going to extend the game for at least a couple more minutes. Elder Dragon up in 10. We'll have no flash on either AD carry, and on Dragon Beast will be flashless as well. Other than that, everything but the True Shot Barrage is up. 
And we'll see if Cat Whip can get in range. Project Chrono hiding out by the chickens, and he jumps in with a huge cataclysm. Prey going to try and jump oh, out on the back line. Nars 2 into the wall. Look at how much damage Cat Whip is able to take as Polyps picks alive. up one. How, how is he still alive? He's still going. Polyps gets a second. That's G. Oh my G. God. And this might be, is this the pentakill angle for Penta Polyps? Kill. Give Penta him the penta. Kill. He missed. Penta oh. <laughs> Dragon Beast baited him. He went right. Polyps predicted straight with the auto attack. A little bit of BM from his teammates to finish that one off, but it's a GG for trying as they get game number one. GG for trying. Picking up game one of their first best of three of the season against St. Ambrose University Fish. That was a really good game. That was a really clean mm -hmm. game. I would say from both sides, pretty even, pretty back and forth. Until, of course, the 5,000 gold lead first originally spawned for a try. And then from there, it was only like one or two mistakes that they made. And the rest of their backer game was very clean. They only dropped one Baron just due to kind of unsynced back timings. But mm -hmm. other than that, every single dragon, they claimed the inner turrets on every single lane, which in my books is just a show of really strong communication macro play from the team. If you're able to get inner turrets up to inhibitor turrets at least on every single lane, despite only the top side being the significantly winning matchup, just shows the communication power from Triad they had during the entirety of the game, and I would say definitely well-deserved win from them, and I'm excited for the next game or two games. Yeah, I think St. Ambrose is going to have to go back to the drawing board if they want two games, because, yeah, I mean, as you said, they only lost one objective to Trine, and... I think if yeah. we had our Baron power play, I think that was a negative Baron just because, as you said, it was more preventative. Mm -hmm. Almost brought it back, kind of got baited, trying to beat out the objective bounty timer. But I will say, I think the MVP goes to Kettle Whip. He absolutely played his yeah. hard out. Again, I pointed that out. I said, look, I'm just looking at the raw stats. No disrespect to you, my man. It looks like you're outmatched the top side, and he played that so perfectly. We'll see if he can do it again. Or St. Ambrose, as Camcom said, maybe has two games in our future. It's week one of the NECC. It's Challengers Midwest. Try it in St. Ambrose. Game two is coming up right after this quick break.
Down the rabbit hole again And as I fall I can feel the pain You can tell me where to go So I don't know and just go with the flow Falling up, I'm falling down from the sky and from the ground. Up and bar just like below, and I don't know.
so can you so can you Welcome back in here to the NECC. It is week one of League of Legends. Fish at Camcom calling all the action. We just saw trying to take down San Ambrose in game one of our Challengers Midwest series. And now we're getting ready for game two at Camcom. As you can see the stats here on the screen. They might not be impressive for my man Kettle Whip up in the top lane, but he absolutely dominated that early game on that Udyr, allowed the rest of the team to get activated, and it was really just an uphill battle from St. Ambrose for about minute six or seven when Kettle Whip started to really kind of farm that NAR. Yeah, I absolutely agree that Kettle Whip was the individual MVP here for Trine. Yep, Trine <laughs> on red side there, but I think every single player on Trine had their shining moment um, Ezreal in the bot lane had uh, a really hard time getting out of laning phase. He was definitely very far behind the Varus. And in, in the end, he came out, what, like 7-2, and 8-2, and two, something crazy like that, when he should have, by all metrics, lost this laning phase really, really hard. And in fact, there you saw on the damage graph as well, he was actually able to out damage every single other person on the map, which I think is pretty hard to do on Ezreal. You have to hit the skews to do the damage, and getting the most damage on really any skill shot based champion I think it's quite impressive. 
And not to knock him, I will say, though, Cam Conkey did miss the most important cue, which was a shot at his pentakill, unfortunately. Oh, yes. Was wide right on that one. Would have been... If you start out week one with the pentakill, that would have been huge. Got the quad. Again, I think a little bit of BM on his teammate, Hairless Crab, for taking that one. You had the game locked it. up. Just, it was a 5v1. Just let the man get, let him hit the shot. But again, I think like, absolutely dominant. I do think the one thing, again, it was something that I highlighted at the start. I thought Prey was kind of going to be the one who kind of took over that game. I was wrong. I want to see St. Ambrose put him on something maybe he's more comfortable on. I know his Gwen and his Camille were banned away, but just looking at his his OPGG from last season, maybe an Aurelia, maybe a Jace, something that maybe he plays a little bit better on because the NAR, it's just not there. I'm looking back in Season 9, I can't even find NAR, so maybe that's a team comp thing, but I want to see Prey on something that maybe he has a bit more agency, a bit more comfortability on in this game too to kind of take over. I am very excited for this game too, draft. I'm getting a lot of spoilers, a lot of sneak peeks here. Fish, have, have you gotten many spoilers? Have you been watching it? I've looked. I looked at the first phase. I saw the first okay. phase. Okay. Okay. So then I can ask you this question then, because I can't answer because I've seen the whole draft. Um, what would you like to see changed here for St. Ambrose? Um, in this game two draft, they did have a very close early start to the last game, but I think uh, by the end of the lack of late game damage that they really had starting to show once we got to the 30 minute mark. So what do you want to see from St. Ambrose change? Maybe stay the same here in game two. I think I like the bot lane for St. Ambrose. I think that Ash okay. was fine. I think if you bring back Ash Varus, maybe pick a champion that Wavecheck has a bit more mobility on. He got caught quite a bit at the end of the game. I really, like I said, I think it starts with Prey being on just something he could do more damage on. I let him take over the game. Like I said, I assume that Gwen will probably be banned. That was kind of his most played, just looking back through multiple seasons. But if they can put Prey on something that I... At least on his OPGG, it feels like he's more comfortable. And that's what I hope to see. I thought mid lane was fine. I thought Shinigami in the jungle was, I think, fine on the Vi. I think anything similar. But I think Prey is that one person. I, I hope they change up in the draft. If they come back with a Gnar, I might just walk away and just be like, okay, come on. What are we doing? We can't bring Gnar back. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, they did not bring the Gnar back here for yes. him. I, I will give you that much, but uh, I, you don't, I don't think you're going to like the champion uh, that they did pick no. for him. <laughs> I felt like that fist pump might have been a, a little uh, premature, and now I get to see maybe, maybe. <laughs> the I, full I, result. There is very significant um, band changes, I would say, between Game 1 and Game 2 for both of these teams here, which is not something that you usually actually see. Usually... Uh, bands almost stay the exact same throughout mm -hmm. the series, but they did swap sides as well. Uh, Trine is now on the blue side, SAU is on the red side. Game 1, SAU on the blue side, band with Wukong, Caitlyn, and Zach. This game on a, are on blue side, red side, nope, they swap sides. Game 1, they were on blue side. Game 2, they were on red side. This time they banned away, um, Unir, Wukong, and Maokaim. Very different champions, as, uh, spoilers, you do now get to see the entire top side for both teams. We have locked in these champions very quickly. I was gonna build up to the matchups, but no, I was- I spent too long on bands. Yes, they just decide to lock in Sejuani here for Prey. I told you, you were not gonna like the champion. It's not Nara, but it's very similar to Nara. Yeah, it definitely gives off those Nara vibes. It definitely puts it- I mean, again, I get it. You have the melee Nara jungler. Vibe. The melee jungler and Shinigami, you pick Sejuani, it all checks out. I do like the Udir ban. I think it's interesting that at least, you know, on paper, Kettle Whip is going to be the more aggressive player in this matchup mm -hmm. on the Olaf. Because in, I think in the last matchup, it really felt like they drafted like, hey, just play smart. And that's what he did. He played super smart and realized, yeah. I have an advantage. Let me push this advantage. So curious how he comes across as the aggressor here for the rest of these teams. I think the big matchup for me it's that mid lane matchup. Hairless Crab, I think, had some really good moments. He also had some really questionable moments. And Akali into Vladimir, especially if Dragon East plays it right, is not going to be a fun matchup for that Akali. When you're dealing with energy versus cooldowns, that Vladimir is going to be able to self sustain. You have to be in melee range. That's a big question mark, I think, is that mid lane for me. Yeah, the mid lane matchup, a very different, like you said, matchup than we had game one. Game one, it was Victor versus Syndra. That is one of the quietest matchups for laning phase, possibly in the entire game, I would mm -hmm. say. But now, Akali, the assassin, into Vladimir, the, like, assassin mage, almost. He, he has, like, vibes, like you say, of both being assassin and a mage. And he's also a very short-range mage. I, I want to say shortest 
range of any mage, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so I'm not going to actually say it. <laughs> but uh, my big focus is actually going to be on the spot lane. The only returning champion in the spot lane is going to be a notebook on that Ash. Every single other champion, I would say, is pretty significantly different than what they had in game one here. Polyps on the Ezreal, now playing Caitlyn. Um, I can't think of a more different champion, actually, than Ezreal to Caitlyn. Um... At least in the AD carry range, and then yeah. also the Seraphine, the Karma, they seem different, or they seem the same if you just want to classify them both as enchanters, but Karma is much more of a utility enchanter, whereas uh, Seraphine much more of a damage enchanter, so Karma, very different place that I would say, and a lot less roaming than Seraphine is allowed to do so. Magic Griffin most likely will be playing very heavily towards the bot lane this game, as now bot lane is pretty much the sole win con here for trying, unless Taylor's crowd just goes absolutely crazy on the Akali and laning phase. Yeah, because looking at trying, I mean, that's kind of the one big difference for this team is they don't have a great engage right now. I mean, last time they had the Encore, they had the Cataclysm, they even just had Keto Whip just kind of running in and tanking everyone, as we saw in that last team fight. Now it's your reactionary, right? You have the chain on Magic Griffin if you want to get away. You have the AoE shields to kind of help your team survive a go, but I am concerned for trying because I look at SAU, I think bringing back the Ash is important because I love that Ash era as an engage. Again, as we talked about, how many did Snowbook throw off? Like 30? Only hit 10 of them, but they were high impact most of the time. You have the Glacial Prison as well. I think you you made a great point. Unless a colleague goes absolutely bananas in the mid lane, Trine is looking kind of rough when you get to that late game team fight stage because what are they going to do? Wait there and AoE shield when they get engaged on? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all a very early game, like... I don't want to say solo queue comp, but it's just a comp where every individual champion requires such high econ to be able to be a useful champion that they're not going to work very well together in a competitive setting unless there really is that massive gold injection into every single champion. So the fact that they're going to have to put all their eggs into one basket in this type of team comp, and that's going to leave the rest of the team comp just lacking the damage that the champion really does require to be useful is going to make this team comp significantly weaker than, for example, in solo queue, where you really can take all the resources for yourself and just say, heck, your teammates, and be like, well, you guys picked Akali and Olaf, I'm the Caitlyn, I'm going to take all the resources, because that's what Caitlyn's really need to do, but at the same time, same exact scenario for an Akali or an Olaf. But we've talked so much about this trying team comp, we do have to look at the SAU team comp a little bit as well, I think their team comp is significantly different than the one that they had last game. So it's a very different um, flip on styles here uh, from SAU. They realized that game one, they were able to win early game, but past that, it was a very hard macro game from them. So mm -hmm. they've taken a strong pivot here, and I'm not entirely sure if I like their pivot fish. Yeah, their pivot is definitely... An interesting one. I'm with you on that. I think, as you mean, as you call, as you kind of, you know, trap me there a little bit. I wanted Prey to be on a carry, and unfortunately, yeah. he's on the Sejuani. And it, again, maybe that's to say, look, I mean, Shinig Shinigami, as we pointed out, had a really good game, made some fantastic mm -hmm. plays. As you pointed out, there were a couple fights where it's, where is the backup? Well, now you're going to have a front line in the Sejuani to help you out. So maybe that was the pivot. I do say, I think the one change is my favorite change. If you had asked me, what is one champion you want them to bring? Back, I think it's the Ash because I think Ash just has okay. so much game winning potential on an Ash all. Especially you hit an Akali, if she tries to flank, dead. It doesn't matter that Akali's gonna fall over Zonyas, it doesn't matter Twilight Shroud. You maybe try and find a way onto that. Caitlyn, you hit the Olaf. Yes, he has to burn the alt, but then it's back up, it's off cooldown in five seconds. So I think that Ash is the one that I like them bringing back. If Notebook can hit 40% this time, I think they have okay. a good chance of winning this game. 40% this time. That That is our barrier for winning the game yep. on Ash, and that honestly is very doable considering just the amount of arrows that you are able to shoot out in the span of one game. I also want to point out as well, if I'm just looking at these team comps and not at player OP.GG's, game one from SAU was very meta-focused. I think all five of those champions were probably like A tier, S tier, which makes me think maybe the players were less comfortable on those champions, and they were purely picking them for the meta purposes, which was still able to show a little bit. Like, you still saw how powerful these champions are in their own state. 
But the fact that the players were not able to pivot them to the same like meta standard that you would like to see from these really high power champions kind of shows that sometimes you do need to lead a little bit more into comfort and because most of these champions outside of the Ash support for SAU in game two are way lower, I would say, in the meta. Like, most of these champions, Vladimir, um, Sivir especially, like, these are B and even C tier type champions of, of Viego as well. I have not seen a Viego in a hot minute, but uh, junglers that play Viego to a really high level can make him look really broken, right? Because you can go invulnerable for, like, five seconds straight in a team fight if you can play with this passive correctly. So it really does come down to how well they're able to pivot these far less meta champions and the fact that they're picking them definitely makes me think that they are at least a little bit stronger in comfort for them here in game two and i did think the one thing outside the vladimir because again i thought that, you know, i mean as you put out the dragon beast hairless crab matchup was very meh i mean nothing happened <laughs> a lot of these champions are picked yeah. to do what they struggle with in game one what did prey struggle with getting burned down Sichuani's not going to get burned down what did uh wave crash struggle with Getting picked, you have now the sh the spell shield on Sivir, and you have a movement speed with your ultimate to get away. What did the Viego struggle with Shinigami? Going in and dying, as you pointed out. You start getting resets, you're invulnerable. So it really felt like, as you point out, let's pick less meta, but things that we struggled with. I will say, if you're talking about meta as an Akali main, I am required to say she is still the worst champion in the game by far. Every time I open up oh, any no. website, I'm like, ah, rank 57 of 57. Let's go. Let's get flamed. <laughs> Don't let her popularity in solo queue confuse you. So, uh, you know, I do have to mention that. As someone who has loved Akali since way before her rework, every time I open, like, hey, new pa- uh, my, my main still sucks. Okay. Akali is currently ranked 55 out of 59 on you. Let's <laughs> go! Just don't click on top lane. I, I'm pretty sure I checked the other day and it was 57 out of 57. It is 57 out of 57 <laughs> yes. on top lane, but... Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, maybe that's a flashy pick. I don't know. I'm... I don't like a call into Vladimir. I think Vladimir is one of the most, mm, yeah. in my opinion, it's just such a hard matchup because he heals. That's a big thing is going to be the healing, right? Akali, as you know, as the viewers know, as anyone who's played League of Legends knows, thrives when she could just burst you down. Vladimir is just going to say, oh, I'm low, pool. Oh, I'm low, empowered Q. It's going to be so hard for that Akali to find kills, I think. Yeah, and like I said earlier, Akali is one of those champions that just requires so much gold yep. to be able to be useful. And that is the main issue that I'm seeing with the Trident team comp. It's such a high econ um, type of team comp where they're expecting to win the early game as much as they did game one, if not even more, which wasn't even that much in mm -hmm. game one. They only came out on top about 2,000 gold at 20 minutes, and then they were able to eventually balloon that up to the five to 7,000 gold lead that they, that they had later in the game. But a 2,000 gold lead is not going to be enough here for trying. This type of team cup requires a gold lead at almost all stages of the game to be able to have the usefulness that you want from these very high econ champions. And... I mean, it's definitely possible. If you play to such a high level uh, compared to that of your opponents, then you can absolutely make it work. It's just going to rely so much on player skill here in the game number two as we are seeing draft again, which makes me nervous that we had to restart the draft. All the champions were correct the first time, but that is true. We're we do see draft again. We are improving. It does look like we might have had a uh, bug once we got past the draft. Just kind of checking in, so we oh. do apologize. But hopefully we'll be able to get in. Again, trying leading one nothing over St. Ambrose. Fisher Kampkov here in the Challengers Midwest Division. NECC kickoff for League of Legends. And, no, I think this is going to be a very interesting game because, as you pointed out, not only does Trine have to have the gold lead, but how did they get that gold lead in game one? It was it started with a great dragging timing where they caught the Shinigami on the other side of the map jungling. They pick up that first dragon. They get the second one as well because Kettle Whip was winning so hard. The third dragon took them two team fights, and they kind of won the second team fight because Prey kind of messed up the Narbar. They didn't win a dragon fight until the fourth dragon when they had that gold lead because of all the dragons. I assume, again, maybe you catch Shinigami on a weird jungle pathing in the first dragon. I don't think you're going to get a free 3-0 dragon start like you got in game one if you're trying. As you said, they've got to find other ways to win. And I think, you know, my first pick game one was, hey, Kettle Whip, stay alive. Now I think it's Kettle Whip's got to get multiple kills, right? He's got to get gold on that Olaf to do the same thing he did on Udyr, or this team might just kind of drown in their need for gold on every character as he pointed out now fish 
And we'll talk about predictions. We didn't get time to do predictions during game one, but I think we've got some more time here for game two here for predictions. You can go first. I'm, I'm giving giving you a little bit of time to think Ugh. here. Trine did win game one. So if you predict them game two to win, then we just got a 2-0 for Trine in week one. That's an excellent start to a season. But do we have a game three on our hands here, Fish? Oh, man, you, you put me on the spot making me pick I first, Cam Call. That is so brutal because everything I've said in our elongated draft preview, everything I look at with these heroes or with these champions tells me St. Ambrose should win this game. They have okay. the engage. They have everything else, but maybe I'm going to be blinded. But anytime I can see rank 55 and a 59 mid lane Akali in an NECC game, I got to go with my mate. So give me trying, give me hairless crab on like the 15 and three pop off Akali game. I don't I feel comfortable saying it, but I was completely wrong in game one on Kettle Whip. So I'll take trying here to pull off the sweep cam com. What do you got? What are you thinking? Hey, okay. You're, you're going with trying purely because of Akali. Um, yes. And Kettle Whip. I got to support my man okay, Kettle okay, Whip. Okay. I, I was That's completely fair. wrong on him. I, so now, you know what? I'm all in on the Kettle Whip boat. I think he's going <laughs> to pop off too. You were Kettle Whip down or game one. Now you're Kettle Whip believer game yes. two. Yes. I, I think I'm a believer in a game three here, Fish. I think SAU is going to be able to come up on top because of the better synergy between their champions. Even if their champions are going to be harder to pilot in terms of their current strength in the meta, I think uh their able their ability to pilot together just synergistically wise if that's a word i might have made that word up right now if not then i <laughs> definitely did not just make up that word i'm going to be very confident that that's a real word um, <laughs> i think sau's comp is going to be able to come together a little bit easier i still think trine's comp can come together it's just going to be that much harder of a bar to be able to meet to meet the same level that SCU can meet with a little bit less, uh, or a little bit more roof error even, as we do get to move on to Summoner's Rift now after only two drafts, Fish. It was not four. Only, hey, we're improving. We're in improving here in week <laughs> one of the NECC. Of course, it's not our fault, right? As Camcom pointed out at the start of our broad portion of the broadcast, has had some issues with this most recent patch. I will say, I think the one thing for trying is if that karma is a Seraphine, I think this comp feels so much better. Yes. Right? I think if you have the Encore, you have the ability to have some engage, this comp just feels so much better than it, the Karma. And I mean, looking at it, I don't see a Seraphine ban. Maybe they just didn't like... I'm not really sure what they didn't like because the Ash was the old, the Ash Sivir was given away. Maybe they didn't like it into Sivir. But if that Karma was a Seraphine, I think I would have been a lot more confident in Shrine. But hey, it's Ocean Dragon, potentially, allegedly, maybe. We don't know because it could be the other two uh, Chemtech or uh, Hextech Dragons as well. But if it's Ocean Dragon, maybe it's a maybe repeat it's of Game 1. Yeah, it's Ocean. Okay, it is. We do have the cop. Hey, so it was Ocean Game 1. Try and dominate it. Maybe it's Ocean Game okay. 2. Try and dominate it. I'm looking for... I'm trying to make my pick feel good, Camcom. Don't all judge right, me. All right, all right, all right. Aw, you, you're very trying favorite. So I'm going to be very uh, St. Ambrose favorite here. Ocean Dragon, to start the game off, on a Vladimir in your mid lane, this is going to be my, my main point here to start the game off. Dragon Beast is expecting to come out on top in this laning phase based on the fact that he took the Ghost as well as the Dark Skill for the first item. So if they do get this first Ocean Dragon as well, particularly before like the 7 or 8 minute mark, I think Dragon Beast can probably get a solo kill, if not just deny Hairless Crab any possible solo kills, which might even be better for him on the Vladimir here is a little bit of a 2v2 here on the bot lane. Ooh. That's a lot of damage. Oh, they flash Ignite on the Notebook. One more auto attack and Polyps does it on the Caitlyn. Can he find a kill on the wave check? Oh he gosh. cannot, but Magic Griffin can. And who had Caitlyn Karma first blooding at level one in their uh, bingo board? Because I don't think many people did. Nope, I'm gonna tell you right now, I absolutely did not as every single summoner was burned between the two supports, but surprisingly, the only time to burn between the two 80 carries is Wallop's Flash. And that's about as perfect as a level of scenario as you can get for a Caitlyn Karma. You have to dominate this lane as a Caitlyn Karma to be able to do the damage that you really need later on in this game. And coming out 101 or 101 and 101 together is the best case scenario, level one. 
Yeah, not to mention First Blood did go over to Polyp, so that Caitlyn does get a little bit of extra gold as well. As you said, this is a very gold-hungry team for Trine, and at least one of them being fed early on here, 101 as you said, but the rest of the map, Kettle Whip is being that aggressor, does have to be careful if Olaf does burn through mana very quickly. As Prey going to go back in and Kettle Whip has to be careful. W is on cooldown, so you do not have much lifesteal available to you. But if that W comes back up, there'll be a ton. It's a sure can flip. Going to go in from Hairless Crab. The pool will come up from Dragon Beast. And there is that Vladimir ability to sustain through the Akali damage. And the Powered Q has to go onto a minion, so it doesn't get as much healing. But still something that Hairless Crab has to be careful of. It should have got me hovering, but I don't think he's going to do much more than looks like throw a ward down. And, uh... Take a, take a crab and maybe walk away. We'll see. I don't think he's walking away here, Fish. I I think oh. Shadam is looking for a gank here in the mid lane, and Hairless Crab playing right into the weakness. Oh, the early Twilight Shroud. No punish from St. Ambrose. I thought that was going to be a lot more. I thought Flash for sure for Hairless Crab, but instead able to get out, as you said, playing right into that gank. But nothing will come of it. We did see an early back from Kettle Whip. He was forced to blow the teleport while Prey, with that way pushing... Able to get it back as well, pick up a coal and not blow that teleport. So now Prey has a decent advantage, though. Wave check taking a ton, has to flash away to avoid getting rooted. Notebook now going to take a little bit of damage and polyps and, polyps and magic griffin pushing this early advantage on the bot side, blowing a flash away from wave check. One more summoner burned here on the bot lane. That heal is going to come up here in a couple of seconds for notebook, which gives them a little bit of safety. Definitely no kill pressure, though, but like you said, up on the top side, Kettle Whip burning that TP. Last game, we saw him having excellent uh, wave management in the first couple of levels. We've seen very similar so far in this game, too. You see him stacking a massive wave. This would be a perfect dive angle if Project Chrono was just a little bit closer to the top side. And if they denied this huge wave to Prey, it pretty much puts him out of the game until maybe level 7, level 8. But it does look like Prey will be able to catch the majority of that wave. Ooh. But it, it just imagine, if all that XK was denied to Prey, Kettle Whip would have just won the laning phase off of that. Oh, Prey went forward and dies. Kettle Whip going to hit six. Ragnarok oh, going to be no. pumped. Oh, I thought that was an easy kill. Instead, Kettle Whip turns it on him. It's a double kill for the Olaf. As we do see, Hairless Crab going to go in. And all of these lanes that we talked about that need this gold infusion are getting him. His wave check is going to be rooted. Trap going to be eaten, though, by Notebook. A great job by the support denying that bonus damage as the Ignite went down. That empowered auto attack from the trap might have killed wave check. So a great job by Notebook eating it for their AD carry and keeping them alive just barely on this bottom side. I didn't even know that was possible. As a support main notebook there, uh, you just impressed me very much. I did not know you could eat a paint loot trap for your ADC here. As the dragon is started up by Trine, they have a pretty massive lead, but this is still a terrifying team fight to take. Shinigami is going to throw out the shroud. He's going to have his availability. Hairless Crab going to rotate down. Does have level 6. And this R1, if it lands on a notebook, might be a guaranteed kill. The level 3 Ash, they're going to jump in on a Magic Griffin. There goes Hairless Crab, looking for a kill on a notebook. Going to find it. Wave check coming down. You've got to be careful, Wave check. There's an Akali right in your face. Rook going to land in the Twilight Shroud. But the Akali is invisible. Double, Double kill for Akali. And it ends up being a two for one trade. His Magic Griffin did go down, but he already respawned. And 2-0, and 2-0, oh, oh, and 1-0, oh, and 2. I think that might fit the book early on, Camcom, for... Oh! Headshot. <laughs> All right, well, everyone who needed gold now has at least two kills. That's exactly what you wanted if you were trying. Wow. I mean, trying, they they picked very econ-heavy champions, and like you said, this econ has been turned into nothing but trying so far. It turned out as a three-for-one overall kill trade in the favor of trying, but more importantly, I would say... They did pick up that Ocean Dragon as well, and so far it looks like we have exactly matched the Dragon Order. I think it, it, it's either a Hextech or a Chemtech. I'm going to 50% chance say it's a Hextech, which would mean it is the same exact order as we had in Game 1, but it's three 150 shutdowns at 7 minutes as a possibility for St. Ambrose to pick up. I'm going to say could still put some of their members back in this game here. I think the one, other, the one big thing for St. Ambrose that is really going against them is Wave Check, who was so oh, phenomenal. It, who was so phenomenal. I think it was Chemtech last time, wasn't it? I think this I is remember. the same Dragons. Okay. 
I think. Maybe we're crazy. It, it's it's close enough. They both have tech in the name if I'm wrong, so we'll say it's the same. But the one thing that I was going to point out is Wave Check, right? He was popping off game one. He only has 32 CS right now. So not only is he behind in kills, he's behind a lot in CS. I mean, there's already a Mythic item done for Polyps. Mythic item done at eight minutes is very impressive, man. But Gale Force being one of the most expensive items in the game as well to build first. Hairless Crab might just be dead here in the mid. No flash on the Akali. We see the, uh, the problem, and there is that first. 150 gold shutdown that you talked about, Camcom. Hang handed over to Shinigami. Two and two on this Viego. Kind of the only one with kill. And we saw this game is a lot like game one, right? Similar dragons, yes. similar start. One player on St. Ambrose picking up all the kills. This time it's Shinigami. So St. Ambrose needs to change something because we saw how game one ended. It does look like what they want to change here is potentially some. Uh, Four man dives on the bot lane. I see Prey walking in the bot lane right now, and because of this, he is giving this entire top lane turret. Possibly he thinks this turret is gone whether he's here or not, which I do tend to agree with, which means they are forcing this play very heavily on the bot lane, and I don't know if they want that. They do get a great Gracial Pism. They first pull ups to blow the cleanse early, tries to flash away. Shinigami going to get the kill, should get the reset if he needs it. And unfortunately, Notebook will live with just a sliver of HP. They baited them perfectly. They blew their engage. And then they had no counter. So the four-man dive works out, as you said. They do trade, I think, at least three plates solo on to Olaf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One kill, entire turret on to Olaf. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty close. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> kind of went just completely unlocked this top side of the map now. Like... They already caught. They already claimed the first rift shield, and the second rift shield is pretty much as good as theirs from this point in the game. And this entire top side jungle is pretty much Project Chronos now as well. Looking for his first gank here in the mid lane, of course, is a Vladimir. So I do expect Dragon Beast to be perfectly safe. But like you said on that first 150 shutdown, there is now two 150 shutdowns claimed, both by Shinigami as well. So. Shinigami kind of forcing himself into the carry position for SAU. I don't think that the Viego from draft phase was really the one position to be the carry uh, role. I think that was probably on the Dragon Beast head, but you know what? You got 100% of the kills right now, Shinigami, so you're kind of forced to be the carry from this point on. At this point, St. Ambrose will take anybody who could be the carry after the way this game started, where they were just falling all over the map. This notebook takes a huge chunk as well. And I will say the Viego... If his teammates can at least damage them low enough in team fights, he can kind of start that Viego meme train of just resetting over and over, becoming invulnerable, getting a little bit of healing. So, not the worst case for St. Ambrose, but yeah, as you said, I think it was probably Vladimir a bit pretty fed. I think they probably expected Prey and Shinigami to kind of have some duo synergy on the top side of the map. But unfortunately for St. Ambrose, Game 2 has not been a great one as the second dragon will spawn here. We do see Shinigami already down there, but... Kettle Whip is just kind of pushing, and he's maybe looking at like a 12, 13 minute tier 2 top tower. Because there's nobody close by. Instead, it looks like he'll just blast the mini waves in and try and rotate down. Is Oh no, Project Chrono gonna just get caught out in his own jungle. That's a huge pickup for who else but Shinigami in St. Ambrose. <laughs> of course, it's Shinigami. Shinigami's slipping up every single kill right now for St. Ambrose. Now I'm gonna be able to convert that third kill, or even the fourth kill, sorry, of his in the first dragon for St. Ambrose. This is the first dragon for them across both games, and Chemtech nonetheless as well as, once again, we get a Infernal Soul yet again fish to nobody's surprise. It is the same exact dragons in the same exact order as game number one. That was some very illegal damage I just saw. I don't want to see that again on my screen, please, but wow, notebook end. Even through heal, by the way. He actually used heal from that. He what used, just happened? He used heal and his health part just still went down. And we do see Glacial Pressure going to be traded out there for Ragnarok. So both top laners blowing their ultimates. And really not much coming of it from either side. We do see Shinigami coming down. Prey coming down as well. Though he does not have the Glacial Prison. He does walk over a ward. Project Chrono is coming down. There's that Ash Arrow. It will be Krenz. Blowlift trying to get away, but he will get stunned. Project Chrono trying to get in range. Even throws down the pillar, but it's not enough. Now Kettle Whip is here. 
and trying to jump onto Shinigami. He's going to get outrange of the root. Uses ultimate to create some face as well. And it looks like it will be just another St. Ambrose pickup onto that Caitlyn and will walk away. I don't know what did TP down for this play. I, I think I would have actually preferred him to not TP and stay split pushing on the top side. Just imagine if Kettle Whip was currently hitting at that inner turret for the duration of that entire team fight. That turret would just be gone at this point, if not just an even bigger lead for Kettle Whip. They are the same level right now between Kettle Whip and Prey, but I definitely think in the next couple moves, probably about 15 minutes into this game, I think Kettle Whip will have one, if not two levels over Prey for the rest of this game, just because Prey has constantly been roaming around this map. He knows that he is not going to be able to match Kettle Whip pretty much for the entire rest of this game, so he's forced to play a very much supportive and utility tank style, which is not really what you want from a Sejuani. Of course, Sejuani is a very heavy utility type champion, but you don't want to give this entire top lane for free over to a no love either. Yeah, I think the... Uh, the... The top lane draft strategies for St. Ambrose have definitely gone awry both times. And I'm with you because not only could you imagine if the Olaf was hitting the tower, but now he won't have his unleashed teleport for the next major objective unless he walks down. So now he loses even more split point potential. Because remember, he had a teleport to a tower for that fight. So I definitely think yeah. that was the first major error I think we've seen in that series, this whole series from Kettle Whip. And we'll see if it comes back to bite him. Because like you said, he could easily have tier two as wave check. Great use of the spell shield. Ace in the hole is going to be blocked by Shinigami. Headless Crab going to use that R2 on the perfect execution. His Magic Griffin will pick up one. Notebook is going to be rooted. That's a free double kill wow. over to Karma. And that's exactly what Tri needed there to kind of turn things around. It starts with the Akali. It ends with the bot lane. And Karma will take credit for both. And just like that, Magic Griffin now has the most kills on the team. And a 300 shutdown on his head. I definitely think that first kill... Oh, should have gone over to Magic Griffin, but he deserved that second kill, but he had it what it was coming as, yeah, a 400 or 300 now shut down on his head is definitely not what you want on a very easy to kill target such as Karma. Luckily, it's only gifted over to Prey for trying probably the best case scenario as a member to gift it over as I thought Hairless Crab was not going to commit to this and I was very wrong. That is the Akali play style, live by the Akali, die by the Akali as Hairless Crab. Gonna eat the tower. It's not he... an execute. Yeah, unfortunately. It's not an execute. One, I think, was hoping the tower would do a little bit more damage to prevent Shinigami from getting what now is his sixth kill of the game. Meanwhile, mid lane, Rift Herald does get a great charge onto that mid tower. There is the Ash Arrow gonna be traded out for the Ragnarok, but they still gotta run. Turn around, Axe Toss to slow them down, but I don't think Kettle Whip's gonna get away. That is another massive shutdown, this time on to Wave Check. He's back in the game. It's his first kill, but that is a ton of gold. And now all of those shutdowns have been handed over to St. Ambrose. Every single shutdown picked up almost in a row for St. Ambrose. It says 4,000 gold right now for trying, but I definitely think once St. Ambrose recalls and spends their well-earned gold, which they are doing now, I think this gold lead may shrink a little bit. Now we have 40 seconds remaining on this next dragon. This dragon is not going to be a very deciding factor. I would like to see probably St. Ambrose give this dragon and decide to fight the next dragon. As this dragon, uh, I don't want to say the word useless, but uh, when both teams are one and one in dragons and you're trying to take a team fight when you're down 5,000 gold for a pretty useless dragon, I definitely think will be very detrimental for St. Ambrose. So please do not fight this dragon. Well, fight to... the next one. I think the only the only way I'll disagree with you, Cam, comes I think you have Notebook fire off an Ash Arrow, and if you hit a primary target, I think you go in, as they are going to land Glacial Prism, the Ash Arrow will miss, and that'll be maybe the difference. Oh, Project Chrono tried right. with the pillar, and now all of a sudden they say, hey, you know what? We'll take this useless dragon for ourselves to get a jungle pick, and it's the freest dragon in the world. I mean, you know what? You said land an Asher. They didn't land the Asher, but they did land the Glacial Fisher instead, and that is absolutely enough to turn right back on the heel and be like, you know what? We pick the jungler, we will end up taking the dragon anyway for ourselves. Now, like I said, this dragon is not going to be very deciding really for either team. I definitely think the next dragon here will be massively deciding. So the fact that uh, Trine pretty much gave that dragon for free outside of the one death from Project Chrono and instead trading that for that top inner turret. I think 
can be seen as an even trade, depending on how well they're able to play off that top lane pressure that Kettle Whip just made. And I think we're starting to see the cracks in the armor that we kind of saw from trying in this draft, right? They don't have a go button it's all reactionary it's all okay we bait out the glacial prism we great we bait out the ash arrow now we can go in and unfortunately prey is having great success with these glacial prisons the ash arrows that 40 percent mark i thrown out i think we're a bit shy if you did the math but the key ones are landing like we saw on that kettle whip a couple fights ago even though he popped the ragnarok that half second delay was enough to kill him and this is where Trine either needs Hairless Crab to start popping off, needs Kettle Whip to start pushing because they're running out of pressure because they don't have a response in team fights besides hoping they don't die and hoping St. Ambrose misses. <laughs> just hope they miss and then win the game. It's, it's just that easy, but yeah, you know what? If Dash Arrow misses, it's a crucial uh, cooldown for about 20 seconds. Uh, Notebook still sitting level 8. Once he does hit that level 11 power spike, will be at about the 30 to 40 second cooldown on his R, I think is what happens there, and then it hits the Once he hits level 16, but I don't expect him to be hitting level 16 this game, I definitely think. This game will be over at about the fifth little dragon, is my prediction here, Fish. Well, we've got a couple more dragons left before, uh... Camcom has called our game will end. We'll see whether or not you're correct. I think a lot of it uh, kind of hinges on what Kettle Whip does, right? He's been a while since he's been up yeah. on the top side of this map. Finally going back up there, I think he has to play very smart because last game, I don't think he was too scared of wave check when he was the Fed member. Now that it's a 7 and 2 Viego, you have to make sure you're warding because if you split push and you run into Viego, I don't think you're winning that 1v1 at all if you are Kettle Whip. And I think that's just made, that's, they kind of feel like the major difference. It feels like even though the gold's all on one character, just like we saw in game one for St. Ambrose, it's on a character that we know is going to be in every fight and we know is going to be in melee range of every fight. Absolutely. And Shinigami now sitting seven and two, two items at. 20 minutes significantly head ahead of the rest of his team and most of the team as well for trying. I think the only team members on the map that are more ahead than Shinigami are probably both Kettle Whip and Polyps. Both of them sitting also two items a piece here for now. I would definitely like to see Notebook picking up his first item here in the next minutes before this next dragon fight. I think being behind on an action point is not. The worst thing in the world because of how poor your own pool that is, but uh -oh. I'll hold that thought. Project Krona this time does survive the Glacial Prison, and now this is where you kind of got to fight if you're trying. Yes, as you pointed out, Camp Cop, we've got maybe about 20 seconds before the Ash Arrow comes up, but there's no Glacial Prison available. There's no such, or there's no Sivir Ult available for them to either get in or get out. This is where you've got to make a play if you're trying Farming up waves, I don't think is the right one. You've got to find a pick somewhere on this map in this window with Glacial Prison being on cooldown. Lots of good damage there from Magic Griffin as I can no longer see the game. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, League of Legends. Uh, as of right now, though, Trine has excellent cryo across this entire bot side of the map. You just see how much pressure they have around this blue, uh, red side blue jungle. It's I'm gonna say that one. It's really, SAU cannot walk into the jungle whatsoever, fully having blindfolds on their face on the bot side. But Offset is very well illuminated for SAU. Wave check, though, not on the top side. Will be forced to burn the flash and the ghost. 30 seconds worth this dragon. These are both huge summoners to get out of the way. There's no flash on Notebook either, but at this point, not to be mean to Notebook, but I think everyone knows on the support Ash, your role is basically a cannon minion that can fire off. Uh, Stunning projectiles every 30 seconds. <laughs> they are very scary stunning projectiles. We can also throw out um, vision projectiles as well as interesting macro decision here from the SAU. It looks like they don't want this dragon at all. They instead want to force a fight around this Baron, but try is here to stop them in their tracks. Shinigami, oh no, he bit off way more than he can chew. That's a huge shutdown, and I don't think Kettle Whip's gonna stop anytime soon. Notebook, the cannon minion, trying to buy some time for the squad. And he'll do just that. Oh, that was a risky back attempt there, Prey. Unfortunately, the axe misses. Uh, maybe a little bit too 
uh, confident. We are going to see the whole time Project Chrono going to pick up this dragon. Hairless Crab will attempt to push a tower. Kali not known for her tower killing ability, so that one will die very slowly. And actually won't even die at all, and we'll wait for another minion wave. But I think that's exactly what Trine wanted. They call out, as you pointed out, a very interesting decision on St. Ambrose to go for the Baron and not try and put themselves on Infernal Soul Point. And instead just simply say, we'll take a kill at Baron, we'll take the Dragon, and... Well, they didn't get the Tower because, unfortunately, again, Akali and Towers are just... They're not a good combination. He doesn't kill them very fast. Yeah, it's very slow slip pushing there from Hairless Crab. Just imagine if it was Hairless Crab in that team fight and Kettle Whip on the bot lane. You probably would have been on knocking on the doors of that inhibitor during the time of the Baron chase. But instead, we start to see a very similar path that we saw in game one here for Tryon. They come out a little bit ahead, just enough ahead in the early game to have an easy transition into the mid game. And now sitting at a... Ooh, 6,000? Yeah, I'm gonna say 6,000 gold lead here at the 24 minute mark for trying, just slowly incrementing more and more in their favor. Yes, the dragons are even out instead of it being a 4 0 lead for them, but I think these upcoming team fights are going to be significantly in their favor because they could almost just start smacking SAU around with their wallets. We're very near to that point now where. It doesn't even matter if you have a person advantage, the gold advantage will start being too overwhelming for SAU to try and fight for. I think this next dragon, the soul point, coming out for both teams here in three and a half minutes. This is going to be the true deciding team fight. As I said, that last team fight, that didn't really happen. That dragon was going to be pretty important, but this next dragon and every dragon thereafter is going to be more and more important. And just deciding who is going to come out on top in this game two of season fish. Great job by our production, as you said. Trying to kind of start slapping them with their wallets. It's a 3,000 gold lead for Kettle Whip over Prey. It's about 2,000 in that 80 carry roll for Polyps over Wave Check. But I will say Shinigami, again, he has about a 2,000 gold lead as well. So I would say that's the one major difference for this game. As much as we've been yeah. kind of harping on Kettle Whip of, hey, look, you need a push, you need a push. I think Olaf is just a lot better team fighting champion. Ooh, that arrow does miss. And so he's saying, I've got to be in these team fights as Olaf. I can do a lot more damage than I can on the Udyr. So he's kind of having to pull back the pushing. And I, I think he's done really a great job of, of playing this role. Is now, Airless Crab, this is not a spot you want to be. He'll check with the Shuriken Toss. Glacial Prison is going oh, to go no. out. It is going to land onto Magic Griffin. They are going to pop the ult to get the shields and that movement speed. And it looks like that'll just simply be actually That was the Shirelius. That was not the Mantra Shield for the movement speed. Excuse me. And so that just means... They'll, eat, they'll trade that any day of the week. Glacial Prison for a Shirelius? That's a fun trade. Is now Dragon Beast got to run away. The, the Ragnarok being blown is a little head-scratching. Yeah, maybe a little bit overkill there from Kettle Whip, but uh, he was probably assuming Dragon Beast didn't have the pull off of cooldown. This is a very scary position angle here for trying. I think they're trying to do the 1-3-1, oh. but the wings are just not in sync. They do get the cleanse, unfortunately, play. He does not have the Glacial Prison. He does get a root down. Shinigami going to pick up one. Here comes the TP from Kettle Whip. He does not have the Ragnarok. Remember, Magic Griffin dropping incredibly low. He will be picked off as well. Dragon Beast going to brought the pool. You do see Hairless Crab at the top side of your screen. Are the health bars low enough for the Akali? The answer appears to be no outside of Prey as he will fall. Does pick up one to at least kind of slow down the bleeding, but a fantastic job. They get the stun on the Polyps, and they just finish off Magic Griffin in a iffy TP, unfortunately, for Keta Whip. Kind of really didn't put him in a good position either. Yeah, I really liked the idea and the intent that Trine had in the 1 3 1 there, but the execution was just a little bit too, uh, too low for SAU to be able to just come out on top in that fight. Three for one for SAU. It is still about a five to 6,000 gold lead for Tryon. So the gold lead still remains the same. The objectives all remain the same there as well. So in the grand scheme of things, the team fight will not greatly affect the state of the game, just outside of a couple of shutdowns being picked up as Tryon, they realize that the one three one is not going to work. So as long as they don't try it again, or at least only go for one or four ones from now on, I think the macro will still be mostly in their favor. Dragon coming up in 20 seconds might be seeing a similar play that SEU did last time, but this time trying, ignoring the dragon going straight for the Baron SEU do have vision on this. 
Yeah, this is a good call for Trine and including the call to pull back. Because the one big difference, especially because they won that fight, heading into this dragon, there's only one flash available for Trine. It is unfortunately on Magic Griffin. You look at St. Ambrose, they have flash on everybody but Prey, and he has a dash. I think Trine realizes we cannot fight, especially defensively, like our team comp is kind of drafted around without our flashes. Let's try and trade Baron for a dragon. That is the call. Prey is roaming over. We are going to see Dragon Beast was there as well. The dragon will fall, and it looks like Trine will simply realize they do not have the damage. And they're going to have to back off and probably, I think, just hand over this Tier 1 mid-tower. I do not think this late in the game, especially with the Demolish, you can afford to defend it. And the Glacial Prison missing means that St. Ambrose won't get much more than that. I don't like this. Uh, one three one again. I, I'm trying to tell them nicely. Please stop doing this one three one. It is not working out for trying to say you know exactly how to combat this one three one, and it is just send all five members mid and just end up collapsing on the mid laners. And if the side laners don't continue pushing, which in that last play they really didn't. I think they yeah they both TP back to the mid lane to help them. It does just turn it on top for SAU every single time as one tower has been traded. Each way now in the mid lane. The side laners, though, are still trying to get their waves synced up. These waves being synced are so crucial in the 1-3-1 one, one, actually being able to work here for trying. If they do sync up these waves, then I will stop telling them not to 1-3-1. One, one. <laughs> I think the other big problem with the 1-3-1 one, one is the your laners on either side don't command the same respect. I think Kettle Whip, they understand probably will take one or two members i actually would be very curious how the shinigami versus kettle with 1v1 would go but i think hairless crab is easily answered and akali does not have the greatest wave push unfortunately so it's just kind of leaving them in this weird state where they can kind of just leave akali on her own they send prey down he clears out a wave and it takes the akali another 30 40 seconds to clear these minions and this is kind of where that Akali weakness that we look, talk about in the draft is coming up. You're 3-3-2. Three, three, and two. You're working on your third item. I'd say, looking at the items, you're maybe a little behind Dragon Beast, especially since he has his Rabidon stun. There's just nothing... For, this Akali just doesn't fit in this comp, and it's becoming, unfortunately, more and more glaringly <laughs> obvious as this game goes on. Baron has been started up once again by Try, and I can only assume SAU knows that they're on the Baron, but they don't appear to be playing like they know. Shinigami just simply has to ult in and smite steal it away, but it looks like they're just gonna take the safe route and completely disengage Shirelius is popped for I don't know what reason, but you know what? Shirelius was popped for disengage potentially is what I'm gonna go with there. And uh the train was kind of dragon for Baron, even if it was a very delayed Baron in the end. Now, I definitely think Trine is in an excellent position to make use of this Baron. Now the 131, but especially the 41, I would say, can really break this inhibitor line really well in both the mid and the top lane. Kettle Whip has constantly been putting so much pressure on this top lane, and now with the added bonus of Baron minions, I definitely think this inhibitor turret could be going down, if not on this wave, then the next cannon wave after this one, but they just have to not lose this team fight in mid lane at the same time as kind of what this was pushing. Well, the good news is we saw the Ash Arrow go a bit wide. Praise Glacial Prism is on cooldown as well, so they do survive that mid lane fight, as you pointed out. And I do think the other big thing is Baron Batakali now feels a little bit better split pushing. You have a little bit more help from yes. your minions. This, as you said, makes the 1v1 feel so much stronger, and now no Glacial Prison, it's about 50% off cooldown. You will have an Ash Arrow here in about 10 seconds, but you can't send more than one person to stop Kettle Whip or you lose mid. You can't leave the Akali alone anymore or you're going to lose bot lane. This is now a very good spot for Try, and that Dragon for Baron pays off in a huge way. Is Prey gonna jump on to Hairless Crab? He's going to land that stun, but Twilight Shroud will simply create some space and Polyps will just push in the mid lane, and this is exactly what Trine wanted. Oh! Whoa. This should be a kill. Yeah, wow. They'll take that. That's a huge pick. He will down here bot lane. <laughs> Ash Arrow does land onto the Akali, so that should be enough to help disengage. I want to see Polyps run top. 
help out Kettle Whip against this Vladimir. Instead, he's just simply going to get the mid tower and not pick up the mid inhibitor, unfortunately. And now Dragon Beast looking for the collapse, gonna blow the ghost. Knight of Caliber net away. There is the flash plus the, the Hemo Plague. The Rocket Belt misses, unfortunately, so Polyps gets away, and now you lose the top tower. Great play by Trident, and now, unfortunately, your Vladimir's out of cooldowns. You can see he's going to blow the pool, but I think he's dead as soon as this Falls Ghost is going to be popped. The Ragnarok going to be used as well here, but he gets baited by the Stopwatch. But all the meanwhile, bot lane has fallen. Finally, the first inhibitor gets taken down, and St. Ambrose is just fighting in too many places. The Ash Arrow does go out. There's no Ragnarok here for Kettle Whip, so he should potentially be able to be picked up. But now, oh, wow, There's two more <laughs> Low health Olaf is everyone's nightmare, but wave check does pick up a huge kill! Trying now, trying to collapse this fight has gone absolutely bananas as wave check and prey are on the somehow trying is in the middle of five players. I don't quite understand how that happened, but in the end they pick up two, but they will lose every inhibitor for it. And that's a huge, I think, win overall for Try. Alright, Fish. Um... <laughs> yeah, good luck, Color. Break that one down for me, because I got very lost how we had a trine sandwich there at some point. Um, yeah, you know what they... I What I'm gonna say for that one is, SAU, they were very much... I, I think that was a symptom of one person calling out one target, and then all five members targeting that one target, and just ignoring it completely three members on Trine. Those three members were the actual important ones. They took all three inhibitors plus one Nexus turret plus now a dragon for Trine here as well. And I think should be, yeah, full disengage from Trine. They still have not recalled from taking those three dragons. So could have been a very detrimental team fight if they decided to take it there. So I definitely appreciate them taking the full reset now. And the pretty massive now 9,000 gold lead for Trine is about to get even larger once all the recalls come through. And yeah, Nearly a full build on many members here for trying only one Nexus turret standing here as well from SAU and they had good communication in that last team fight. It was just the communication was targeting the wrong group of people. They were targeting the people on the top lane when the people in the bot lane had the larger numbers, they have extra damage because it was three versus two members and that's that's gonna be my end of break it down ish. Is three versus two should have targeted the three members. I will say, I think the other thing Camp Copy can take credit for is that felt like the fight where Trine and just slapped him with their wallets, right? I mean, yes. this game has been so back and forth, we forget it's been like a 6 7k gold lead for a while as that Ash Arrow just barely graces past Magic Griffin. That felt like the wallet fight. They just kind of slapped him around. I think, as you, you were right, the target calling was a little bit whack, but. It just simply came down to, we have more stats and more levels than you do on your team, and we're going to win. We do see a Glacial Prison bottom of our screen on Whoa. a Fearless Crab. It's right below the scoreboard, as we do see the Akali tries to R2 away with the perfect execution, but cannot get it. Unfortunately, for St. Ambrose, their Nexus is nearly exposed. This is going to be a tough one here. What is Trine want to do? You can lose the game if you mess this up. They're going to expose the Nexus. Project Chrono is going to say, I will not target anything but, and they simply do not have the damage to kill the Trundle. Trine will take it home. They go up one nothing. I will personally brag that I go up one nothing on Camcom in our All caster right. predictions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't. That game felt so weird to me, Camp Cop, because it never yes. felt like Trine was winning by 7,000 gold. And I checked the scoreboard, and it was 7,000 gold. I don't know how they yeah. built that gold lead, but they, they kept it. It was weird. It was very near a 10,000 gold lead for many parts of that game, Fish. And that was all a symptom of the draft that they picked themselves, right? We kept talking about how high econ this draft is, how much gold you have to have to make this draft work. And the fact that they were at a 6,000 gold lead and still having even team fights does show that this draft is just a very hard draft to execute. And try and still were able to come out on top because of that. I think SAU played that game really, really well. Even, like you say, despite having 6,000 gold deficit, they were even on Dragons. In fact, actually, I think they were ahead on Dragons, 3-2, to two, or maybe 3-3 to three at the end of the game there. And, uh... These teams look very strong for their division. They're definitely going to be on the top of the table for the challengers. I'm going to remind myself, Midwest here for them. <laughs> yeah, I will say the one thing, and I hate to crush on my girl, but if that was anything but an Akali, I, I think that Trine probably wins that a lot quicker. That Akali just kind of felt like a fish out of water there where there were fights where I'm like, yeah. 
this assassin is not assassinating anything. It's just become an in because there is nothing. There's no assassin part of it. So I will say, I think the Akali didn't work. I like Hairless Crab trying it because, again, he looks like a mage player from what I can see. So you put that out for everyone else, right? Because up until this point, there's not been scouting. And if you're the team that gets picked to stream, there's more information on you than anybody else. So I do like Hairless Crab picking it, but unfortunately... I don't think it was great, but hey, my colleague got a win, so put one yes. in the book for the good guys, I guess. Again, as you said, I think St. Ambrose and Trine will probably be at the top of Challengers Midwest. Well, that will do it for you, Camcom. I will be coming back for our next yes. match alongside Sof Chan. It is Challengers Pacific Frontier, Montana Maroon taking on Nebraska mm -hmm. Omaha, so you do not want to go anywhere. Thank you, Camcom, and we'll be back with another NECC League of Legends Week 1 match right after this. Every time you hold 
Pushing my limits and all the trouble that I have while well, I'm going the distance with you. I didn't know what I had till I knew what was missing and everything. The seasons come and go like thoughts of you Like a wave returns to the sea into the blue They change but in a cycle that I can't lose Each painful but delightful to live through Just like 
good enough season Not for long, just a time Just a good enough season Maybe this time next year you'll reappear For no reason But I'll cherish every day Until you come my way this season Turn and change just like your mind Like the sun gives in to the moon Into the night Time continues marching It slowly crawls With each new one starting I recall You came into my life Just like Good enough season, not for long, just a time, just like good enough season. Maybe this time next year you'll reappear for no reason, but I'll cherish every day until you come my way this season. Welcome back in here to the NECC. It is week one. It is our final match of the night here on the mainstream fish and show channel. About ready to call a Challengers Pacific Frontier showdown between University of Montana Maroon and the University of Nebraska Omaha Black. Just looks like we're finishing up the pro draft, so we should be ready to hop in. And so, what are you expecting here? It's week one. There's some nerves. We've got some massive rosters here as well. Shout out Nebraska Omaha for finding four separate players who are willing to play the bot lane role and just clearly do not enjoy having fun in League of Legends. <laughs> well, firstly, Fish, I'm so happy to be here once again with you. Uh, do iconic caster <laughs> partnership that we have here for NECC. Yes. Starting off, of course, and finishing off the night for League of Legends. I think there's nothing else that I expect in the bot lane aside from a Caitlyn being picked or banned. So I think that's going to be very present in Ash as well. I think we had as a support role in the previous match, you cast it with Chemcom as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be something present in our games. Is there anything even different, more meta breaking that you might expect? Maybe not the Akali on that comp again. <laughs> oh man, I'd love to say we would see Akali pick ban, but it has been <laughs> eons since Akali was in that point. No, I think you're right. I think the Ash is something that just, Really, for like the last six months, maybe even a year, it felt like it's just such a strong support champion. I mean, as it said, you kind of boil down to a minion that just fires off alt stuns, fires off kind of floating wards, if you will. It's just such a strong character. <laughs> I would not be shocked if we see it brought out. I think the one thing is going to be, you know, kind of, I, I, I was completely wrong in my last series. You know, as casters, sometimes all we have is the OPGG. It kind of lied to me. I thought we were having a massive rank discrepancy in the top lane. I thought one player was going to dominate, and it turned out the low rank player absolutely popped off. So I'm really curious to see if there's anybody on one of these teams between University of Montana Maroon, University of Nebraska Omaha Black, who maybe the rank doesn't line up with who with how well they play. But we'll have to see as we do get our lineups here, starting with University of Montana Maroon. Here we've got Babushka, Replay DK, TTC, Hyde, and Niyu. Of course, do love the synergy, the UMT. Meanwhile, here for Nebraska Omaha, we've got Forget Me, Seven Toes, Yun Woo Yu, Riku, and GDT in that bot in that bot lane again. Nebraska Omaha has got a bunch of bot laners. I'm really curious how the synergy is going to be. Because, I mean, look, we got the roster. I see four bot lane players. Curious to see how will they work together. If it might just be like, hey, you pick Caitlyn. I'll pick a meta support. And we'll just go to town. Very curious to see kind of how that plays out in our first game. Yeah, and to be fair, it's still the beginning of the season. And mm -hmm. knowing the ins 
ins and outs of NECC. It's common that sometimes the player throws in the lane that they're not, they're not really thinking about going all throughout the tournament. They're still getting those last bits and bobs ready to be able to go full in. And it's always it always takes a couple of weeks, some games to be played, and just the team and the coaches to feel, okay, this is the nice lineup that we're going to stick with. I know there's still some time for people to decide what that's going to be. So it's very understandable. So at this point, it's true. A couple of players on the side of uh, Montana Maroon, what did you say? Or was it the... Nebraska Omaha. Uno. Nebraska Uno. Omaha. There you go. <laughs> Uno. Uno Black. Uno Black. There you go. Um, and we're jumping right into the draft here. UMT on the blue side you know on the red side anything that jumps your attention there i think i was actually going to ask you what your personal thought was do you think we'll see teams go just straight meta kind of like we talked about or do you think we'll see some maybe like personal picks maybe some comfort picks here in game one what do you think we'll see from the teams I think it's most usual that you have the comfort picks coming out. Of course, we have some stats like very solidified in league in which is Maokai has been constantly banned. And that is not different for this first round of bans right here. Seraphine as well. And I believe that Tristana might be a little bit in, alongside Echo, might be a little more of a targeted ban. Silas on the side of very solid um, constant ban rate in league of legends this season and according to the picks we have here something that you mentioned here in the um backstage for us which is ziggs most possibly going in the bot lane a mumu has been so consistent in a bot lane as well so some things which is umt looking to have a little more of a meta following there that you mentioned and on the side of uno they seem to be trying to get things a little shaken a little different uh say somebody needs to tell uh young Wu Yi he's in the wrong lane with zig ziggs is a bot lane champion highest win rate or one of the highest win rates again as forever I'm, I, it's been so long since i have seen an 80 carry if you go to any of your favorite stat sites as the actual highest win rate down there it's usually seraphine it's usually Carthus. ziggs is up there as well but ziggs will be in the mid lane there's that Caitlyn you were talking about right before we came on. You probably expected a Caitlyn to be picked. She's always so strong. And we do get the Ash as well. Sometimes I think Caitlyn needs a little bit more of a support as opposed to the Ash. But I do think GDT, if he lands those Ash arrows, they're just going to be constantly flying. It's like two a minute. If you land one or two, your team can easily win behind those Ash arrows. No, not only that, Fish, if you're fighting against a Kalista, you're going to be wanting to slow her down so much so she can't be jumping around mm -hmm. as, as she would want. So that's going to be very crucial, especially in the beginning of the game, because if you give her a little bit of a front to go in, if um, that support is going to grab you and push you closer to, to the Kalista, she would be able to throw so many arrows there and then pull them, and that could be devastating. Whereas if you just auto attack with the ash you're just going to slow her down and nothing is going to come to fruition especially when you have a caitlin on the side that's going to be able to deal massive damage in the early game and their skills so well all throughout so i believe that we with the amumu there in the jungle it's going to be important for umt to have their presence in the bot lane because i don't feel like these two are going to have the best of times against caitlin and ash on the opposition yeah, I think the thing that points into that as well is it wouldn't shock me if Hyde actually binds his ultimate to the Amumu, right? Tossing yeah. in an Amumu into a team fight, that's so much better than tossing a Renata Glass. I guess you could like toss her in and hostile takeover, but that doesn't feel great. So it wouldn't shock me if Hyde says, look, I'm going to spear replay DK. We're going to be paired up. We lose some lane pressure, but we get late game pressure. So I think you're right. I think uh, uh, replay DK, the Amumu, should hang down bot lane because I also think... TTC should absolutely bully this Ziggs. Pantheon is such a good pick into Ziggs. He should be able to kind of just shred that Ziggs if he ever gets in melee range. So Yun Wu Yi's got to play that very, very smart on that Ziggs, or he could be just farmed over and over again. Especially, you have a, a Zach there. So if you can be able to get something, for example, uh, manage to get the dominance in the first scuttle crabs of the game, you might be able to get pressure in the mid lane to help the poor Ziggs that's going to be just targeted and targeted by this threatening Pantheon with the Ignite. So you got to be careful as a Ziggs 
and very, very attentive to what's happening on the map. Because if those bandages land on the Ziggs alongside the Stalmer Pantheon, that's certainly a KO. And you don't want that for your mid laner side of Uno. Yeah, I think it'll actually be kind of funny because I see a world where seven toes will go flying past the Amumu, right? The bandage will land as the elastic slingshot. The junglers will kind of look at each other. You know, the, the flash frames from every movie where they just kind of fly past like, wait a minute, what are you? What are you doing there? So I think that'll be very interesting. Be yeah, exactly like it. Wait, like the Spider-Man meme. Like, what, what are you? <laughs> wait, wait, you shouldn't be. And I think that favors UMT because Pantheon has the ability to jump in. So does Babushka on that Gnar with the hop. Meanwhile, you look at Uno. I mean, I guess the Ziggs can satchel charge himself in. Jace can kind of hammer toss in. I think Seven Toes has to be very careful when he goes in and when he waits for the Amumu to go in. Because right now on paper... I think I'm kind of favoring Montana Maroon here for this first one. What about you, Soph Chan? Who you kind of like in this game one of this challenger-specific Frontier Showdown? I am going to agree with, the, with you on this one, Fish. I think UMT looks much more um, cohesive on the draft. As you said, there's so many possibilities of engages that can go wrong with the Zac. For example, if accidentally you land an ability with Zac and push Pantheon in <laughs> closer to the Ziggs, it's just getting him a, an extra gap closure to get the stun on the mid laner, and that is awful news um at the same time you're trying to get a little bit of versatility with the jace of course being able to do melee and ranged push people um away as well so it's it's as you mentioned it's got to be a very carefully played game from uno nebraska there and is going to heavily rely especially in the mid to late game on those visions and arrows coming from the ash to be able to help all across the map because as you said, Ash is not going to be the supporter to just be there and heal and peel. She's going to try to set up engages. And if that doesn't go well, it's at least one last champion that you have in your team. Because as you mentioned, she's like the, the big cannon minion with the star arrow. And those crystals have to land to favor Uno on this one. Yeah, I think I... That I think maybe even 50% of those Ash Arrows are going to have to find the right target, and it, it, it's going to have to be... A Mumu feels okay, but if everyone hops on a Mumu and he just uses Curse of the Sad Mummy, you're going to be sad if you're Nebraska Omaha. So yeah, I think you're right. It's going to be a lot on GDT. Can he land those Ash Arrows across the map? That is something we'll have to keep our eyes on here as we're about ready to hop in for Game 1, our final game of the night here on the mainstream of the NECC. It is a best of three, so we've at least got two in store for you, but this is our final series here to kick off the, the spring season, and there's nothing more that both these teams would want than to pick up a win early on, put yourself in a good spot, build that momentum, build that confidence with these rosters that are figuring things out as we hop on to the Rift. And we see who will strike first here in game one. Yes, we will. And so far, we have some vision coming from the side. Uh, Uno on the right side, of course. So we're going to need to have that label replaced there for the teams. But still, um, Uno on the right side, UMT on the blue side. And as I was saying, a lot of vision in the river coming from Uno. They have UMT also placing uh, a ward in that bush in the river, top path. And gonna just be a little careful just testing the waters nothing's gonna be much intense of course it's the first week and it's the first game that they're playing against each other tonight and as always i say go for your comfort pick just go for something that you know how to go around and you can get a nice advantage for a potential team. things off pretty calm looks like both junglers will start on the bottom side of their map so maybe if they both opt for a three camp gank maybe they run into each other but i think zach and amumu especially the amumu looking for that level six as soon as possible get that curse of the sad mummy online and we already see ttc try to get in yun's face trying to do damage to pantheon but he does have to be careful he's taken a decent chunk already had to chug one of those refillable charges he is very low, has gone through both refillables already, and we're only two minutes into the game. That is not what you wanted if you're a UMT. 
<laughs> yes, uh, oh my god, in the bot lane here, they're trying to get the level 2 advantage fish, and it's probably gonna go for Uno on this one. No, it is not. UMT is not positioned that aggressively because they're a little scared, possibly, of the poke that can be done by Riku and GDT. But things still looking very much balanced all throughout. A little bit of CS given here and there, but not even a conflict so far possibly as we might see we may find the two junglers facing each other in the top river for the scatter grab the junglers pretty much opting for a full clear we do see ignite go on to high nice root there from neo he unfortunately might be the one who suffers for it he will go down first blood going over to gdt meanwhile ttc great q there by seven toes and that'll be another kill just like that nebraska omaha picking up two across the map you would have wished they were on the carries but you'll take two kills right <laughs> off the gate no matter who picks them up oh absolutely because it's not not just two kills that unfortunately didn't go for the carries it's still a four out of five people in the game that got an assistance that got a uh, presence and participation in that kill so very very massive for uno in this, is this first game um not only that fish i think uh we were predicting to see zach and amumu facing each other in the river but it was so nice from seven toes to go on yanwu in the mid lane it helped really well it was something that we mentioned in the draft that ziggs would heavily require and it was super well executed Zig or Zach, one of those champions, he just has so many creative gank spots, so many gank spots where he can kind of come out of nowhere. Amumu has that as well with the bandage toss, but the elastic slingshot is just really, it's unmatched in terms to be creative, in terms to immediately land on somebody. We already see Seven Toes is up on that top side of the map in that alcove, trying to set up a kill potentially here onto Babushka. Great job here by Forget Me, trying to bait Nar in. Baits out the hop, but unfortunately the slingshot just missed, and they still got the flash, so I call that a win for Seven Toes on his second gank as well. Definitely, and there's going to be um, such a good pressure on the side of Uno. They're able to reset. We have the bot lane here. So many long swords. <laughs> you can just be making a festival. They could even set up a shop for themselves with that many swords in their pockets. And in the mid lane, once again, TTC is getting engaged upon. Oh, trying to use the Q there to pull him back in. Does look like TTC will be able to survive, but Seven Toes making use of this time doing a great job realizing look this move we say forget me it's just gonna go in and kill babushka meanwhile replay dk oh he's so low great handshake there by Niu to keep his jungler alive uh oh here oh. comes seven toes they do get one they're gonna make it a second can they find three yes they can they will unfortunately lose gdt but they'll take a three for one any day of the week if you're nebraska omaha six and one right now only five and a half minutes in yeah, as I said, it's just so much pressure. The Seven Toes has been able to to put on all the sides of the map. We just saw him in the top lane. Now here in the in the bottom, they were able to get a nice counter gank positioning greatly for the Drake as we speak. It's going to be very easy there. If they don't try to contest it, maybe we're going to see something happening. They don't have vision at this moment, but so far we have a bot lane with four kill participation out of six in the whole match. And that is huge. And it's building for that Caitlyn. She's already got the 150 go bounty to her name. She's farming well. So is high though. That's not take that from them. In the mid lane, once again, is going to be TCC trying to get the 1v1 on Iwu, Young Wu. And GDT is just right there as well. So, so much great positioning all around the map. See if Riku can beat what we saw last game, which was an eight-minute gale force for Caitlyn on Trine. And he's well on his way, as you said, 2-0-2. Maybe looking to pick up another one here. I think this has been a really good job by Seven Toes. Everyone knows when you have an Amumu in the game, Yes, he has bandage toss. Yes, he can make plays early, but he really wants to hit level six. Get that curse of the sad mummy. We do see a handshake go out. Hyde does do a great job. Gets the bail out, but Riku will pick up the kill. It's a one for one. Seven toes coming in. Can he get in range for his stretching strikes to try and slam them together? The minion wave is there, but unfortunately it will time out and just barely dodges the Q. 
But Caitlyn picks up another kill, and it's unfortunately just a one-for-one -one trade. Oh, I was just looking at the Caitlyn EXP bar, and I was like, oh, where's my level 6? Where is my headshot? Where is my ace in the hole? Unfortunately, there, Raikyu just got one of those kills. It's now 3-0-2 with the amazing presence from Seven Toes. Replay DK trying to get an advantage on this overextending. ADC, they get some nice vision from the pink ward in the tri-bush. Oh, but Pantheon wants to go in. Pantheon is going to find his way on. Riku heal is going to be used, but that is a 600 gold shutdown onto TTC. He hasn't been able to find a way out of the zigs. That is a huge pickup for that Pantheon. Meanwhile, here comes Seven Toes and Yun Woo. Great stretching strikes going to slam TTC and replay DK together. First kill going to be picked up. Let's bounce is going to be used. Replay DK trying to get away. A nice handshake there on the Seven Toes pushes him away. Yun Woo with a nice satchel charge trying to knock high to flash. There is the elastic slingshot. Seven Toes does have the ult, but I don't think GDT and Yun Woo have the damage. They do have to be careful of those mines, but a great bandage toss over the wall. And all of a sudden, Montana picks up, I think, three in that fight. That is a huge to them to kind of close what was a very quickly rising, I think, 3k gold lead before that fight. Yeah, and we're shortening that very, very well for UMT. Amazing job by all the team members there. I believe it was at least four people that participated in the fight. So really, really mm -hmm. great. The positioning from uh, TTC to get the ulti there. Gank in the bot lane and... The last bandage just to guarantee the last kill onto the Ziggs was super great. And it's nice to see UMT sh saying, okay, it was a little rough. We were trying to get used to how you guys play. But if you want to be aggressive, let's be aggressive as well. And now they're feeling like they have the level 6 on hide. They are close to getting the hustle, ta hustle takeover for Niyu as well. And that's going to be massive with the curse of the sad mommy too. So whenever you can get that chain of CC going, that's going to be great for UMT. But they still need to be very careful because Riku is still punching a lot of damage with those headshots. Yeah, Riku 3, 1 and 3. Hyde has done a great job picking up a couple kills and he might find himself another one here. GDT just trying to ward check. Hostile takeover comes out but is not in range of Riku. Now Hyde does have to be careful. But Niyu is right there. And the other thing that quietly has been favoring Nebraska Omaha is that top side of the map. You see the Jace. We saw the solo kill for Forget Me. But right now, a 35 CS lead onto Babushka. As we do see TTC Ooh. goes in. Had no idea Seven Toes was there. Let's Bounce going to be used. That should be a free kill onto the Pantheon. It is. Ooh. Zach will get one more. Riku has to be careful. Hyde going to flash forward. Trying to chase him down. Wants to rip the spears out. But the red wow. doesn't quite kill. And Riku wins the battle of the 80 carries. That is another win for Nebraska Omaha. Oh, Fish, I will say... I saw that Callista going in and I said, oh no, silly, silly little bean. And then when they pulled the, the spears there, I didn't have a clue that that was going to be that much damage. Forget me though, getting a lot of damage on the HP bar. They're going to fall. Three, two, one. Why did you flash on that? <laughs> that was very over <laughs> necessary, but it's, it's fine. You're still trying to assert some dominance in the game. The Drake has has not spawned 10 seconds for it to spawn and they're directing for the mid lane and there's that bandage toss curse of the sad mummy young woo really couldn't do anything about it yeah i'm right there with you i was still scratching my head trying to figure out why we had a flash <laughs> i think the boomerang should have been off cooldown or it would have been off cooldown unless maybe forget me had some crazy plays so <laughs> interesting but as you said you're still feeling things out especially when you're kind of down you don't want to let this get away now hi he's gonna try it again and this time i think the rent oh no he misses again this time wasn't even close yeah. but they will shove the wave into riku and hide not quite as fed as i think he thinks he is because both those wrens have not quite been enough to kill riku like you're hoping your Callista can do once she gets to the point right now four three and one that's pretty good just not quite the damage they're hoping for mm. We, we know that TC, TTC now has finished the Eclipse, so it's the first Mythic item for the mid laner here on UMT. And you, you're going to probably see if Amumu decides to engage on this one. It looks like they are directing to do so. You still have a lot that can be done with the players of UMT to contest this against Uno. Classic slingshot and the let's bounce going to be used. Rico over the wall. The hostile takeover will be used as there is the first kill for Hyde. 
He wants to push forward onto GDT. He'll pick up one. Will trade out his life. Replay on the Drake. Very low. TTC going to throw up the shield to just barely stay alive. Dragon is picked up. Heal going to be used for the movement speed. Oh, can he get in range? This might come down to a Q predict. Uh, he just blows the flash. That a flash I think we can get behind. That one secures the kill, and it's 6-1 and one for Riku. Oh, my. 6-1. and one, Three... 300 grow bounty for the CDC for you know that is very great that's what you want to see of course UMT was so good at contesting that Drake they ended up falling pretty massively in the team fight but you still had replay DQ guaranteeing the buff for the blue team and that is essential unfortunately if you know your team is going to end up falling you got to at least get something and trade it and that's what they did very nicely done right now it's it's interesting we we have a team 10 kills versus a 12 kill for uno and it is still a massive for the red team yeah i mean it again this is kind of what happened the last game we had just before where it doesn't feel like uno has a 5k or nearly 5k gold lead it feels like this should be as you said, basically dead even. It's 12 to 10. I do think the big determining factor is plates are still up and two towers have already gone down. I think that's a, where a lot of that bonus gold has come from. As we do see the Asher just barely misses. We have seen actually a lane swap here for Riku and GDT. There's no tower up. There's still 13, 15 seconds on plates. So they say, why not? They do have to be careful though. Replay DK is there, but I'd say another play in Caitlyn's pocket. Yeah, I think that's basically the one thing that we had been missing in regards to how much gold Uno had been able to collect. And I think it's down to the Caitlyn and the fact that she's probably gotten three, at least, maybe four. Blades is in the bot lane, the tower there is gone, as you mentioned. Uh, in the top lane, we just had those placings going down. I believe she got one out of those. So very nice rotation from Uno to be able to try to secure as much gold as they can. Oh, but Bushka, I think that that was a little risky. They're at replay DQ, DK right next to them. So they, they felt confident, but at the same time, Riku 6, 1, and 3 with that Gale Force and the BF Sword is going to be something that's going to... It's gonna hurt. It's gonna very much hurt. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be shocked if next back Riku picks up the, the 15 minute Infinity Edge either. I, you're oh right. My so God. He is. <laughs> oh, uh, he's backing. Oh, we'll he cancels we'll it. I, I wanted <laughs> to see it, but yeah, he is absolutely going to shred. I will say, despite how strong GDT and Riku came out, Hyde did a really good job picking up kills in team fights, even when he went down as, oh, the Ash Arrow lands. TTC had no idea. The Zig Zolt for good measure. Riku mm. will pick that one up. What a wombo combo there for Nebraska Omaha. But I will say Hyde is 6-4-1. and one. We cannot sleep on this Callista. This Callista is going to do a lot of damage for being bullied in lane. That is absolutely true, Fish. And one thing that I was going to mention is related to that precisely, I was going to say, Caitlyn for Uno, they have to be able to take this game in less than 30 minutes because the Kalis is going to scale like heck. And that's mm -hmm. going to be so difficult to deal with because Caitlyn is going to start to slow down. She's going to have her items. She's going to have her crits. But then she's not going to have the damage per second that Kalista is going to be able to deal. So right now, UMT are going to collect most likely soon this bot lane. The, and... Maybe they're going to contest this Herald as well? No, okay, never mind. But uh, the objective bounty, so there's still a lot that UMT can do. So for Uno you know, to be able to win, they have to be very thorough on how they play this. Seven Toes going to get caught out by the Bandage Toss there. Ash Arrow will be used. We are going to see the Berserk is going to land on a GDT. He will go down. Can they finish off the Zack passive is going to be the question. No, they cannot as Riku got a great... Headshot. We actually see a trade. TTC going to go down. Now hide. Riku, here's the battle. We want to see the exhaust going to come out. Oh, and Riku's in oh. a 1v2. Can oh. the spears execute? Mm. Yes, they can. Finally, hide pulls it off. Huge shutdown. And he wins the battle of the 80 carries, though he did have a little bit of help from Niu as well. Yes, and it really goes to show how much the damage per second on Kalista is going to upscale the Caitlyn every single time. Oh no, Babushka, that is a lot. The, oh, the oh. ulti just right on the edge. And the little Na is going to be heading back to base. But Fish, 
That is exactly what we were saying. Callista is just able to not only deal the damage per second, but also do, do that execute, pulling the spears at the end. And unfortunately for Caitlyn, even having two completed items, they were able to... They, they eventually got killed. And that's why I say, Uno, you gotta be careful. Think about your plays. Don't get over yourselves. And I really like Hyde bringing the exhaust because I think that kind of made the difference. We do see replay DK over the wall, misses the smite, flashes out. Nobody saw anything. <laughs> but I think that's going to make the difference in those 80 carry 1v1s. If we get down to it, exhaust is going to shut down the Caitlyn a lot more than heal. A late game is going to help heal through the damage as Callista is doing. And I think the MVP, the, the carry here for Uno, I think actually Sofchan should be forget me. I think he's unmatched, 1-1-1, one, one, and one, 165 CS, probably has some of the most gold in the game. I think the 80 carries having eight kills might have taken that title away from him. <laughs> But he can't be contested on the split push. I think that's what he needs to do right now is hide. He's looking for another victim. Grand Starfall going to come in on a Riku. Riku probably just going to be dead. Oh, yes. He will go down. But the fight's still going on. Seven Toes trying to hop on a TCC. Mega Inferno Bomb will miss. They do find a way on to hide with the hammer uh, from Forget Me. And he is going to pick up that kill. Replay DK will go down. And there's that Jace. Picking up multiple kills now. Four and one. And... Oh. Uno might get a lot of towers off of this because there's nothing else on the map for them. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is only so much you can dodge on that one. And with the Jace, with the Ziggs, you are not going to be able to survive. Oh, the Herald is going to hit. Probably another shot in the inhibitor as well. Maybe not even needed. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Two shots. That would have been taken. Um... Kind of unnecessarily, but it's fine. You still have to drop your Herald and it's going to help regardless. Right now, Fish, tell me something. UMT, how could they come back on this one? Because Uno, I think they finally realized, all right, stop trying to make this game lengthy. Just go for a finish. Go for very oppressive plays because we still have the advantage. I think one will be looking for picks like we are going to find here on the Yun Wu. That is the one thing that Uno has done so well. The elastic slingshot should get seven toes away. Handshake is going to land. Neo trying to keep him slowed. Hyde going to get in range. Nice flash there from the Zack. And I think it's going to have to start with just forcing Uno to team fight if you're UMT. You have, I think, the stronger team fight. If not, it's very, very close. But as we've seen, the Callista damage is already starting to outscale this Caitlyn. The one negative, the Herald did get the charge off on that first Nexus Tower. That one Nexus Tower is at 10%. Just forget me. Just absolutely obliterates you. So, really, I think for them to win, they've got to get pick of Chan, and they've got to find a way to stop the split push, because Forget Me can win this game with one well-timed split push through either that mid lane or another lane. Yes, you're so right. I definitely agree there. Forget Me is going to have a lot of pressure, especially with the teleport. Oh, replay DK <laughs> going in, but the arrow is going to land right onto their face, and Uno is going to very easily guarantee this first Baron of the game for themselves. And if they are not silly, they're gonna go for a very strong and reinforced push. Oh, the Gale Force forward by Riku. That was very interesting. Oh and my a 90 god, the caliber net. net. He wants to win the game. I think they realized just like we did. They said this game cannot go on any longer than we allow it. Otherwise, this Callista will be a problem. There is that Herald charge paying off. The first Nexus turret already down. The question is, what do you do? Do you focus towers? You have the Ziggs execute. What do you do here if you're Nebraska Omaha? That second tower, it's already dead. The Nexus is exposed. Can they pick up the win? We are going to see. We play DK go in. They're trying to create space. They dodge the curse of the sad mummy. The hostile takeover comes out. Hide for all of his damage. Simply cannot escape the Zack. And Nebraska Omaha will pick up game number one. Now they can pad their stats. Now they can hang out. It got a little dicey there. Mm -hmm. But it comes down to a win for Nebraska Omaha and 13k gold lead some chance at the end. I'm gonna be honest, it never felt like it was that big. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. I think it's because when when we have a look at the stats, so for example, the gold here, um, on the side, yeah, oh, 
look at that like right you didn't even have that much more it was a little mm-hmm. more than 1k but it's forget me as you pointed out fish who was the big lead in regards to gold mid lane as well yun yun Wu. look at that 10k versus the almost 7k from ttc so really it was going to like yeah are we seeing damage is this what we're seeing i uh, presume so <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you very much production <laughs> and um Right now, we really confirm what you said, Fish, all throughout the game. Even though Caitlyn was popping off, it was going to be the Ziggs and the Jason Hands of Forget Me that we're going to be able to do even more in the late game. Callista, definitely the biggest highlight for UMT. So I believe that they have a lot of conditions to come back for a better second game of this best of three, Fish. But do you think there's anything in particular that they should be going for? I think it really is going to start with the mid lane pick. Like I, I pointed out, it felt like that Pantheon was like a counter pick, right? Kind of filling that Cassidy ish void where it's like, hey, I'll just assassinate mid laners. That's what mid Pantheon has always done forever is he's just an assassin. He just one shots these squishy mage targets. The problem was he never really killed that Ziggs. It was a great job by Seven Toes, always kind of being there. We saw that from like, what, minute four? Seven Toes gets a gank, puts the Yun Wu ahead. That's the big one. I don't really know what, what, what went wrong at that NAR matchup. I mean, he only died once, and Forget Me just kind of said, like, okay, I'm going to take over this lane. We didn't get to see it much. <laughs> it's top lane. I don't blame production. Sure? Arming minions is not exciting gameplay to cast or watch. So I think probably maybe a tankier champion, but I really think it starts with TTC picking something that's a little bit more mage v mage as opposed to assassin v mage because the assassin didn't work what about you soap chan what do you think let's i'll throw the reverse on you what does uno need to do to make this a sweep from what you saw in game one i think they have to stick to the plan i think they still have to stick with the aggression they were so great as you mentioned seven toes was amazing in map awareness and rotation all the size of the map you would see something going successfully on on one side reset go to the other side reset go to the other side and then all of a sudden you have ex- just as you said a massive lead for uno that didn't even feel like it because the numbers weren't showing that much but it was all there because of the distribution and kill participation that all the team had when you started having something happening on the side of umt it was Callista trying to get something out of it just because she scales really well she deals a lot of damage once she gets the gold to buy those items but TTC on the Pantheon wasn't getting quite those kills on the Ziggs, unfortunately, because of a great um, presence from Seven Toes. Nah was very nullified, unfortunately, for UMT. And the team just started crumbling at the seams, unfortunately. So I think for Uno, they have to take advantage of that. They have to take advantage of key uh, to keep being aggressive and use that oppression to just get a sweep in like 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, I thought for week one, I, I'm going to commend Uno because there's a lot of teams that struggle when they get to like when they figure out we need to win the game. I mean, any League of Legends player has a solo key story of where it's like, hey, Guys, we got to win, and everyone's like, I don't know how to win the game. It's so hard. I mean, we've seen it in the NECC. We've seen 60-minute games that should have been 35 minutes. You and I saw that a ton in the Falls of Chan. So I do commend them for figuring out we need a win, and they yeah. executed the plan. We'll see if they can do it again or if Montana has a comeback. We'll take a break. We'll come back. Game two of Montana Maroon taking on Nebraska Omaha Black. Can Nebraska Omaha get the sweep, or does Montana Maroon have a game three in store for Soap Chan and I? We'll find out right after this. Like a never fading whisper in the breeze. Oh, we will keep on changing all over again. Yeah, we will keep on changing. Just like another season. Don't want another day with a new bright sun.
Is it okay if I'm the same? I'm catching feelings from all the dealings. Am I astray? What do you say? How are you feeling? Is it the same? I hope you're not planning to waste my time. To my surprise, that was her reply. Now we your vibe. It's been a while and such a ride of stars align. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She loves the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We're getting crazy in a different world. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She loves the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We're getting crazy in a different world. She my do or die, my bona fide, my up when I'm down, she's always beside me, she makes me feel alive, I won't deny, her love for me is real and kind of suicide she's not the same, she's such a rare type, she's far from plain, at least in my eyes, she said if I cross her I'll be in the grave, oh you under a type, but yeah that's still my babe. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She loves the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We getting crazy in a different road. I love the fact I didn't let her go. She loves the fact that I just let her know. Now we're together, it's a different mode. We getting crazy in a different road. Welcome back in here to the NECC. It is week one of our Spring League of Legends. Fish and Sof Chan getting ready for what could be our final game of the night. Or maybe University of Montana Maroon has something in store. We saw them fall to University of Nebraska Omaha Black in our first game of the Challengers Pacific Frontier Showdown. And right now, looks at the pro drafts wrapping up. Sof Chan does look like we're going to have some very spicy picks hopefully coming through for both these teams because as we talked about, once Nebraska Omaha, as we like to call them, Uno, they once they figured out this game is on a timer, 
they slammed the pedal to the metal and they did not stop. I think 23, 24 minutes. Absolutely incredible display from them figuring out how to end that game so quickly. Yeah, and it was just as if they were listening to us when we said, you're going to stop falling. That Caitlyn is not going to stack anymore. Is not going to keep on scaling. And Callista is going to become a f absolute menace. You, yep. You're not going to let that happen. So, as you said, just pedal it to the metal and just finished it off as quickly as they could. That's why I think that Uno has to maintain the same type of composition on this one, or at least the same type of gameplay. But we'll see what's going to come in store with the first draft the second game of the best of three. The Ziggs ban is an interesting one to me. I feel like Ziggs was not the problem. I feel like Jace was more the problem than the Ziggs, but maybe they just have a simple counter. Maybe it'll be a phase two Jace ban. I like the Caitlyn thing. I think Riku absolutely popped off, even though Hyde was kind of winning that matchup late game. I think it still worked. I think this is a very crucial pick though. Babushka got absolutely... Well, he only died once, and then his creeps got farmed, as you pointed out. It really wasn't a flash and kill difference. It was a creep difference. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Wow. Is this is this the Noxus warrior? Oh. The Dark right, Master. Is it, is it the... Wait. A Rengar as well? Wait, is this right? <laughs> what? A Rengar too? And Sejuani top? Wait, just on a mid? No, wait, what? <laughs> well, Tana Maroon is pulling out everything. I mean, obviously, with the Sejuani top, you have to lock in a melee jungler. I don't think Rengar was on our checklist of melee junglers you like to pair with Sejuani. <laughs> the Tristana is interesting. It feels like TTC, again, I haven't looked too much into him, maybe might be a flex player because where's the mage, right? Bring out... You know, Syndra, bring out Victor. Bring out just your standard mage play. The Pantheon into the Tristana. We'll have to see. I mean, the Rumble's kind of an off-meta pick as well from your standard mages. So I'm not really sold on TTC right now, but maybe it'll prove me wrong because this comp for both teams just looks absolutely bananas. <laughs> yeah, I think it's all about bananas uh, this evening, Fish. And I... I... I, I no, <laughs> I'm just speechless. Look at these DMs. They look so funny. They look very funny. Well, well, let's be um more analytical on this one. Your own team. I finished the draft here. Mm -hmm. Joanie Ranga. Okay, we don't have a big AP damage. First off, that's one thing you mentioned. No AP damage. You only have the binding and ulti from Morgana. There you go. On the side of Uno, you have massive damage with Rumble. It's not only going to deal massive AP damage, it's also going to burn you per second. So that's going to be amazing. You have CC coming from Seven Toes and GDT. You have a regular ADC that does regular ADC things. And yeah. a very nice bulky warrior in the, in the top lane as the Darius. So I will have to say Uno has my heart on this one. Um, I think they're going to pull a plus four card onto UMT and it's going to be a little hard for them to keep up with this draft. It's not looking very convincing. What, what are your thoughts? If you know, if I cover my screen over the jungle in the mid for UMT, I <laughs> like the baseline, right? I love the Sejuani. I think it's a solid pick. It works really well. On paper, right? You play a tank, shouldn't die. I think that the Jin Morgana is just... It's a strong comp. I think it lanes really well against the Zaya Rakan. Gives them an answer. The Rengar's the one, like, why not Diego? Why not Jarvin? Why not Jin Zhao? Something that's a bit more of a bruiser. Because, yes, Rengar can attack really fast. Yes, he can stack up the Sichuan. He's stunned really fast. He's going to fall over unless he finds ways to get resets if he wants to go Dustblade. Then I guess you have, like, this pseudo Viego that's going invin invisible. It really comes down to TTC for me. I think that's just that one pick that, like, double AD carry can work. I just don't know if Tristana is the right character for it. Now, into Rumble, who's kind of a melee range AP, maybe, but it's like I can't get over that Tristana, especially if how the Pantheon looks, Sof Chan. It's like, don't go off meta. Just, like, lock in Victor and have, like, a really boring 35 minutes of your life. 
don't try and get too flashy, but we'll have to see. I've been wrong once tonight. Yeah. Maybe I'll be wrong again on TTC. Yes, uh, it, it might be a surprise coming from UMT. And I agree, TTC. I think I, if we're going for an ADC in the mid lane, I might have preferred the Lucian, maybe. Just something mm -hmm. that is, it, it just works really well. Lucian is always great. Since the, the absolute release, the first date of Lucian, he's just great. And Tristana has her highs and lows, and once again, it's going to be UMT going for a more late game composition, which doesn't really quite match with how Uno wants to play, which is right now, as soon as they get level six, they're going to rush into the mid lane, get those those buffs, get the Herald, get the Drake, and take those towers down. Not only that, try to secure as many platings as they can, as they have been doing, Rico is in particular. So, UMT, come, come with me for a magical please surprise me journey okay yeah I, I i want to see more from you i think there's the makings of you know the dream team here especially again if replay <laughs> dk can get fed maybe he gets an early dust blade yeah he can go on an assassin rampage there's really not a great back line outside of seven toes having to hold curse the sad mummy to stop the rangar so i do think there is some some promise there I will be honest, I love the Dunkmaster memes. Olaf was probably just a better pick there. I mean, we saw an Olaf body of Sichuani in our last matchup. The axes are going to be able to slow down TTC. Because that's my only thing is, forget me if it ever gets to a point where it's either him versus Hyde, him versus TTC. If Ghost is on cooldown, he's not catching those characters. He's just oh, simply is. not getting to them. Maybe the Olaf was there, but I love the Rumble, Amumu synergy. Of course, Zaya Rakan, they synergize really well. I just want to see the Dunk Master pop off because anytime you go up and you slam down, it's a ton of fun. But I'm with you, Sof Chan. If Montana Maroon can pull it off with a Rengar, might be Rengar's first ever win in NECC. I've, I don't think I've ever <laughs> seen him before, in, in all honesty. So, hey, yep. maybe that's what they're going for. But I do think there is some potential if Replay DK is like four ish kills at that 10 minute mark, then I think Montana has a very, really good shot of winning this game. Yeah, I'm with you on that one, Fish. And it might be the moment where Rengar and Tristana mid are going to surprise us. We're jumping right into the rift. We see Uno positioning themselves on a five stack closer to the bot lane here. TTC, the only one scouting this area. Now, both players actually going for a bit of a dive, as you pointed out. TTC, the only one not part of those dives, as we see the rest of UMT will find... Nothing but darkness in front of them. <laughs> Meanwhile, for Uno, there is a lone Yordle hiding out in this jungle. Will they choose to go in? No, they'll simply ward the red buff and reset. And it looks like that'll be the exact same play from UMT. But they... Oh, they didn't ward. Please, please, why is your ward? No. No, 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 disaster. You... No, UMT, why are you start like that? No. I was trying to root for you. <laughs> oh, no. oh, absolute disaster. They checked for wards and left. And, <laughs> and the crazy thing is, Sof Chan, the only trinket they actually used was the scanning ward. Yeah. Hey, oh. This is a great view from production. Huge shout out to our production showing yes. exactly what uno gets to see they know where the jungler is there's no vision anywhere else on the map oh they were so close but so far away <laughs> oh my goodness ah uh, that's not the best start is it fish oh my no. god oh forget me though they're looking for the dunks here that of course they're very far away from level six and being far away from levels is the bot lane from level two they don't even care Second game in a row, Nebraska Omaha says, who needs level two? We'll just pick up a single kill. And it goes over to Riku, a fantastic job there. We do see TTC putting a decent bit of damage onto Yunwoo before Rumble has that shield. He is a little squishy. So I do think as long as Tristana can land those E's, land those explosive charges, get damage onto this Rumble, you'll be in a good place because early game, pre-two minutes, Montana 8 and L. We'll see if they'll be able to turn it around. There's still a lot of game left. TTC does kind of redeem his team. Gets a very good ward over by the chickens. But what could have been had they gotten a ward on that red buff? Yeah, what could have been? Oh, 
It's the arcane song that's coming out here in my mind. We're versing for a UMT. As you said, there's a lot of game to be played. But right now, Uno maintaining a very aggressive stance that had the that worked so well for them in the previous match. So it's super nice of them for recognizing that. And once again, um we come we come back to the to the mid lane. TTC versus Young Woo And that Tristana is not looking that aggressive now, is she? <laughs> no, unfortunately at the moment, Rumble is able to get those Electro Harpoons, able to land the Flame Spitter, as long as he's not accidentally kind of pushing his wave. It's a very difficult thing to master on that Rumble, Ooh. but look how much damage it does. Throws up the shield for the overheat, but still able to force the rocket jump away from TTC. And we do see the junglers kind of an interesting spot. You can see top lane. We have Forget Me and Seven Toes trying to chase down Babushka. Nothing's going to come over. Riku going to jump on to Hyde here. Nice dash forward. A spell immune, though. Does come out from Niu, but Hyde's HP might not matter. Flash forward from Riku. Is he going to get the kill? Yes, he will, but they'll trade. So it's a portal combat, and they'll both turn and run away. And unfortunately, unlike game one, Sof Chan, it's Niu who got the kill with the Ignite. It was not Hyde who did such an excellent job of trading in those oh, situations. Damn. He's dead. Yeah, that's just a free kill go. for the Rumble with Ignite. Yeah, it was a burst summon a spell, and it works really well for them. They know uh, exactly how much they deal damage with that flamethrower, and throwing in the Ignite is just burn after burn. And forget me, also looks to be very aggressive once again, but Bushka has some nice vision, UMT, on the top river and that's going to help a lot seven toes on the amumu forces a flash but still lands the bandage oh no the snare oh. didn't land oh. ddt picks up another one unfortunately again hide not quite able to trade out that kill again that was and that was really how umt stayed in that first game so chance Hide and pick up kills in scenarios like this. They have a great chance on the Seven Toes replay DK. Going to oh. go in. Gets rooted by the feathers. And he is... Oh, no oh, Seven he's... Toes! Hide does get a kill. But it's now 4-1 and one for Riku. You ban the man's Caitlyn. He doesn't care. It's another <laughs> pop-off game for him in the 80 carry roll. Yeah, well, well, look at this. Look at this lovely couple. Matching in skins. Matching in synergy. Matching in reverse. KDA almost. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, I was just a little saddened to see the Amumu going in on that one. I don't think it was necessary for Seven Toes to do that. Oh, forget me. Having, getting some heavy damage on them on this one. So Sejuani, once again, Babushka, trying to get something better than what they did in the last match. And they're, they're, it's looking more promising, but definitely not in the farm front. Oof, got a feel for it. Yeah, the kill. No solo kills given over just quite yet, but as you pointed out, it is more than double in the CS category for Forget Me over Babushka, as they both do hit level 6, and we'll see if the Noxious Guillotine is ready to slam down on anybody in our game. Of course, I think Darius is all maybe my personal favorite all because it is still just, it is the coolest feeling to go up, come down, and finish people off. Maybe it's Seven Toes looking for a kill. Replay DK was there, but so was the Amumu. They do get a root onto GDT. He will go down. The Rengar picking up the kill. Riku Ooh. gets a great double root. The tower going to finish one off. The tower going to finish a second one off. And it looks like Riku going to hand this one. Nope. Mm, I'm not quite oh. sure who was intending to get the kill, but Yun Wu will pick it up. <laughs> oh, that was so satisfying. Riku, lovely uh, feather push back there very nice i to be fair i was a little concerned it looks like it was a bad spot for seven toes they ended up going down but as soon as they overcommitted under that tower they you have to predict you have to wait for the uh, okay close but you have to predict you have to wait for for the feathers to be able to do something like that and they were all rooted down both of them got Tower, oh no, oh TTC, oh TTC, no. He's, yeah. <laughs> he tried, he tried to, to he back. <laughs> oh. In one of those comical. games. <laughs> Uh-oh, replay DK. Uh, and oh, I wanted the Rengar to have four kills. He's trending in the other, oh, oh my 
goodness, Riku, what did you just do to hide Niu? He's trying oh. to bait him into the tower, Featherstorm! Oh. oh. Um, well, Uno is really nailing to a T what I said about being aggressive. Yes. <laughs> they're leaving yes. nothing. The only thing they're leaving behind is bodies, because at this point, they are 5k gold ahead at 8 minutes. <laughs> What is this? This is only the first week, Fish. What are we up for this season? Nebraska, Omaha, and they were like, look, you know, we're the late game. We're trying to get some grub, though. Forgive me. It's going to go down. So maybe it's all not lost yet. Babushka doing a great job on the solo roll. Unfortunately, you've got an eight-minute Gale Force for Riku. He had Gale Force before he picked up that double kill. TTC, ooh, nice rocket jump there. It barely dodged the bandage toss. Small victories here. Unfortunately, that might not be one. A great curse of the sad mummy. TTC will go down. Babushka trying his hardest, but as you said, all Uno's leaving in their wake right now is corpses. <laughs> yeah, it's getting really hard. And as we can see here, it, it just feels like so much action that has happened, Fish. And we're still oh. on nine minutes. You would expect to look at these turrets oh. and for them to be bare, but they still have so many blades to go. Riku is going to go for more and more kills. Ah, oh. There's nothing that this Zaya fears in the Summoner's Rift. Oh, no. Me, you. Can he land the binding? Oh, he cannot. <laughs> he will simply return to the spawn. Another kill here for Young Wu. And I mean, this has been an impressive job by Nebraska Omaha. The last game, it really felt like they were maybe four or five minutes away from that game getting out of their hand. And they just said, look, I mean, they don't even care who we pick. We just want this game to be over. We don't want to let UMT back in. And I'm struggling to find ways here, Soap Chan. This might be a good one, though. If they can get a kill on to Forgive Me, replay gonna come in here. Oh, nice little heal from Forgive Me. He has seven toes coming up. Bandage Toss going to go in. First stun Ooh. is going to land. Here comes Yun Wu. They don't even need him. And there's the dunk. And Forget Me's on the board as well with a double kill. Would you look at that? Just a nice <clears throat> equalizer in the Curse of the Sad Mummy to be able to turn back that oh. fight around. Oh, Ooh. hide! That was beautiful. Unfortunately, you still have the charm. You still have the Unite, the ultimate from GDT. And that's going to be very hard to to escape even. You've already burned your flash, your gin. You can't do much more. Yan Wu flashes over the wall. He picks up another kill. And I think this one is uh, getting close. Oh, maybe a kill on the Yun Wu would be huge. Replay D. Oh, unfortunately, goes over to Niu. He gets the shutdown. Replay DK looking for one here on the GDT. We do have seven Ko's coming in. The curtain call is going to miss. And uh, Recon Riku will come in. Replay DK goes down. At least they got... Hey, that was a two-for-one trade, so Chan, yeah, in yeah. favor of UMT. They're trending in yeah. the right direction. Mm -hmm. we, we celebrate the small victories. We definitely do. But Bushka might be the one key point for UMT, for UMT to be able to come back around this one. They, they have TP. They have Ignite. They have a lot of HP. They have a lot of CC. It's basically the full combo in just one champion. Just can you do... A 1v9 on Uno because at this point, unfortunately, for all the rest of the players from UMT, they are ranging from four deaths to seven deaths on the board. The, the big problem is, is hide, unfortunate. Oh, wow. Lord. I blinked and the man died. <laughs> Rengar could be the saving grace as well as Babushka as you can combo it like we're going to see potentially right here. Well, I saw the potential in the combo. Unfortunately, Yun Wu being three levels higher than both players denied that. But they're just going to slap him with their wallet so hard. Rengar's not going <laughs> to one-shot anyone anymore. It just... They went for the all-out comp. They needed Rengar to get ahead early and the moment Rengar couldn't get ahead... I think this comp is going to find a really tough way to get back in this game is there is the first tower at 12 and a half minute second tower excuse me and I'm surprised Rift Tail died there I thought maybe she was going to get a full ramp I thought we were going to have dancing Shelly for a moment so I'm going to be honest <laughs> 
Oh my god, I'm always so excited about dancing, Shelly. And I, I think I want to bring to you guys a nice um, comparison to what I think UMT did wrong in this draft. Not even in the game itself, because there were many things happening. <clears throat> but in the draft. Once again, they're going to get caught, unfortunately, there. There's going to be a backup from Babushka, though. The curtain call is landed. Is not going to be able to hit many people as Yonwu is joining the party. Is now turned into a 4v1, soon into a 4v2. Can the Ranga finish them off? Uh, oh, he does get one. Does get the dust blade and invisibility. Oh, Zaya. But... <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, not quite to get away. The Zaya killing as well. Uh, now, now you can. I'll let you have the floor again, Soap Chan, before you were uh, interrupted by our killing spree of a game. <laughs> That's so true, Fish. I appreciate that very much. So, basically, what I think that UMT did wrong in that draft is what I think is the best choice, for example, if you're a Lux playing against a Yasuo or a Yone or something like that. You can't just go Arcane Comet, right? You can't just pretend that you're going to be doing damage on them you can't just pretend that you're going to be more aggressive than them oh riku this might be the <laughs> oh never mind i didn't say anything i was going to say this was going to be the bounty pack oh my god it's a 1v3 and it turns into a triple kill and an almost ace for uno i can't what ah <laughs> oh. Okay, I'll just try to wrap up because these guys are not letting me breathe. Basically, you can't try to do more damage than the opposition if they have shown that they're going to be very aggressive. So, for example, if you are the Lux against the Yasuo, you go um, Glacial in the runes, you go Determination in Secondary, for example. You go Airy, you go things that make you be healthy. You go Biscuit, you go like... Um, increasing the potions so you're able to maintain yourselves healthy and not allow the enemy to one shot you in this case UMT tried to get more aggressive than the team that already had so much aggression in the gameplay first first match around and it's not going well unfortunately you know I think you you bring up an excellent point I mean as I talked about, the Rengar was kind of this all-in, like, let's get really fed and I'll one-shot everyone. The problem is, as you pointed out, you can't go with this Rengar ultimate feed strat if your opponent is just going to simply be ahead of you at all times. I think you're right. I think it maybe should have been, let's go with, like, a Trundle in the jungle. Let's maybe Ooh, go with nice. a tankier mage in the mid lane. I think you're totally right. It felt like Montana maybe, after that first game, there were some points where they're like, look, if Hyde gets ahead, if Hyde survives for five more minutes, we win the game. And they tried for that strategy as opposed to what if we just shut down the aggression from Uno, who is simply at this point racking up kills. They're making sure that they are going to be the KD leaders of week one of the NECC. Yeah, and they're jumping on this one. Uno going for the dive very easily, taking so many people down. But at the same time, you still have very beefy and powerful turrets that are going to be held helping you oh okay i thought it was gonna be helping more never mind it's it was still an ace for for you no know? so yeah they're just going to take the inner turrets here probably the, the inhibitor as well they're just gonna be safe and i really appreciate this about uno they know how to be aggressive but they also know when to retreat I, i've honestly for week one i've been very impressed with with uno's gameplay i think game one was a perfect indicator i think game two I don't want to say we saw this level of uh, dominance from Umo coming, but I think the the level one plays, as much as you can kind of like wonder how important a ward was, it really kind of just showed where these teams are. So if Chan, right, you saw an invade from Uno, they get a ward out of it, they get information. Montana goes in, doesn't use any of their wards, doesn't get any information out of that invade, and that kind of just set the stage for what we were going to see in the rest of this game because. Uno has been the aggressor. They've gotten almost everything out of every trade where UMT have kind of just thrown themselves at the problem and hope to fix it, and, and that simply has not been the case. And I think we're going to get a dancing Shelly here if Nebraska Omaha really wants <laughs> oh to. They, they can easily pull it off. It's, it's up to how they use it. It really is. DTC is going to get ca caught off gear. Three people going on. There's nothing interesting I can do about it. And as you said, it's so possible that we have a dancing shelly on the board you have the open base only the inhibitor and the two nexus turrets standing 
for that mid lane and with Harold coming on. Oh, nice bandage and the curse of the sad mommy. It's gonna just connect and finish this off. The dunk is there and maybe they're gonna go for even more. Oh no. <laughs> maybe we get the, we, we saw one pentakill denied. It looks like we will not have another one here. Unfortunately, Riku will pick this one up. There is the Rift Herald on seven toes and I do believe Unless they simply choose not to, this will be a dancing Rift Herald in the base at 18 minutes because this one is all but over. It's an almost 20k gold lead for Nebraska Omaha. Here comes Shelly, and this should be a GG. And we're dancing with Rift Herald here to wrap up week one, So Chan. Unless we get a miracle here from UMT, and unfortunately that fight is not how you want to start a TTC drop in low. Oh, the Rengar will go down. Rift Herald, stay alive, Shelly. Stay Shelly. alive, Shelly. <laughs> Shelly, it's it's your night. It's your it's your party. Come on, we're gonna dance. Come on, please take take the next, please. <laughs> okay, there we go. There hey, it is. Hey, she does. Hey, look at her go go. Hey, oh, I love our producers. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for observing that. Just yeah. getting the nice highlight on Shelly. We love Shelly. And we stand the performance that Uno demonstrated here in the first week. So much confidence, Fish. That is yeah. really nice to see. Yeah, I mean, these, these are going to tell the story. 15,000 gold in an 18-minute game for Riku. <laughs> letting everybody know that he is the... Maybe the top of the top, at least in the Challengers Pacific Frontier Division in that AD carry role. I didn't get to catch all the games on the NECC tonight, but 26 kills might be our week one uh, high. Absolutely insane performance. I don't think you can credit uh, Nebraska Omaha enough. I do think for Montana Maroon, I think they tried them things. And I think if they take your advice that you had, Sof Chan, which is don't be the aggressor when you know you're going against someone who is going to be aggressive. Take the safe approach. Take the more tanky approach. I think this is definitely a team that has some promise. Because, again, I mean, game one, we're five minutes from being, I think, in a completely... Oh, my. That's so long. Oh, no. I mean, if you, if you think about 30k damage, you're like, eh, that's fine, 30k damage. But if you compare... <laughs> oh, no, Tristana, 3.1. The graphic is not even there. <laughs> yeah. I'm I believe oh, as Freak no. once said, that's a lot of damage. <laughs> that's tons of damage. Oh, you're right. Dang it. Tons Dang of it. damage, Freak. Had... Tons of damage. Uh, tons of... Yeah, that's... Uh, that's... There you go. There you go. Uh, biggest, oh one of the biggest inspirations in Riot Games talent history. Oh, gotta love him. And, well, this is definitely... A hell of a match to finish yeah. off the first week of spring in ECC. Oh, I just noticed that we 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 need to fix that. NECC fall twenty twenty two. NECC spring twenty twenty three. There we go. We we're still getting things on the way, right? I've heard that. <laughs> that's in, that's in, how big the destruction was from uh, Uno. <laughs> we, we we have to look at the graphic, and we did get a uh, a note from our production. They did the math for us. Riku did more damage than all of UMT combined. Oh no! I'm... That's. Oh no! I I think You're so I, you devastating. Know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think at the end of the season, Uno is for sure going to be at the top of the Challengers Pacific Frontier. I think Riku absolutely put on a show. Again, I think Montana, I don't think you can judge them off this performance. I think if you no. want to judge them off the series, look at game one, where I think Hyde went toe-for-toe -toe with Riku. And it really came down to, as we pointed out, five minutes on the clock. You've got to win this game. That's what Uno did. I think if Mon Montana can build around Hyde, maybe change the comps up a little bit. This is a team that can easily turn things around. It's only week one. You got plenty of time. But for where it stands right now, I think all the praise goes to Nebraska Omaha for a per look at it, we got it fixed in Dallas in spring 2023. Thank you, Nebraska Omaha. We would have never noticed if that was a closed series. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy to have seen such an amazing game. Very exciting, very entertaining, and a lot of display of skill and a lot of things to, you know give us advice it's very nice to hear from players when they come watch our broadcast and see the advice we bring so i hope that helps if they do come here and 
I wish all of the teams a very great spring 2023 season on NECC for all the games because hell, we have a lot of games in this yes. conference. <laughs> yeah, there is a ton of League of Legends to be played and I'll be honest, part of me is rooting for maybe the Pacific Frontier Championship to be these two teams and see the maybe redemption arc for Ooh, Montana. Yeah. We will have to see. But that will do it for us tonight here in the NECC for League of Legends. Of course, we've got games all throughout the week. But if League of Legends is your thing, join us next Wednesday. Of course, you can catch myself and Soph Chan on one of our two channels. Call it some League of Legends. You don't want to miss it. But that'll do it for us tonight. Have a great evening. And we'll see you guys next week for week two of the NECC. Don't need you to like me. Don't need you to like me. Don't need you to like me. Don't need you to like me.